Section 42 of the Kerner Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, Kerner Commission Report. Chapter 13, The Administration of Justice Under Emergency Conditions, Part 3. Detention and Bail Setting. Court Personnel. For those arrested persons who are not considered safe risks for station house summons and release, detention facilities must be provided until such time as they can be brought to court for arraignment. By means of extra judges and court sessions, arraignments and bail hearings should be arranged as quickly as is consistent with individualized attention. To meet the extraordinary caseload encountered during riots, Judges from courts of record can be asked to volunteer for lower court arraignments and bail hearings. Emergency plans should provide for service by out-of-town judges, judges from other courts, and, if necessary, specially appointed judges sitting on a temporary basis. A statewide prosecutor system, another recommendation of the Crime Commission, would also be valuable in providing a reserve force of additional prosecutors with experience in local and state law. In the absence of this flexibility, former prosecutors and private attorneys should be specially deputized and trained in advance for emergency service. Provision should be made for exchange of court personnel among communities in a metropolitan area or in a regional council, Authorities might also provide an emergency corps of court clerical personnel to move swiftly into riot-torn cities for immediate service. Detention Facilities At the detention centers, teams of defense lawyers, social workers, interviewers, and medical personnel should be on hand to gather pertinent information about detainees to present to the judge at bail hearings. Defense counsel should be prepared to propose reasonable conditions for release of each prisoner, which will guard against renewal of riot activity. Bail Setting When the riot defendant comes before the court, he should receive an individual determination of bail. He should be represented by counsel, and the judge should ascertain from counsel, client, and bail interviewer the relevant facts of his background age, living arrangements, employment, and past record. Uniform bail amounts based on charges and riot conditions alone should be shunned as unfair. With the constitutional imperatives of bail and pre-conviction release well in mind, we are fully aware that some rioters, if released, will commit new acts of violence. This is an aggravated extension of a problem which has engaged law enforcement officials and criminal law authorities for many years. Although the number of dangerous offenders to be processed, even in a riot, may not be sizable, how to determine and detain them before trial poses a problem of great perplexity. The Commission realizes that in riot situations, the temptation is strong to detain offenders by setting money bail in amounts beyond their reach. In the past, such high money bail has been indiscriminately set, often resulting in the detention of everyone arrested during a riot, without distinction as to the nature of the alleged crime or the likelihood of repeated offense. The purposes of bail in our system of law have always been to prevent confinement before conviction and to ensure the appearance of the accused in court. The purpose has not been to deter future crime. Yet some have difficulty adhering to a doctrine when it results in releasing a dangerous offender back into the riot area. We point out that as to the dangerous offender, there already exists a full range of permissible alternatives to outright release as a hedge against his re-entry into the riot. These include release on conditions of third-party custody, forbidding access to certain areas or at certain times, part-time release with a requirement to spend nights in jail, use of surety or peace bonds on a selective basis. In cases where no precautions will suffice, trial should be held as soon as possible, 
so that a violator can be adjudicated innocent and released, or found guilty and lawfully confined pending sentencing. Finally, special procedures should be set up for expedited bail review by higher courts, so that defendants' rights will not be lost by default. Right to Counsel The right to counsel is a right to effective counsel. An emergency plan should provide that counsel be available at the station house to participate in the charging and screening operations, to provide information for station house summons and release officers, and to guard against allegations of brutality or fraudulent evidence. All accused persons who are not released during post-arrest processing should be represented at the bail hearing, whether or not local law provides this as a matter of right. During any detention period, defense counsel must be able to interview prisoners individually at the detention center. Privacy must be provided for these lawyer-client consultations. The number of lawyers needed for this kind of individual representation is obviously great thus furnishing another argument for screening out early as many innocent persons and minor offenders as possible, and releasing as many of the rest as can be relied upon to create no new disturbance and to return for trial. Local bar associations, public defender offices, legal aid agencies, neighborhood legal services staffs, rosters of court-assigned counsel, Law schools and military establishments are sources of manpower. They can be pre-trained in the procedures of an emergency plan and then called into volunteer service. Assigning one lawyer to a group of defendants should be discouraged. If possible, each defendant should have his own lawyer ready to follow his case to conclusion. Case quotas can be established ahead of time, with teams of lawyers prepared to take over in relays. Law students can be used as investigators and case assistants. Legal defense strategy and sources of experienced advice for the volunteers should be planned ahead of time. Any community plan must make adequate provision for fair representation whenever the trials are held, whether during the heat of the riot or at a later, more deliberate time. There must be no letdown of legal services when trials and arraignments are postponed until the riot runs its course. The greatest need for counsel may come when the aura of emergency has dissipated. Volunteers then may be less willing to drop their daily obligations to represent riot defendants. If this occurs, assembly line techniques may be resorted to in an effort to complete all pending matters cheaply and quickly. In one city, this letdown had unfortunate results. Up to 200 post-riot arraignments were assigned to one lawyer each day. Courtroom regulars were given such group assignments in preference to the volunteers' more individualized representation. Trial and Sentencing Important policies are involved in deciding whether judicial emphasis during the riot should be placed on immediate trials of minor offenders, prompt trials of serious offenders, or arraignment and bail setting only. In the case of some serious offenders, prompt trials may be the only legal route to detention. A defendant, however, will often prefer later trial and sentencing in the post-riot period, when community tensions are eased, if he is not detained during the delay. Witnesses may also be more difficult to locate and bring to court while riot controls are in effect. Arresting officers cannot be easily spared from their duty stations. Unprejudiced juries will be difficult to impanel. Prosecutors may be more receptive at a later date to requests for dismissal, reduction of charges, or negotiated pleas. The most rational allocation of judicial manpower, as well as basic fairness, suggests that decisions at such vital stages as prosecution, plea negotiation, preliminary examination, and trials be postponed until the riot is over, in all but the most minor cases. At the same time, it is necessary to avoid congesting the jails and detention centers with masses of arrestees who might safely be released. Both can be accomplished only with a workable post-arrest screening process, 
and pre-trial release of all except dangerous defendants. Trials of minor offenses involving detained defendants should be scheduled quickly so that pre-conviction confinement will not stretch jail time beyond authorized penalties. Arraignments and bail hearings for those not summoned and released at the station house should be held as soon as possible. Trials and preliminary examinations of released offenders can be postponed until the emergency ends, unless the defendants pose a present danger to the community. Sentencing is often best deferred until the heat of the riot has subsided, unless it involves only a routine fine which the defendant can afford. Riot defendants should be considered individually. They are less likely to be hardened, experienced criminals. A pre-sentence report should be prepared in all cases where a jail sentence or probation may result. The task of imposing penalties for many riot defendants, which will deter and rehabilitate, is a formidable one. A general policy should be adopted to give credit on jail sentences for pre-conviction detention time in riot cases. After the riot is over, a residue of difficult legal tasks will remain. Proceedings to litigate and compensate for injustices, false arrests, physical abuses, property damage, committed under the stress of the riot, actions to expunge arrest records acquired without probable cause, restitution policies to encourage looters to surrender goods. Fair, even compassionate attention to these problems will help reduce the legacy of post-riot bitterness in the community. Summary of Recommendations The Commission recommends that communities undertake as an urgent priority the reform of their lower criminal court systems to ensure fair and individual justice for all. The 1967 report of the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice provides the blueprint for such reform. That communities formulate a plan for the administration of justice in riot emergencies. Under the leadership of the organized bar, all segments of the community, including minority groups, should be involved in drawing up such a plan. The plan should provide clear guidelines for police on when to arrest or use alternatives to arrest. Adequate provision must be made for extra judges, prosecutors, defense counsel, court and police personnel to provide prompt processing and for well-equipped detention facilities. Details of the plan should be publicized so the community will know what to expect if an emergency occurs. That existing laws be reviewed to ensure their adequacy for riot control and the charging of riot offenders and for authority to use temporary outside help in the judicial system. That multiple-use processing forms, such as those used by the Department of Justice for mass arrests, be obtained. Centralized systems for recording arrests and locations of prisoners on a current basis should be devised, as well as fast systems to check fingerprint identification and past records. On-the-spot photographing of riot defendants may also be helpful. That communities adopt station house summons and release procedures, such as are used by the New York City Police Department, in order that they be operational before an emergency arises. All defendants who appear likely to return for trial and not to engage in renewed riot activity should be summonsed and released. That recognized community leaders be admitted to all processing and detention centers to avoid allegations of abuse or fraud and to reassure the community about the treatment of arrested persons. That the bar in each community undertake mobilization of all available lawyers for assignment so as to ensure early individual legal representation to riot defendants through disposition and to provide assistance to prosecutors where needed. Legal defense strategies should be planned and volunteers trained in advance. Investigative help and experienced advice should be provided that communities and courts plan for a range of alternative conditions to release, such as supervision by civic organizations or third-party custodians outside the riot area, 
rather than rely on high money bail to keep defendants off the streets. The courts should set bail on an individual basis and provide for defense counsel at bail hearings. Emergency procedures for fast bail review are needed. That no mass indictments or arraignments be held and reasonable bail and sentences be imposed, both during and after the riot. Sentences should be individually considered and pre-sentence reports required. The emergency plan should provide for transfer of probation officers from other courts and jurisdictions to assist in the processing of arrestees. End of section 42. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 43 of the Kerner Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. Kerner Commission Report. Chapter 14. Damages, Repair, and Compensation. The President, in his charge to the Commission, requested advice on the proper public role in helping cities repair the damage suffered in the recent disorder. Damage took many forms. In Detroit alone, 43 persons were killed, many of whom were heads of families. Over 600 persons were injured. Fire destroyed or badly damaged at least 100 single and two family dwellings. Stores of all kinds were looted and burned. Hundreds of businesses lost revenue by complying with a curfew, and thousands of citizens lost wages because businesses were closed. As the riot came to an end, streets and sidewalks were strewn with rubble, and citizens were imperiled by the shells of burnt-out buildings verging on collapse. In most other disorders, the extent of damage was far less, but in almost all, a few persons suffered severe physical or financial injury. Some losses, such as pain and suffering, cannot be repaired or compensated. Others are normally handled through private insurance. The Commission believes that legislation should be enacted to provide fuller assistance to communities and to help expand the private insurance mechanism for compensating individual losses. Amending the Federal Disaster Act The Federal Government has traditionally played a central role in responding to community needs that follow such disasters as hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, and earthquakes. Until 1950, this federal response was accomplished through special legislation after each disaster. In 1950, Congress enacted the Federal Disaster Act to enable the President, in cases of major disaster, to invoke a broad range of emergency relief and repair measures without awaiting special legislation. This act, with subsequent amendments, has, however, been interpreted administratively to apply only to natural disasters and not to civil disorders. The Commission recommends that Congress amend the Federal Disaster Act to permit assistance during and following major civil disorders. The hardships to a community can be as serious as those following natural catastrophes, and local government resources to meet these hardships are likely to be inadequate, regardless of their cause. Applying the Disaster Act to disorders would permit the federal government to provide, during the critical period while the disorder is still going on or just ending, food, medical, and hospital supplies, emergency equipment such as beds and tents, and temporary shelters and housing. It would also permit the loan of equipment and manpower for clearing debris and repairing or temporarily replacing damaged public facilities. In 1967, these necessities were largely provided through the prompt and laudable actions of local and state government agencies and of private organizations, including churches and neighborhood groups. Provision for additional help is desirable. Though some food and medical assistance can now be provided by the federal government outside the Disaster Act, Adequate and comprehensive federal assistance to supplement private and local response can be assured only by amending the statute. Perhaps even more important than the provisions for immediate response are those that would aid long-term repair. In cases of natural disaster, the Disaster Act in its present form permits adjustments on many federal loans, 
where financial hardship has results to the borrower gives priority status to grant or loan applications for public facilities public housing and public works provides grants and matching grants for the repair or reconstruction of key public facilities permits low interest loans by the small business administration to businesses that have suffered serious economic damage and extends to individuals and businesses tax deductions beyond those normally available for catastrophic losses the act should be amended to make all these kinds of relief available following major civil disorders compensating for individual losses insurance in the aftermath of the summer's riots in 1967 insurance protection was an important source of security and reimbursement for innocent victims who suffered property damage we believe that a well-functioning private insurance mechanism is the proper method for paying individuals for losses suffered in disorders property insurance should be available at reasonable cost to residents and businessmen for property in reasonable condition regardless of location if insurance is so available it will function more equitably and efficiently to pay riot losses than a program of direct government payments to individuals the private insurance industry can market policies widely and collect premiums commiserate with the risks can develop and recommend loss prevention techniques and assess and pay large numbers of claims on an individual basis standard property insurance contracts presently include damage from civil disorders in their coverage just as they provide compensation for losses due to natural disasters such as fire and windstorm they should continue to do so early in our deliberations however we received many reports that property insurance was unavailable or was available only at prohibitive cost in inner cities this did not appear to be simply a riot problem but a long-term pervasive problem of center city areas since a separate and expert group could best examine the problems of the high cost and unavailability of property insurance in center city areas the president on the commission's behalf appointed a national advisory panel on insurance in riot affected areas on august tenth nineteen sixty seven the panel's work is now complete the panel found there is a serious lack of property insurance in the core areas of our nation's cities for a number of years many urban residents and businessmen have been unable to purchase the insurance protection they need now riots and the threat of riots are aggravating the problem to an intolerable degree immediate steps must be taken to make insurance available to responsible persons in all areas of our cities the panel also found that the insurance problems created by riots cannot be allowed to jeopardize the availability of property insurance in center city areas but the problem of providing adequate and reasonable insurance in the urban core cannot be solved merely by supplying financial assistance to protect insurance companies against catastrophic riot losses it is clear that adequate insurance was unavailable in the urban core even before the riots we are dealing with an inner city insurance problem that is broad in scope and complicated in origin and riots are only one aspect of it in order to assure the availability of property insurance in all areas the panel recommended a five-part program of mutually supporting actions to be undertaken immediately by all who have a responsibility for solving the problem we call upon the insurance industry to take the lead in establishing voluntary plans in all states to assure all property owners fair access to property insurance we look to the states to cooperate with the industry in establishing these plans and to supplement the plans to whatever extent may be necessary by organizing insurance pools and taking other steps to facilitate the insuring of urban core properties we urge that the federal government enact legislation creating a national insurance development corporation nidc to assist the insurance industry and the states in achieving the important goal of providing adequate insurance for inner cities through the nidc the state and federal governments can provide backup for the remote contingency of very large riot losses 
we recommend that the federal government enact tax deferral measures to increase the capacity of the insurance industry to absorb the financial costs of the program we suggest a series of other necessary steps to meet the special needs of the inner city insurance market for example programs to train agents and brokers from the core areas to assure the absence of discrimination in insurance company employment on racial or other grounds and to seek out better methods of preventing losses and of marketing insurance in low-income areas the fundamental thrust of our program is cooperative action thus only those companies that participate in plans and pools at the local level and only those states that take action to implement the program will be eligible to receive the benefits provided by the national insurance development corporation and by the federal tax deferral measures we firmly believe that all concerned must work together to meet the urban insurance crisis everyone must contribute no one should escape responsibility the commission endorses the proposal of the panel and recommends they be put into effect by appropriate state and federal measures end of section forty three section forty four of the kerner commission report this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter fifteen the news media and the disorders part one the president's charge to the commission asked specifically what effect do the mass media have on the riots the question is far-reaching and a sure answer is beyond the range of presently available scientific techniques our conclusions and recommendations are based upon subjective as well as objective factors interviews as well as statistics isolated examples as well as general trends freedom of the press is not the issue a free press is indispensable to the preservation of the other freedoms this nation cherishes the recommendations in this chapter have thus been developed under the strong conviction that only a press unhindered by government can contribute to freedom to answer the president's question the commission directed its field survey teams to question government officials law enforcement agents media personnel and ordinary citizens about their attitudes and reactions to reporting of the riots arranged for interviews of media representatives about their coverage of the riots conducted special interviews with ghetto residents about their response to coverage arranged for a quantitative analysis of the content of television programs and newspaper reporting in fifteen riot cities during the period of the disorder and the days immediately before and after from november tenth through twelfth nineteen sixty seven sponsored and participated in a conference of representatives from all levels of newspaper news magazine and broadcasting industries at poughkeepsie new york finally of course the commissioners read newspapers listened to the radio watched television and thus formed their own impressions of media coverage all of these data impressions and attitudes provide the foundation for our conclusions the commission also determined very early that the answer to the president's question did not lie solely in the performance of the press and broadcasters in reporting the riots proper our analysis had to consider also the overall treatment by the media of the negro ghettos community relations racial attitudes urban and rural poverty day by day and month by month year in and year out on this basis we have reached three conclusions first that despite instances of sensationalism inaccuracies and distortions newspapers radio and television on the whole made a real effort to give a balanced factual account of the nineteen sixty seven disorders second that despite this effort the portrayal of the violence that occurred last summer failed to reflect accurately its scale and character the overall effect was we believe an exaggeration of both mood and event 
third, and ultimately most important, we believe that the media have thus far failed to report adequately on the causes and consequences of civil disorders and the underlying problems of race relations. With these comments as a perspective, we discuss first the coverage of last summer's disturbances. We will then summarize our concerns with overall coverage of race relations. Coverage of the 1967 Disturbances We have found a significant imbalance between what actually happened in our cities and what the newspaper, radio, and television coverage of the riots told us happened. The Commission, in studying last summer's disturbances, visited many of the cities and interviewed participants and observers. We found that the disorders, as serious as they were, were less destructive, less widespread, and less of a black-white confrontation than most people believed. Lacking other sources of information, we formed our initial impressions and beliefs from what we saw on television, heard on the radio, and read in newspapers and magazines. We are deeply concerned that millions of other Americans who must rely on the mass media likewise formed incorrect impressions and judgments about what went on in many American cities last summer. As we started to probe the reasons for this imbalance between reality and impression, we first believed that the media had sensationalized the disturbances, consistently overplaying violence and giving disproportionate amounts of time to emotional events and militant leaders. To test this theory, we commissioned a systematic quantitative analysis, covering the content of newspaper and television reporting in 15 cities where disorders occurred. The results of this analysis did not support our early belief. Of 955 television sequences of riot and racial news examined, 837 could be classified for predominant atmosphere as either emotional, calm, or normal. Of these, 494 were classified as calm, 262 as emotional, and 81 as normal. Only a small proportion of all scenes analyzed showed actual mob action, people looting, sniping, setting fires, or being injured or killed. Moderate Negro leaders were shown more frequently than militant leaders on television news broadcasts. Of 3,779 newspaper articles analyzed, more focused on legislation which should be sought and planning which should be done to control ongoing riots and prevent future riots than on any other topic. The findings of this analysis are explained in detail later in this chapter. They make it clear that the imbalance between actual events and the portrayal of those events in the press and on the air cannot be attributed solely to sensationalism in reporting and presentation. We have, however, identified several factors which, it seems to us, did work to create incorrect and exaggerated impressions about the scope and intensity of the disorders. First, despite the overall statistical picture, there were instances of gross flaws in presenting the news of the 1967 riots. Some newspapers printed scare headlines, unsupported by the mild stories that followed. All media reported rumors that had no basis in fact. Some newsmen staged riot events for the cameras. Examples are included in the next section. Second, the press obtained much factual information about the scale of the disorders, property damage, personal injury, and deaths, from local officials who often were inexperienced in dealing with civil disorders and were not always able to sort out fact from rumor in the confusion. At the height of the Detroit riot, some news reports of property damage put the figure in excess of $500 million. Subsequent investigation shows it to be $40 million to $45 million. The initial estimates were not the independent judgment of reporters or editors. They came from beleaguered government officials. But the news media gave currency to these errors. 
reporters uncritically accepted and editors uncritically published the inflated figures, leaving an indelible impression of damage up to more than ten times greater than actually occurred. Third, the coverage of the disorders, particularly on television, tended to define the events as black-white confrontations. In fact, almost all of the deaths, injuries, and property damage occurred in all Negro neighborhoods, and thus the riots were not race riots as the term is generally understood. Closely linked to these problems is the phenomenon of cumulative effect. As the summer of 1967 progressed, we think Americans often began to associate more or less neutral sights and sounds, like a squad car with flashing red lights, a burning building, a suspect in police custody, with racial disorders, so that the appearance of any particular item, hardly in itself inflammatory, set off a whole sequence of association with riot events. Moreover, the summer's news was not seen and heard in isolation. Events of these past few years, the Watts riot, other disorders, and the growing momentum of the civil rights movement, conditioned the responses of readers and viewers, and heightened their reactions. What the public saw and read last summer thus produced emotional reactions and left vivid impressions not wholly attributable to the material itself. Fear and apprehension of racial unrest and violence are deeply rooted in American society. They color and intensify reactions to news of racial trouble and threats of racial conflict. Those who report and disseminate news must be conscious of the background of anxieties and apprehension against which their stories are projected. This does not mean that the media should manage the news or tell less than the truth. Indeed, we believe it would be imprudent and even dangerous to downplay coverage in the hope that censored reporting of inflammatory incidents will somehow diminish violence. Once a disturbance occurs, the word will spread independently of newspapers and television. To attempt to ignore these events, or to portray them as something other than what they are, can only diminish confidence in the media and increase the effectiveness of those who monger rumors and the fears of those who listen. But to be complete, the coverage must be representative. We suggest that the main failure of the media last summer was that the totality of its coverage was not as representative as it should have been to be accurate. We believe that to live up to their own professed standards, the media simply must exercise a higher degree of care and a greater level of sophistication than they have yet shown in this area, higher, perhaps, than the level ordinarily acceptable with other stories. This is not just another story. It should not be treated like one. Admittedly, some of what disturbs us about the riot coverage last summer stems from circumstances beyond media control, but many of the inaccuracies of fact, tone, and mood were due to the failure of reporters and editors to ask tough enough questions about official reports and to apply the most rigorous standards possible in evaluating and presenting the news. Reporters and editors must be sure that descriptions and pictures of violence and emotional or inflammatory sequences or articles, even though true in isolation, are really representative, and do not convey an impression at odds with the overall reality of events. The media too often did not achieve this level of sophisticated, skeptical, careful news judgment during last summer's riots. The Media and Race Relations Our second and fundamental criticism is that the news media have failed to analyze and report adequately on racial problems in the United States and, as a related matter, to meet the Negroes' legitimate expectations in journalism. By and large, news organizations have failed to communicate to both their black and white audiences a sense of the problems America faces and the sources of potential solutions. The media report and write from the standpoint of a white man's world. The ills of the ghetto, the difficulties of life there, the Negro's burning sense of grievance are seldom conveyed. 
slights, and indignities are part of the Negro's daily life, and many of them come from what he now calls the white press, a press that repeatedly, if unconsciously, reflects the biases, the paternalism, the indifference of white America. This may be understandable, but it is not excusable, in an institution that has the mission to inform and educate the whole of our society. Our criticisms, important as they are, do not lead us to conclude that the media are a cause of riots, any more than they are the cause of other phenomena which they report. It is true that newspaper and television reporting helped shape people's attitudes toward riots. In some cities, people who watched television reports and read newspaper accounts of riots in other cities later rioted themselves. But the causal chain weakens when we recall that in other cities, people in very much the same circumstances watched the same programs and read the same newspaper stories, but did not riot themselves. The news media are not the sole source of information, and certainly are not the only influence on public attitudes. People obtained their information and formed their opinions about the 1967 disorders from the multiplicity of sources that condition the public's thinking on all events. Personal experience, conversations with others, the local and long-distance telephone are all important as sources of information and ideas and contribute to the totality of attitudes about riots. No doubt, in some cases, the knowledge or the sight on a television screen of what had gone on elsewhere lowered inhibitions, kindled outrage, or awakened desires for excitement or loot, or simply passed the word. Many ghetto residents we interviewed thought so themselves. By the same token, the news reports of riots must have conditioned the response of officials and police to disturbances in their own cities. The reaction of the authorities in Detroit was almost certainly affected in some part by what they saw or read of Newark a week earlier. The Commission believes that none of these private or official reactions was decisive in determining the course of the disorders. Even if they had been more significant than we think, however, we cannot envision a system of governmental restraints that could successfully eliminate these effects and an effort to formulate and impose such restraints would be inconsistent with fundamental traditions in our society. These failings of the media must be corrected, and the improvement must come from within the media. A society that values and relies on a free press as intensely as ours is entitled to demand in return responsibility from the press and conscientious attention by the press to its own deficiencies, the Commission has seen evidence that many of those who supervise, edit, and report for the news media are becoming increasingly aware of and concerned about their performance in this field. With that concern, and with more experience, will come more sophisticated and responsible coverage. But much more must be done, and it must be done soon. The Commission has a number of recommendations designed to stimulate and accelerate efforts toward self-improvement, and we propose a privately organized, privately funded Institute of Urban Communications as a means for drawing these recommendations together and promoting their implementation. End of Section 44. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 45 of the Kerner Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 15 The News Media and the Disorders, Part 2. News Coverage of the Civil Disorders, Summer 1967. The Method of Analysis. As noted, the Commission has been surveying both the reporting of the disorders last summer and the broader field of race relations coverage. With respect to the reporting of the disorders, we were trying to get a sense of content, accuracy, tone, and bias. We sought to find out how people reacted to it, 
and how reporters conducted themselves while carrying out their assignments. The Commission used a number of techniques to probe these matters and to provide cross-checks on data and impressions. To obtain an objective source of data, the Commission arranged for a systematic quantitative analysis of the content of newspapers, local television, and network coverage in 15 cities for a period from three days before to three days after the disorder in each city. Note. The cities were Detroit, Michigan, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio, Tampa, Florida, Newark, Plainfield, Elizabeth, Jersey City, East Orange, Patterson, New Brunswick, and Englewood, New Jersey, New Haven, Connecticut, and Rochester, New York. End note. The cities were chosen to provide a cross-section in terms of the location and scale of the disorders and the dates of their occurrence. Within each city, for the period specified, the study was comprehensive. Every daily newspaper and all network and local television news films were analyzed, and scripts and logs were examined. In all, 955 network and local television sequences and 3,779 newspaper articles dealing with riot and race relations news were analyzed. Each separate analysis was coded, and the cards were cross-tabulated by computer to provide results and comparisons for use by the Commission. The material was measured to determine the amount of space devoted to news of riot activity, the nature of the display given compared with other news coverage, and the types of stories, articles, and television programming presented. We sought specific statistical information on such matters as the amount of space or time devoted to different kinds of riot stories, the types or identities of persons most often depicted or interviewed, the frequency with which race relations problems were mentioned in riot stories or were identified as the cause of riot activity. The survey was designed to be objective and statistical. Within its terms of reference, the Commission was looking for broad characterizations of media tone and content. The Commission is aware of the inherent limitations of content analysis techniques. They cannot measure the emotional impact of a particular story or television sequence. By themselves, they provide no basis for conclusions as to the accuracy of what was reported. Particular examples of good or bad journalistic conduct, which may be important in themselves, are submerged into a statistical average. The Commission therefore sought, through staff interviews and personal contact with members of the press and the public, to obtain direct evidence of the effects of riot coverage and the performance of the media during last summer's disturbances. Conclusions about Content Television. 1. Content analysis of television film footage shows that the tone of the coverage studied was more calm and factual than emotional and rumor-laden. Researchers viewed every one of the 955 television sequences and found that twice as many calm sequences as emotional ones were shown. The amount and location of coverage were relatively limited, considering the magnitude of the events. The analysis reveals a dominant positive emphasis on control of the riot and on activities in the aftermath of the riot, 53.8% of all scenes broadcast, rather than on scenes of actual mob action or people looting, sniping, setting fires, or being injured or killed. 4.8% of scenes shown. According to participants in our Poughkeepsie conference, coverage frequently was of the post-riot or interview variety because newsmen arrived at the scene after the actual violence had subsided. Overall, both network and local television coverage was cautious and restrained. 2. Television newscasts during the periods of actual disorder in 1967 tended to emphasize law enforcement activities, thereby overshadowing the underlying grievances and tensions. 
This conclusion is based on the relatively high frequency with which television showed or described law enforcement agents, police, National Guardsmen, and Army troops performing control functions. Television coverage tended to give the impression that the riots were confrontations between Negroes and whites, rather than responses by Negroes to underlying slum problems. The control agents were predominantly white. The ratio of white male adults to Negro male adults shown on television is high, one to two, considering that the riots took place in predominantly Negro neighborhoods, and some interviews with whites involved landlords or proprietors who lost property or suffered business losses because of the disturbances and thus held strongly antagonistic attitudes. The content analysis shows that by far the most frequent actor appearances on television were Negro male adults, white male adults, law enforcement agents, and public officials. We cannot tell from a content analysis whether there was any preconceived editorial policy of portraying the riots as racial confrontations requiring the intervention of enforcement agents. But the content analysis does present a visual three-way alignment of Negroes, white bystanders, and public officials or enforcement agents. This alignment tended to create an impression that the riots were predominantly racial confrontations involving clashes between black and white citizens. 3. About one-third of all riot-related sequences for network and local television appeared on the first day following the outbreak of rioting, regardless of the course of development of the riot itself. After the first day, there was, except in Detroit, a very sharp decline in the amount of television time devoted to the disturbance. In Detroit, where the riot started slowly and did not flare out of control until the evening of July 24, 48 hours after it started, the number of riot-related sequences shown increased until July 26th, and then showed the same sharp drop-off as noted after the first day of rioting in other cities. These findings tend to controvert the impression that the riot intensifies television coverage, thus in turn intensifying the riot. The content analysis indicates that whether or not the riot was getting worse, television coverage of the riot decreased sharply after the first day. 4. The Commission made a special effort to analyze television coverage of Negro leaders. To do this, Negro leaders were divided into three categories. A. Celebrities or public figures who did not claim any organizational following. For example, social scientist Dr. Kenneth B. Clark, comedian Dick Gregory. B. Moderate Negro leaders who claim a political or organizational following. And C. Militant Negro leaders who claim a political or organizational following. During the riot period surveyed, Negro leaders appeared infrequently on network news broadcasts, and were about equally divided among celebrity or public figures, moderate leaders, and militant leaders. On local television, Negro leaders appeared more often. Of the three categories, moderate Negro leaders were shown on local stations more than twice as often as Negro leaders identified primarily as celebrities or public figures, and three times more frequently than militant leaders. Newspapers like television coverage, newspaper coverage of civil disturbances in the summer of 1967 was more calm, factual, and restrained than outwardly emotional or inflammatory. During the period of the riot, there were many stories dealing exclusively with non-riot racial news. Considering the magnitude of the events, the amount of coverage was limited. Most stories were played down or put on inside pages, Researchers found that almost all the articles analyzed, 3,045 of 3,770, tended to focus on one of 16 identifiable subjects. Of this group, 502 articles, 16.5%, 
focused primarily on legislation which should be sought and planning which could be done to control ongoing riots and prevent future riots. The second largest category consisted of 471 articles, 15.5%, focusing on containment or control of riot action. Newspaper coverage of the disorders reflects efforts at caution and restraint. 2. Newspapers tended to characterize and portray last summer's riots in national terms rather than as local phenomena and problems, especially when rioting was taking place in the newspaper's own city. During the actual disorders, the newspapers in each city studied tended to print many stories dealing with disorders or racial troubles in other cities. About 40% of the riot or racial stories in each local newspaper during the period of rioting in that city came from the wire services. Furthermore, most newspaper editors appear to have given more headline attention to riots occurring elsewhere than to those at home during the time of trouble in their own cities. Accuracy of the Coverage we have tested the accuracy of coverage by means of interviews with local media representatives, city and police officials, and residents of the ghettos. To provide a broad base, we used three separate sources for interview data. The Commission's field survey teams, special field teams, and the findings of a special research study. As is to be expected, almost everyone had his own version of the truth but it is noteworthy that some editors and reporters themselves, in retrospect, have expressed concern about the accuracy of their own coverage. For example, one newspaper editor said at the Commission's Poughkeepsie Conference, We used things in our leads and headlines during the riot I wish we could have back now because they were wrong and they were bad mistakes. We used the words sniper kings and nests of snipers, we found out when we were able to get our own people into those areas and get them out from under the cars that these sniper kings and these nests of snipers were the constituted authorities shooting at each other, most of them. There was just one confirmed sniper in the entire eight-day riot, and he was drunk, and he had a pistol, and he was firing from a window. Television industry representatives at the conference stressed their concern about live coverage of disorders, and said they try, whenever possible, to view or edit taped or filmed sequences before broadcasting them. Conference participants admitted that live television coverage via helicopter of the 1965 Watts riot had been inflammatory, and network news executives expressed doubts that television would ever again present live coverage of a civil disorder. Most errors involved mistakes of fact, exaggeration of events, overplaying of particular stories, or prominently displayed speculation about unfounded rumors of potential trouble. This is not only a local problem. Because of the wire services and networks, it is a national one. An experienced riot reporter told the Commission that initial wire service reports of a disturbance tend to be inflated. The reason, he said, is that they are written by local bureau men who in most cases have not seen a civil disorder before. When out-of-town reporters with knowledge in the field or the wire service's own riot specialists arrive on the scene, the situation is put into a more accurate context. Some examples of exaggeration and mistakes about facts are catalogued here. These examples are by no means exhaustive. They represent only a few of the incidents discovered by the Commission, and no doubt are but a small part of the total number of such inaccuracies. But the Commission believes that they are representative of the kinds of errors likely to occur when, in addition to the confusion inherent in civil disorder situations, reporters are rushed and harried, or editors are superficial and careless. We present these as examples of mistakes that we hope will be avoided in the future. In particular, we believe newsmen should be wary of how they play rumors of impending trouble. Whether a rumor is reliable and significant enough to deserve coverage is an editorial decision. 
but the failure of many headlined rumors to be borne out last summer suggests that these editorial decisions often are not as carefully made as the sensitivity of the subject requires. In Detroit, a radio station broadcast a rumor, based on a telephone tip, that Negroes planned to invade suburbia one night later. If plans existed, they never materialized. In Cincinnati, several outlets ran a story about white youths arrested for possessing a bazooka. Only a few reports mentioned that the weapon was inoperable. In Tampa, a newspaper repeatedly indulged in speculation about impending trouble. When the state attorney ruled the fatal shooting of a Negro youth justifiable homicide, the paper's news columns reported, there were fears today that the ruling would stir new race problems for Tampa tonight. The day before, the paper quoted one top lawman as telling reporters he now fears that the Negro residents in the Central Avenue project and in the West Tampa trouble spots feel they are in competition and are trying to see which can cause the most unrest, which area can become the center of attraction. A West Coast newspaper put out an edition headlined, Rioting erupts in Washington, D.C. Negroes hurl bottles, rocks at police near White House. The story did not support the headline. It reported what was actually the fact, that a number of teenage Negroes broke store windows and threw bottles and stones at police and firemen near downtown Washington, a mile or more from the White House. On the other hand, the same paper did not report unfounded local rumors of sniping when other news media did. Television presents a different problem with respect to accuracy. In contrast to what some of its critics have charged, television sometimes may have leaned over too far backward in seeking balance and restraint. By stressing interviews, many with whites in predominantly Negro neighborhoods, and by emphasizing control scenes rather than riotous action, television news broadcasts may have given a distorted picture of what the disorders were all about. The media, especially television, also have failed to present and analyze to a sufficient extent the basic reasons for the disorders. There have, after the disorders, been some brilliant exceptions. Note. As examples, less than a month after the Detroit riot, the Detroit Free Press published the results of a landmark survey of local Negro attitudes and grievances. Newsweek magazine's November 20, 1967 special issue on the Negro American, What Must Be Done, made a significant contribution to public understanding. End note. As the content analysis findings suggest, however, Coverage during the riot period itself gives far more emphasis to control of rioters and black-white confrontation than to the underlying causes of the disturbances. Ghetto Reactions to the Media Coverage The Commission was particularly interested in public reaction to media coverage, specifically what people in the ghetto look at and read and how it affects them. The Commission has drawn upon reports from special teams of researchers who visited various cities where the outbreaks occurred last summer. Members of these teams interviewed ghetto dwellers and middle-class Negroes on their responses to news media. In addition, we have used information from a statistical study of the mass media in the Negro ghetto in Pittsburgh. These interviews and surveys, though by no means a complete study of the subject, lead to four broad conclusions about ghetto and, to a lesser degree, middle-class Negro reactions to the media. Most Negroes distrust what they refer to as the white press. As one interviewer reported, the average black person couldn't give less of a damn about what the media say. The intelligent black person is resentful at what he considers to be a totally false portrayal of what goes on in the ghetto. Most black people see the newspapers as mouthpieces of the power structure. These comments are echoed in most interview reports the Commission has read. Distrust and dislike of the media among ghetto Negroes encompass all the media, though in general the newspapers are mistrusted more than the television. 
This is not because television is thought to be more sensitive or more responsive to Negro needs and aspirations, but because ghetto residents believe that television at least lets them see the actual event for themselves. Even so, many Negroes, particularly teenagers, told researchers that they noted a pronounced discrepancy between what they saw in the riots and what television broadcast. Persons interviewed offered three chief reasons for their attitude. First, they believe, as suggested in the quotation above, that the media are instruments of the white power structure. They think that these white interests guide the entire white community, from the journalists' friends and neighbors to city officials, police officers, and department store owners. Publishers and editors, if not white reporters, they feel, support and defend these interests with enthusiasm and dedication. Second, many people in the ghettos apparently believe that newsmen rely on the police for most of their information about what is happening during a disorder, and tend to report much more of what the officials are doing and saying than what Negro citizens or leaders in the city are doing and saying. Editors and reporters at the Poughkeepsie Conference acknowledged that the police and city officials are their main, and sometimes their only, source of information. It was also noted that most reporters who cover civil disturbances tend to arrive with the police and stay close to them, often for safety, and often because they learn where the action is at the same time as the authorities, and thus buttress the ghetto impression that the police and press work together and toward the same ends, an impression that may come as a surprise to many within the ranks of police and press. Third, Negro residents in several cities surveyed cited as specific examples of media unfairness what they considered the failure of the media to report the many examples of Negroes helping law enforcement officers and assisting in the treatment of the wounded during disorders, to report adequately about false arrests, to report instances of excessive force by the National Guard, to explore and interpret the background conditions leading to the disturbances, to expose, except in Detroit, what they regarded as instances of police brutality, and to report on white vigilante groups which allegedly came into some disorder areas and molested innocent Negro residents. Some of these problems are insoluble, but more first-hand reporting in the diffuse and fragmented riot area should temper easy reliance on police information and announcements. There is a special need for news media to cover positive news stories in the ghetto before and after riots, with concern and enthusiasm. A multitude of news and information sources other than the established news media are relied upon in the ghetto. One of our studies found that 79% of a total of 567 ghetto residents interviewed in seven cities, Detroit, Newark, Atlanta, Tampa, New Haven, Cincinnati, and Milwaukee, first heard about the outbreak in their own city by word of mouth telephone and word-of-mouth exchanges on the streets, in churches, stores, pool halls, and bars provide more information and rumors about events of direct concern to ghetto residents than the more conventional news media. Among the established media, television and radio are far more popular in the ghetto than newspapers. Radios there apparently are ordinarily listened to less for news than for music and other programs. One survey showed that an overwhelmingly large number of Negro children and teenagers, like their white counterparts, listen to the radio for music alone, interspersed by disc jockey chatter. In other age groups, the response of most people about what they listen to on the radio was anything, leading to the conclusion that radio in the ghetto is basically a background accompaniment. But the fact that radio is such a constant background accompaniment can make it an important influence on people's attitudes, and perhaps on their actions once trouble develops. This is true for several reasons. The news presented on local rock stations seldom constitutes much more than terse headline items, which may startle or frighten, but seldom inform. 
radio disc jockeys and those who preside over the popular talk shows keep a steady patter of information going over the air. When a city is beset by civil strife, this patter can both inform transistor radio carrying young people where the action is and terrify their elders and much of the white community. Burn, baby, burn, the slogan of the Watts riot, was inadvertently originated by a radio disc jockey. Thus, radio can be an instrument of trouble and tension in a community threatened or inundated with civil disorder. It can also do much to minimize fear by putting fast-paced events into a proper perspective. We have found commendable instances, for example, in Detroit, Milwaukee, and New Brunswick, of radio stations and personalities using their airtime and influence to try to calm potential rioters. In the next section, we recommend procedures for meetings and consultations for advance planning among those who will cover civil disorders. It is important that radio personnel, and especially disc jockeys and talk show hosts, should be included in such pre-planning. Television is the formal news source most relied upon in the ghetto. According to one report, more than 75% of the sample turned to television for national and international news, and a larger percentage of the sample, 86%, regularly watched television from 5 to 7 p.m., the dinner hours when the evening news programs are broadcast. The significance of broadcasting in news dissemination is seen in Census Bureau estimates that in June 1967, 87.7% of non-white households and 94.8% of white households had television sets. When ghetto residents do turn to newspapers, most read tabloids, if available, far more frequently than standard-sized newspapers, and rely on the tabloids primarily for light features, racing charts, comic strips, fashion news, and display advertising. Conduct of Press Representatives Most newsmen appear to be aware and concerned that their very physical presence could exacerbate a small disturbance, but some have conducted themselves with a startling lack of common sense. News organizations, particularly television networks, have taken substantial steps to minimize the effect of the physical presence of their employees at a news event. Networks have issued internal instructions, calling for the use of unmarked cars and small cameras and tape recorders, and most stations instruct their cameramen to film without artificial light whenever possible. Still, some newsmen have done things for the sake of the story that could have contributed to the tension. Reports have come to the Commission's attention of individual newsmen staging events, coaxing youths to throw rocks and interrupt traffic, and otherwise acting irresponsibly at the incipient stages of a disturbance. Such acts are the responsibility of the news organization as well as of the individual reporter. Two examples occurred in Newark. Television cameramen, according to officials, crowded into and in front of police headquarters, interfering with law enforcement operations and making a general nuisance of themselves. In a separate incident, a New York newspaper photographer covering the Newark riot repeatedly urged and finally convinced a Negro boy to throw a rock for the camera, Crowding may occasionally be unavoidable, but staging of events is not. We believe every effort should be made to eliminate this sort of conduct. This requires the implementation of thoughtful, stringent staff guidelines for reporters and editors. Such guidelines, carefully formulated, widely disseminated, and strictly enforced, underlie the self-policing activities of some news organizations already, but they must be universally adopted if they are to be effective in curbing journalistic irresponsibility. The Commission has studied the internal guidelines in use last summer at the Associated Press, United Press International, the Washington Post, and the Columbia Broadcasting System. Many other news organizations, large and small, have similar guidelines, in general, the guidelines urge extreme care to ensure that reporting is thorough and balanced, 
and that words and statistics used are appropriate and accurate. The AP guidelines call for broad investigation into the immediate and underlying causes of an incident. The CBS guidelines demand as much caution as possible to avoid the danger of camera equipment and lights exacerbating the disturbance. Internal guidelines can, and all of those studied do, go beyond problems of physical presence at a disturbance to the substantive aspects of searching out, reporting, and writing the story. But the content of the guidelines is probably less important than the fact that the subject has been thoroughly considered and hammered out within the organization, and an approach developed that is designed to meet the organization's particular needs and solve its particular problems. We recommend that every news organization that does not now have some form of guidelines, or suspects that those it has are not working effectively, designate top editors to a. meet with its reporters who have covered or might be assigned to riots, b. discuss in detail the problems and procedures which exist or are expected, and c. formulate and disseminate directives based on these discussions. Regardless of the specific provisions, the vital step is for every news-gathering organization to adopt and implement at least some minimal form of internal control. End of Section 45 Recording by Maria Casper Section 46 of the Kerner Commission Report This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 15. The News Media and the Disorders, Part 3. A Recommendation to Improve Riot Coverage. A Need for Better Communication. A recurrent problem in the coverage of last summer's disorders was friction and lack of cooperation between police officers and working reporters. Many experienced and capable journalists complained that policemen and their commanding officers were at best apathetic and at worst overtly hostile toward reporters attempting to cover a disturbance. Policemen, on the other hand, charged that many reporters seemed to forget that the task of the police is to restore order. After considering available evidence on the subject, the Commission is convinced that these conditions reflect an absence of advance communication and planning among the people involved. We do not suggest that familiarity with the other's problems will beget total amity and cooperation. The interests of the media and the police are sometimes necessarily at variance but we do believe that communication is a vital step toward removing the obstacles produced by ignorance, confusion, and misunderstanding of what each group is actually trying to do. Mutual Orientation What is needed first is a series of discussions, perhaps a combination of informal gatherings and seminar-type workshops. They should encompass all ranks of the police, all levels of media employees, and a cross-section of city officials. At first, these would be get-acquainted sessions to air complaints and discuss common problems. Working reporters should get to know the police who would be likely to draw duty in a disorder. Police and city officials should use the sessions for frank and candid briefings on the problems the city might face and the official plans for dealing with disturbances. Later sessions might consider procedures to facilitate the physical movement of personnel and speed the flow of accurate and complete news. Such arrangements might involve nothing more than a procedure for designating specific locations at which police officers would be available to escort a reporter into a dangerous area. In addition, policemen and reporters working together might devise better methods of identification, communication, and training. Such procedures are infinitely variable and depend on the initiative, needs, and desires of those involved. If there is no existing institution or procedure for convening such meetings, 
We urge the mayor or city manager to do so in every city where experience suggests the possibility of future trouble. To allay any apprehension that discussions with officials might lead to restraints on the freedom to seek out and report the news, participants in these meetings should stipulate beforehand that freedom of the press to all areas for reporters will be preserved. Designation of Information Officers it is desirable to designate and prepare a number of police officers to act as media information officers. There should be enough of these so that in the event of a disturbance, a reporter will not have to seek far to find a policeman ready and able to give him information and answer questions. Officers should be of high enough rank within the police department to have ready access to information. Creation of an Information Center a nerve center for reliable police and official government information should be planned and ready for activation when a disturbance reaches a predetermined point of intensity. Such a center might be located at police headquarters or city hall. It should be directed by an experienced high-ranking information specialist with close ties to police officials. It is imperative, of course, that all officials keep a steady flow of accurate information coming into the center. Ideally, rooms would be set aside for taping and filming interviews with public officials. Local television stations might cut costs and relieve congestion by pooling some equipment at this central facility. An information center should not be thought of as replacing other news sources inside and outside the disturbance area. If anything, our studies suggest that reporters are already too closely tied to police and officials as news sources in a disorder. An information center should not be permitted to intensify this dependence. Properly conceived, however, a center can supplement on-the-spot reporting and supply news about official actions. Out-of-town reporters much of the difficulty last summer apparently revolved around relations between local law enforcement officials and out-of-town reporters. These reporters are likely to be less sensitive about preserving the image of the local community. Still, local officials serve their city badly when they ignore or impede national media representatives instead of informing them about the city and cooperating with their attempts to cover the story. City and police officials should designate liaison officers and distribute names and telephone numbers of police and other relevant officials, the place they can be found if trouble develops, and other information likely to be useful. National and other news organizations, in turn, could help matters by selecting a responsible home office official to act as a liaison in these cases and to be accessible by phone to local officials who encounter difficulty with on-the-spot representatives of an organization. General Guidelines and Codes In some cases, if all parties involved were willing, planning sessions might lead to the consideration of more formal undertakings. These might include a. Agreements on specific procedures to expedite the physical movement of men and equipment around disorder areas and back and forth through police lines. b. General guidelines on the behavior of both media and police personnel. and c. Arrangements for a brief moratorium on reporting news of an incipient disturbance. The Commission stresses once again its belief that though each of these possibilities merits consideration, none should be formulated or imposed by unilateral government action. Any procedure finally adopted should be negotiated between police and media representatives and should assure both sides the flexibility needed to do their respective jobs. Acceptance of such arrangements should be frankly based on grounds of self-interest for negotiated methods of procedure can often yield substantial benefits to each side and to the public which both serve. At the request of the Commission, the Community Relations Service of the Department of Justice surveyed recent experiences with formal codes. Most of the codes studied a. set forth in general terms common-sense standards of good journalistic conduct, and b 
establish procedures for a brief moratorium, seldom more than 30 minutes to an hour, on reporting an incipient disturbance. In its survey, the Community Relations Service described and analyzed experiences with codes in 11 major cities where they are currently in force. Members of the CRS staff conducted interviews with key citizens, newsmen, city officials, and community leaders in each of the 11 cities, seeking comments on the effectiveness and practicality of the codes and guidelines used. CRS's major findings and conclusions are, All codes and guidelines now in operation are basically voluntary arrangements, usually put forward by local authorities and accepted by the news media after consultation. Nowhere has an arrangement or agreement been effective that binds the news media without their assent. No one interviewed in this survey considered the code or guidelines in effect in his city as useless or harmful. CRS thought that where they were in effect, the codes had a constructive impact on the local news media. Observers in some cities, however, thought the increased sense of responsibility manifested by press and television was due more to experience with riot coverage than to the existence of the codes. The more controversial and often least understood aspect of the guidelines has been provision for a brief voluntary moratorium on the reporting of news. Some kind of moratorium is specified in the codes of six cities surveyed, Chicago, Omaha, Buffalo, Indianapolis, Kansas City, and Toledo, and the moratorium was invoked last summer in Chicago and Indianapolis. In each case, an effort to prevent quite minor racial incidents from escalating into more serious trouble was successful, and many thought the moratorium contributed. The confusion about a moratorium and the resulting aversion to it is unfortunate. The specific period of the delay is seldom more than 30 minutes. In practice, under today's conditions of reporting and broadcasting, this often will mean little, if any, delay before the full story gets into the paper or on the air. The time can be used to prepare and edit the story, and to verify and assess the reports of trouble. The only loss is the banner headline or the broadcast news bulletin that is released prematurely to avoid being beaten by the competition. It is just such reflexive responses that can lead to sensationalism and inaccuracy. In cities where a moratorium is part of the code, CRS interviewers detected no discontent over its presence. The most frequent complaint about shortcomings in existing codes is that many of them do not reach the underpinnings of crisis situations. Ghetto spokesmen in particular said that the emphasis in the codes on conduct during the crisis itself tended to lead the media to neglect reporting the underlying causes of racial tension. At the Poughkeepsie conference with media representatives, there was considerable criticism of the Chicago Code on the grounds that their moratorium is open-ended, once put into effect, it is supposed to be maintained until the situation is under control. There were doubts about how effective this code has been in practice. The voluntary news blackout in Detroit for part of the first day of the riot, apparently at the request of officials and civil rights groups, was cited as evidence that suppression of the news of violence does not necessarily defuse a riot situation. On the basis of the CRS survey and other evidence, the Commission concludes that codes are seldom harmful, often useful, but no panacea. To be of any use, they must address themselves to the substance of the problems that plague relations between the press and officialdom during a disorder. But they are only one of several methods of improving those relations— Ultimately, no matter how sensitive or comprehensive a code or set of guidelines may be, efficient, accurate reporting must depend on the intelligence, judgment, and training of newsmen, police, and city officials together. End of section 46. Recording by Maria Casper.
Section 47 of the Kerner Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 15 The News Media and the Disorders, Part 4 Reporting Racial Problems in the United States A Failure to Communicate the Commission's major concern with the news media is not in riot reporting as such, but in the failure to report adequately on race relations and ghetto problems, and to bring more Negroes into journalism. Concern about this was expressed by a number of participants in our Poughkeepsie conference. Disorders are only one aspect of the dilemmas and difficulties of race relations in America, in defining, explaining, and reporting this broader, more complex, and ultimately far more fundamental subject, the communications media, ironically, have failed to communicate. They have not communicated to the majority of their audience, which is white, a sense of the degradation, misery, and hopelessness of living in the ghetto. They have not communicated to whites a feeling for the difficulties and frustrations of being a Negro in the United States. They have not shown understanding or appreciation of, and thus have not communicated, a sense of Negro culture, thought, or history. Equally important, most newspaper articles and most television programming ignore the fact that an appreciable part of their audience is black. The world that television and newspapers offer to their black audience is almost totally white, in both appearance and attitude. As we have said, our evidence shows that the so-called white press is at best mistrusted and at worst held in contempt by many black Americans. Far too often the press acts and talks about Negroes as if Negroes do not read the newspapers or watch television, give birth, marry, die, or go to PTA meetings. Some newspapers and stations are beginning to make efforts to fill this void, but they still have a long way to go. The absence of Negro faces and activities from the media has an effect on white audiences as well as black. If what the white American reads in the newspapers or sees on television conditions his expectation of what is ordinary and normal in the larger society, he will neither understand nor accept the black American. By failing to portray the Negro as a matter of routine and in the context of total society, the news media have, we believe, contributed to the black-white schism in this country. When the white press does refer to Negroes and Negro problems, it frequently does so as if Negroes were not part of the audience. This is perhaps understandable in a system where whites edit and to a large extent write news, but such attitudes in an area as sensitive and inflammatory as this feed Negro alienation and intensify white prejudices. We suggest that a top editor or news director monitor his news production for a period of several weeks, taking note of how certain stories and language will affect black readers or viewers. A Negro staff member could do this easily. Then the staff should be informed about the problems involved. The problems of race relations coverage go beyond incidents of white bias. Many editors and news directors plagued by shortages of staff and lack of reliable contacts and sources of information in the city, have failed to recognize the significance of the urban story and to develop resources to cover it adequately. We believe that most news organizations do not have direct access to diversified news sources in the ghetto. Seldom do they have a total sense of what is going on there. Some of the blame rests on Negro leaders who do not trust the media and will not deal candidly with representatives of the white press. But the real failure rests with the news organizations themselves. They, like other elements of the white community, have ignored the ghettos for decades. Now they seek instant acceptance and cooperation. The development of good contacts, reliable information, and understanding 
requires more effort and time than an occasional visit by a team of reporters to do a feature on a newly discovered ghetto problem. It requires reporters permanently assigned to this beat. They must be adequately trained and supported to dig out and tell the story of a major social upheaval, among the most complicated, portentous, and explosive our society has known. We believe, also, that the Negro press, manned largely by people who live and work in the ghetto, could be a particularly useful source of information and guidance about activities in the black community. Reporters and editors from Negro newspapers and radio stations should be included in any conference between media and police city representatives, and we suggest that large news organizations would do well to establish better lines of communication with their counterparts in the Negro press. In short, the news media must find ways of exploring the problems of the Negro and the ghetto more deeply and more meaningfully. To editors who say, we have run thousands of inches on the ghetto which nobody reads, and to television executives who bemoan scores of underwatched documentaries, we say, find more ways of telling this story, for it is a story you as journalists must tell, honestly, realistically, and imaginatively. It is the responsibility of the news media to tell the story of race relations in America, and, with notable exceptions, the media have not yet turned to the task with the wisdom, sensitivity, and expertise it demands. Negroes in Journalism The journalistic profession has been shockingly backward in seeking out, hiring, training, and promoting Negroes. Fewer than 5% of the people employed by the news business in editorial jobs in the United States today are Negroes, Fewer than 1% of editors and supervisors are Negroes, and most of them work for Negro-owned organizations. The lines of various news organizations to the militant blacks are, by admission of the newsmen themselves, almost non-existent. The plaint is, we can't find qualified Negroes. But this rings hollow from an industry where only yesterday jobs were scarce and promotion unthinkable for a man whose skin was black. Even today there are virtually no Negroes in positions of editorial or executive responsibility, and there is only one Negro newsman with a nationally syndicated column. News organizations must employ enough Negroes in positions of significant responsibility to establish an effective link to Negro actions and ideas and to meet legitimate employment expectations. Tokenism, the hiring of one Negro reporter, or even two or three, is no longer enough. Negro reporters are essential, but so are Negro editors, writers, and commentators, Newspaper and television policies are, generally speaking, not set by reporters. Editorial decisions about which stories to cover and which to use are made by editors. Yet very few Negroes in this country are involved in making these decisions because very few, if any, supervisory editorial jobs are held by Negroes. We urge the news media to do everything possible to train and promote their Negro reporters to positions where those who are qualified can contribute to and have an effect on policy decisions. It is not enough, though, as many editors have pointed out to the Commission, to search for Negro journalists. Journalism is not very popular as a career for aspiring young Negroes. The starting pay is comparatively low and it is a business which has, until recently, discouraged and rejected them. The recruitment of Negro reporters must extend beyond established journalists, or those who have already formed ambitions along those lines. It must become a commitment to seek out young Negro men and women, inspire them to become, and then train them as journalists. Training programs should be started at high schools and intensified at colleges. Summer vacation and part-time editorial jobs, coupled with offers of permanent employment, can awaken career plans. 
we believe that the news media themselves, their audiences, and the country will profit from these undertakings. For if the media are to comprehend and then to project the Negro community, they must have the help of Negroes. If the media are to report with understanding, wisdom, and sympathy on the problems of the cities and the problems of the black man, for the two are increasingly intertwined, they must employ, promote, and listen to Negro journalists. THE NEGRO IN THE MEDIA Finally, the news media must publish newspapers and produce programs that recognize the existence and activities of the Negro, both as a Negro and as part of the community. It would be a contribution of inestimable importance to race relations in the United States simply to treat ordinary news about Negroes as news of other groups is now treated. Specifically, newspapers should integrate Negroes and Negro activities into all parts of the paper, from the news, society, and club pages to the comic strips. Television should develop programming which integrates Negroes into all aspects of televised presentations. Television is such a visible medium that some constructive steps are easy and obvious. While some of these steps are being taken, they are still largely neglected. For example, Negro reporters and performers should appear more frequently at prime time in news broadcasts, on weather shows, in documentaries, and in advertisements. Some effort already has been made to use Negroes in television commercials. Any initial surprise at seeing a Negro selling a sponsor's product will eventually fade into routine acceptance, an attitude that white society must ultimately develop toward all Negroes. In addition to news-related programming, we think that Negroes should appear more frequently in dramatic and comedy series. Moreover, networks and local stations should present plays and other programs whose subjects are rooted in the ghetto and its problems. Institute of Urban Communications The Commission is aware that in this area, as in all other aspects of race relations, the problems are great, and it is much easier to state them than to solve them. Various pressures, competitive, financial, advertising, may impede progress toward more balanced, in-depth coverage and toward the hiring and training of more Negro personnel. Most newspapers and local television and radio stations do not have the resources or the time to keep abreast of all the technical advances, academic theories, and government programs affecting the cities and the lives of their black inhabitants. During the course of this study, the Commission members and the staff have had many conversations with publishers, editors, broadcasters, and reporters throughout the country. The consensus appears to be that most of them would like to do much more, but simply do not have the resources for independent efforts in either training or coverage. The Commission believes that some of these problems could be resolved if there were a central organization to develop, gather, and distribute talent, resources, and information, and to keep the work of the press in this field under review. For this reason, the Commission proposes the establishment of an Institute of Urban Communications on a private, non-profit basis. The Institute would have neither governmental ties nor governmental authority. Its board would consist in substantial part of professional journalists and, for the rest, of distinguished public figures. The staff would be made up of journalists and students of the profession. Funding would be sought initially from private foundations. Ultimately, it may be hoped, financial support would be forthcoming from within the profession. The Institute would be charged, in the first instance, with general responsibility for carrying out the media recommendations of the Commission, though as it developed a momentum and life of its own, it would also gain its own view of the problems and possibilities. Initial tasks would include 1. Training and education for journalists in the field of urban affairs. The Institute should organize and sponsor on its own and in cooperation with universities and other institutions 
a comprehensive range of courses, seminars, and workshops designed to give reporters, editors, and publishers the background they need to cover the urban scene. Offerings would vary in duration and intensity, from weekend conferences to grants for year-long individual study on the order of the Neiman Fellowships. All levels and all kinds of news outlets should be served. A most important activity might be to assist disc jockeys and commentators on stations that address themselves especially to the Negro community. Particularly important would be sessions of a month or more for seasoned reporters and editors, comparable to middle management seminars or mid-career training in other callings. The press must have all of the intellectual resources and background to give adequate coverage to the city and the ghetto. It should be the first duty of the Institute to see that this is provided. 2. Recruitment, Training, and Placement of Negro Journalists The scarcity of Negroes in responsible news jobs intensifies the difficulties of communicating the reality of the contemporary American city to white newspaper and television audiences. The special viewpoint of the Negro who has lived through these problems and bears their marks upon him is, as we have seen, notably absent from what is, on the whole, a white press. But full integration of Negroes into the journalistic profession is imperative in its own right. It is unacceptable that the press, itself the special beneficiary of fundamental constitutional protection, should lag so far behind other fields in giving effect to the fundamental human right to equality of opportunity. To help correct this situation, the Institute will have to undertake far-ranging activities. Providing educational opportunities for would-be Negro journalists is not enough. There will have to be changes in the career outlooks for Negro students and their counselors back to the secondary school level, and changes in these attitudes will come slowly unless there is a change in the reality of employment and advancement opportunities for Negroes in journalism. This requires an aggressive placement program, seeking out newspapers, television, and radio stations that discriminate, whether consciously or unconsciously, and mobilizing the pressures, public, private, and legal, necessary to break the pattern, the Institute might also provide assistance to Negro newspapers, which now recruit and train many young journalists. 3. Police-Press Relations The Commission has stressed the failures in this area, and has laid out a set of remedial measures for action at the local level. But if reliance is placed exclusively on local initiative, we can predict that in many places, often those that need it most, our recommended steps will not be taken. Pressure from the federal government for action along the lines proposed would be suspect, probably by both press and local officials. But the Institute could undertake the task of stimulating community action in line with the Commission's recommendations, without arousing local hostility and suspicion. Moreover, the Institute could serve as a clearinghouse for exchange of experience in this field. 4. Review of Media Performance on Riots and Racial Issues The Institute should review press and television coverage of riot and racial news and publicly award praise and blame. The Commission recognizes that government restraints or guidelines in this field are both unworkable and incompatible with our Constitution and traditions. Internal guidelines or voluntary advance arrangements may be useful, but they tend to be rather general, and the standards they prescribe are neither self-applying nor self-enforcing. We believe it would be healthy for reporters and editors who work in this sensitive field to know that others will be viewing their work and will hold them publicly accountable for lapses from accepted standards of good journalism, the Institute should publicize its findings by means of regular and special reports. It might also set a series of awards for especially meritorious work of individuals or news organizations in race relations reporting. 
5. An Urban Affairs Service Whatever may be done to improve the quality of reporting on urban affairs, there always will be a great many outlets that are too small to support the specialized investigation, reporting, and interpreting needed in this field. To fill this gap, the Institute could organize a comprehensive urban news service, available at a modest fee to any news organization that wanted it. The Institute would have its own specially trained reporters, and it would also cull the national press for news and feature stories of broader interest that could be reprinted or broadcast by subscribers. 6. Continuing Research Our own investigations have shown us that academic work on the impact of media on race relations, its role in shaping attitudes, and the effects of the choices it makes on people's behavior, is in a rudimentary stage, the Commission's content analysis is the first study of its type of contemporary riot coverage, and it is extremely limited in scope. A whole range of questions needs intensive scholarly exploration, and indeed the development of new modes of research and analysis. The Institute should undertake many of these important projects under its own auspices, and could stimulate others in the academic community to further research. Along with the country as a whole, the press has too long basked in a white world, looking out of it, if at all, with white men's eyes and a white perspective. That is no longer good enough. The painful process of readjustment that is required of the American news media must begin now. They must make a reality of integration, in both their product and their personnel, they must insist on the highest standards of accuracy, not only reporting single events with care and skepticism, but placing each event into meaningful perspective. They must report the travail of our cities with compassion and in depth. In all this, the Commission asks for fair and courageous journalism, commitment and coverage that are worthy of one of the crucial domestic stories in America's history. End of section 47. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 48 of the Kerner Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abayi in February 2020. Report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders Kerner Commission Report Chapter 16 The Future of the Cities Part 1 Introduction We believe action of the kind outlined in preceding pages can contribute substantially to control of disorders in the near future. But there should be no mistake about the long run. The underlying forces continue to gain momentum. The most basic of these is the accelerating segregation of low-income, disadvantaged Negroes within the ghettos of the largest American cities. By 1985, the 12.1 million Negroes segregated within central cities today will have grown to approximately 20.3 million, an increase of 68%. Prospects for domestic peace and for the quality of American life are linked directly to the future of these cities. Two critical questions must be confronted. Where do present trends now lead? What choices are open to us? The key trends. Negro population growth. The size of the Negro population in central cities is closely related to total national Negro population growth. In the past 16 years, about 98% of this growth has occurred within metropolitan areas and 86% in the central cities of those areas. A conservative projection of national Negro population growth indicates continued rapid increases. For the period 1966 to 1985, it will rise to a total of 30.7 million, gaining an average of 484,000 a year, 
or 7.6% more than the increase in each year from 1960 to 1966. Central Cities Further Negro population growth in central cities depends upon two key factors, immigration from outside metropolitan areas and patterns of Negro settlement within metropolitan areas. From 1960 to 1966, the Negro population of all central cities rose 2.4 million, 88.9% of total national Negro population growth. We estimate that natural growth accounted for 1.4 million, or 58% of this increase, and in-migration accounted for 1 million, or 42%. As of 1966, the Negro population in all central cities totaled 12.1 million. By 1985, we have estimated that it will rise 68% to 20.3 million. We believe that natural growth will account for 5.2 million of this increase and in migration for 3 million. Without significant Negro out migration, then, the combined Negro populations of central cities will continue to grow by an average of 274,000 a year through 1985, even if no further in migration occurs. Growth projected on the basis of natural increase and in-migration would raise the proportion of Negroes to whites in central cities by 1985 from the present 20.7% to between an estimated 31 and 34.7%. Largest Central Cities These, however, are national figures. Much faster increases will occur in the largest central cities where Negro growth has been concentrated in the past two decades. Washington, D.C., Gary, and Newark are already over half Negro. A continuation of recent trends would cause the following ten major cities to become over 50% Negro by the indicated dates. New Orleans, 1971. Richmond, 1971. Baltimore, 1972, Jacksonville, 1972, Cleveland, 1975, St. Louis, 1978, Detroit, 1979, Philadelphia, 1981, Oakland, 1983, Chicago, 1984. These cities, plus Washington, D.C., now over 66% Negro, and Newark contained 12.6 million people in 1960, or 22% of the total population of all 224 American central cities. All 13 cities undoubtedly will have Negro majorities by 1985, and the suburbs ringing them will remain largely all white, unless there are major changes in Negro fertility rates, in migration, settlement patterns, or public policy. Experience indicates that Negro school enrollment in these and other cities will exceed 50% long before the total population reaches that mark. In fact, Negro students already comprise more than a majority in the public elementary schools of 12 of the 13 cities mentioned above. This occurs because the Negro population in central cities is much younger and because a much higher proportion of white children attend private schools. For example, St. Louis's population was about 36% Negro in 1965. Its public elementary school enrollment was 63% Negro. If present trends continue, many cities in addition to those listed above will have Negro school majorities by 1985, probably including Dallas, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, Cincinnati, Harrisburg, Louisville, Indianapolis, Kansas City, Missouri, Hartford, New Haven. Thus, continued concentration of future Negro population growth in large central cities will produce significant changes in those cities over the next 20 years. Unless there are sharp changes in the factors influencing Negro settlement patterns within metropolitan areas, 
there is little doubt that the trend toward Negro majorities will continue. Even a complete cessation of net Negro in-migration to central cities would merely postpone this result for a few years. Growth of the Young Negro Population We estimate that the nation's white population will grow 16.6 .6 million, or 9.6%, from 1966 to 1975, and the Negro population 3.8 million, or 17.7%, in the same period. The Negro age group from 15 to 24 years of age, however, will grow much faster than either the Negro population as a whole or the white population in the same age group. From 1966 to 1975, the total number of Negroes in this age group nationally will rise 1.6 million, or 40.1%. The white population aged 15 to 24 will rise 6.6 .6 million, or 23.5%. This rapid increase in the young Negro population has important implications for the country. This group has the highest unemployment rate in the nation, commits a relatively high proportion of all crimes, and plays the most significant role in civil disorders. By the same token, it is a great reservoir of underused human resources which are vital to the nation. The Location of New Jobs Most new employment opportunities do not occur in central cities, near all Negro neighborhoods. They are being created in suburbs and outlying areas, and this trend is likely to continue indefinitely. New office buildings have risen in the downtowns of large cities, often near all Negro areas. But the outflow of manufacturing and retailing facilities normally offsets this addition significantly, and in many cases has caused a net loss of jobs in central cities, while the new white-collar jobs are often not available to ghetto residents. Providing employment for the swelling Negro ghetto population will require society to link these potential workers more closely with job locations. This can be done in three ways. By developing incentives to industry to create new employment centers near Negro residential areas. By opening suburban residential areas to Negroes and encouraging them to move closer to industrial centers. Or by creating better transportation between ghetto neighborhoods and new job locations. All three involve large public outlays. The first method, creating new industries in or near the ghetto, is not likely to occur without government subsidies on a scale which convinces private firms that it will pay them to face the problems involved. The second method, opening up suburban areas to Negro occupancy, obviously requires effective fair housing laws. It will also require an extensive program of federally aided, low-cost housing in many suburban areas. The third approach, improved transportation linking ghettos and suburbs, has received little attention from city planners and municipal officials. A few demonstration projects show promise, but carrying them out on a large scale will be very costly. Although a high proportion of new jobs will be located in suburbs, there are still millions of jobs in central cities. Turnover in those jobs alone can open up a great many potential positions for Negro central city residents, if employers cease racial discrimination in their hiring and promotion practices. Nevertheless, as the total number of Negro central city job seekers continues to rise, the need to link them with emerging new employment in the suburbs will become increasingly urgent. The increasing cost of municipal services Local governments have had to bear a particularly heavy financial burden in the two decades since the end of World War II. All U.S. cities are highly dependent upon property taxes that are relatively unresponsive to changes in income. Consequently, Growing municipalities have been hard-pressed for adequate revenues to meet rising demands for services generated by population increase. On the other hand, 
stable or declining cities have not only been faced with steady cost increases, but also with a slow-growing, or even declining, tax base. As a result of the population shifts of the post-war period, concentrating the middle class in residential suburbs while leaving the poor in the central cities, the increasing burden of municipal taxes frequently falls upon that part of the urban population least able to pay them. Increasing concentrations of urban growth have called forth greater expenditures for every kind of public service – education, health, police protection, fire protection, parks, sanitation, etc. These expenditures have strikingly outpaced tax revenues. The story is summed up below. Local government revenues, expenditures and debts – in billions of dollars. Revenues, 1950, 11.7, 1966, 41.5, increase, plus 29.8. Expenditures, 1950, 17.0, 1966, 60.7, increase, 43.7. Debt outstanding, 1950, 18.8. 1966, 77.5, increase, 58.7. Despite the growth of federal assistance to urban areas under various grant-in-aid programs, the fiscal plight of many cities is likely to grow even more serious in the future. Local expenditures inevitably will continue to rise steeply as a result of several factors, including the difficulty of increasing productivity in the predominantly service activities of local governments, together with the rapid technologically induced increases in productivity in other economic sectors. Traditionally, individual productivity has risen faster in the manufacturing, mining, construction and agricultural sectors than in those involving personal services. However, since all sectors compete with each other for talent and personnel, wages and salaries in the service-dominated sectors generally must keep up with those in the capital-dominated sectors. Since productivity in manufacturing has risen about 2.5% per year, compounded over many decades, and even faster in agriculture, the basis for setting costs in the service-dominated sectors has gone up too. In the post-war period, costs of the same units of output have increased very rapidly in certain key activities of local government. For example, education is the single biggest form of expenditure by local governments, including school districts, accounting for over 40% of their outlays. From 1947 to 1967, Costs per pupil day in U.S. public schools rose at a rate of 6.7% per year compounded, only slightly less than doubling every 10 years. This major cost item is likely to keep on raising rapidly in the future, along with other government services like police, fire and welfare activities. Some increases in productivity may occur in these fields, and some economies may be achieved through use of assistance such as police and teachers' aids. Nevertheless, the need to keep pace with private sector wage scales will force local government costs to rise sharply. This and other future cost increases are important to future relations between central cities and suburbs. Rising costs will inevitably force central cities to demand more and more assistance from the federal government. But the federal government can obtain such funds through the income tax only from other parts of the economy. Suburban governments are, meanwhile, experiencing the same cost increases along with the rising resentment of their constituents. Choices for the Future the complexity of American society offers many choices for the future of relations between central cities and suburbs, and patterns of white and negro settlement in metropolitan areas. For practical purposes, however, 
we see two fundamental questions. Should future Negro population growth be concentrated in central cities, as in the past 20 years, thereby forcing Negro and white populations to become even more residentially segregated? Should society provide greatly increased special assistance to Negroes and other relatively disadvantaged population groups? For purposes of analysis, the Commission has defined three basic choices for the future embodying specific answers to these questions. The present policies choice. Under this course, the nation would maintain approximately the share of resources now being allocated to programs of assistance for the poor, unemployed, and disadvantaged. These programs are likely to grow, given continuing economic growth and rising federal revenues, but they will not grow fast enough to stop, yet alone reverse, the already deteriorating quality of life in central city ghettos. This choice carries the highest ultimate price, as we will point out. The enrichment choice. Under this course, the nation would seek to offset the effects of continued Negro segregation and deprivation in large city ghettos. The enrichment choice would aim at creating dramatic improvements in the quality of life in disadvantaged central city neighborhoods, both white and Negro. It would require marked increases in federal spending for education, housing, employment, job training, and social services. The enrichment choice would seek to lift poor Negroes and whites above poverty status and thereby give them the capacity to enter the mainstream of American life. But it would not, at least for many years, appreciably affect either the increasing concentration of Negroes in the ghetto or racial segregation in residential areas outside the ghetto. The integration choice. This choice would be aimed at reversing the movement of the country toward two societies, separate and unequal. The integration choice, like the enrichment choice, would call for large-scale improvement in the quality of ghetto life but it would also involve both creating strong incentives for Negro movement out of central city ghettos and enlarging freedom of choice concerning housing, employment, and schools. The result would fall considerably short of full integration. The experience of other ethnic groups indicates that some Negro households would be scattered in largely white residential areas. Others, probably a larger number, would voluntarily cluster together in largely Negro neighborhoods. The integration choice would thus produce both integration and segregation, but the segregation would be voluntary. Articulating these three choices plainly oversimplifies the possibilities open to the country. We believe, however, that they encompass the basic issues issues which the American public must face if it is serious in its concern not only about civil disorder, but the future of our democratic society. The Present Policies Choice Powerful forces of social and political inertia are moving the country steadily along the course of existing policies toward a divided country. This course may well involve changes in many social and economic programs, but not enough to produce fundamental alterations in the key factors of Negro concentration, racial segregation, and the lack of sufficient enrichment to arrest the decay of deprived neighborhoods. Some movement toward enrichment can be found in efforts to encourage industries to locate plants in central cities, in increased federal expenditures for education, in the important concepts embodied in the War of Poverty and in the Model Cities program. But congressional appropriations for even present federal programs have been so small that they fall short of effective enrichment. As for challenging concentration and segregation, a national commitment to this purpose has yet to develop. Of the three future courses we have defined, the present policies choice the choice we are now making, is the course with the most ominous consequences for our society. 
the probability of future civil disorders. We believe that the present policy's choice would lead to a larger number of violent incidents of the kind that have stimulated recent major disorders. First, it does nothing to raise the hopes, absorb the energies, or constructively challenge the talents of the rapidly growing number of young Negro men in central cities. The proportion of unemployed or underemployed among them will remain very high. These young men have contributed disproportionately to crime and violence in cities in the past, and there is danger, obviously, that they will continue to do so. Second, under these conditions, a rising proportion of Negroes in disadvantaged city areas might come to look upon the deprivation and segregation they suffer as proper justification for violent protest or for extending support to now isolated extremists who advocate civil disruption by guerrilla tactics. More incidents would not necessarily mean more or worse riots. For the near future, there is substantial likelihood that even an increased number of incidents could be controlled before becoming major disorders, if society undertakes to improve police and national guard forces, so they can respond to potential disorders with more prompt and disciplined use of force. In fact, the likelihood of incidents mushrooming into major disorders would be only slightly higher in the near future under the present policy's choice than under the other two possible choices. For no new policies or programs could possibly alter basic ghetto conditions immediately. And the announcement of new programs under the other choices would immediately generate new expectations. Expectations inevitably increase faster than performance. In the short run, they might even increase the level of frustration. In the long run, however, the present policy's choice risks a seriously greater probability of major disorders, worse, possibly, than those already experienced. If the Negro population as a whole developed even stronger feelings of being wrongly penned in and discriminated against, many of its members might come to support not only riots, but the rebellion now being preached by only a handful. Large-scale violence, followed by white retaliation, could follow. This spiral could quite conceivably lead to a kind of urban apartheid with semi-martial law in many major cities, enforced residence of Negroes in segregated areas, and a drastic reduction in personal freedom for all Americans, particularly Negroes. The same distinction is applicable to the cost of the present policy's choice. In the short run, its costs, at least its direct cash outlays, would be far less than for the other choices. Social and economic programs likely to have significant lasting effect would require very substantial annual appropriations for many years. Their cost would far exceed the direct losses sustained in recent civil disorders. Property damage in all the disorders we investigated, including Detroit and Newark, totaled less than $100 million. But it would be a tragic mistake to view the present policy's choice as cheap. Damage figures measure only a small part of the costs of civil disorder. They cannot measure the costs in terms of the lives lost, injuries suffered, minds and attitudes closed and frozen in prejudice, or the hidden costs of the profound disruption of entire cities. Ultimately, moreover, the economic and social costs of the present policy's choice will far surpass the cost of the alternatives. The rising concentration of impoverished Negroes and other minorities within the urban ghettos will constantly expand public expenditures for welfare, law enforcement, unemployment, and other existing programs without arresting the decay of older city neighborhoods and the breeding of frustration and discontent. But the most significant item on the balance of accounts will remain largely invisible and incalculable, the toll in human values taken by continued poverty, segregation, and inequality of opportunity. End of section 48.
Section 49 of The Kerner Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in February 2020. Report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. Kerner Commission Report. Chapter 16. The Future of the Cities. Part 2. Polarization. Another and equally serious consequence is the fact that this course would lead to the permanent establishment of two societies, one predominantly white and located in the suburbs, in smaller cities and in outlying areas, and one largely negro located in central cities. We are well on the way to just such a divided nation. This division is veiled by the fact that Negroes do not now dominate many central cities. But they soon will, as we have shown, and the new Negro mayors will be facing even more difficult conditions than now exist. As Negroes succeed whites in our largest cities, the proportion of low-income residents in those cities will probably increase. This is likely even if both white and Negro incomes continue to rise at recent rates, since Negroes have much lower incomes than whites. Moreover, many of the ills of large central cities spring from their age, their location, and their obsolete physical structures. The deterioration and economic decay stemming from these factors have been proceeding for decades and will continue to plague older cities regardless of who resides in them. These facts underlie the fourfold dilemma of the American city. Fewer tax dollars come in as large numbers of middle income taxpayers move out of central cities and property values and business decline. More tax dollars are required to provide essential public services and facilities and to meet the needs of expanding lower income groups. Each tax dollar buys less because of increasing costs. Citizen dissatisfaction with municipal services grows as needs, expectations and standards of living increase throughout the community. These are the conditions that would greet the Negro-dominated municipal governments that will gradually come to power in many of our major cities. The Negro electorates in those cities probably would demand basic changes in present policies. Like the present white electorates there, they would have to look for assistance to two basic sources, the private sector and the federal government. With respect to the private sector, major private capital investment in those cities may have ceased almost altogether if white-dominated firms and industries decided the risks and costs were too great. The withdrawal of private capital is already far advanced in most all Negro areas of our large cities. Even if private investment continued, it alone would not suffice. Big cities containing high proportions of low-income Negroes and block after block of deteriorating older property need very substantial assistance from the federal government to meet the demands of their electorates for improved services and living conditions. It is probable, however, that Congress will be more heavily influenced by representatives of the suburban and outlying city electorate. These areas will comprise 40% of our total population by 1985, compared with 31% in 1960, and central cities will decline from 32% to 27%. Since even the suburbs will be feeling the squeeze of higher local government costs, Congress might resist providing the extensive assistance which central cities will desperately need. Thus, the present policy's choice, if pursued for any length of time, might force simultaneous political and economic polarization in many of our largest metropolitan areas. Such polarization would involve large central cities, mainly Negro, with many poor and nearly bankrupt, on the one hand, and most suburbs, mainly white, generally affluent, but heavily taxed, on the other hand. 
some areas might avoid political confrontation by shifting to some form of metropolitan government designed to offer regional solutions for pressing urban problems such as property taxation, air and water pollution, refuse disposal and commuter transport. Yet, this would hardly eliminate the basic segregation and relative poverty of the urban Negro population. It might even increase the Negro sense of frustration and alienation if it operated to prevent Negro political control of central cities. The acquisition of power by Negro-dominated governments in central cities is surely a legitimate and desirable exercise of political power by a minority group. It is in an American political tradition exemplified by the achievements of the Irish in New York and Boston. But such Negro political development would also involve virtually complete racial segregation and virtually complete spatial separation. By 1985, the separate Negro society in our central cities would contain almost 21 million citizens. That is almost 68% larger than the present Negro population of central cities. It is also larger than the current population of every Negro nation in Africa, except Nigeria. If developing a racially integrated society is extraordinarily difficult today, when 12.1 million Negroes live in central cities, then it is quite clearly going to be virtually impossible in 1985, when almost 21 million Negroes, still much poorer and less educated than most whites, will be living there. Can present policies avoid extreme polarization? There are at least two possible developments under the present policies choice which might avert such polarization. The first is a faster increase of incomes among Negroes than has occurred in the recent past. This might prevent central cities from becoming even deeper poverty traps than they now are. It suggests the importance of effective job programs and higher levels of welfare payments for dependent families. The second possible development is migration of a growing Negro middle class out of the central city. This would not prevent competition for federal funds between central cities and outlying areas, but it might diminish the racial undertones of that competition. There is, however, no evidence that a continuation of present policies would be accompanied by any such movement. There is already a significant Negro middle class. It grew rapidly from 1960 to 1966. Yet, in these years, 88.9% of the total national growth of Negro population was concentrated in central cities, the highest in history. Indeed, from 1960 to 1966, there was actually a net total in-migration of Negroes from the urban fringes of metropolitan areas into central cities. The Commission believes it unlikely that this trend will suddenly reverse itself without significant changes in private attitudes and public policies. The Enrichment Choice the present policy's choice plainly would involve continuation of efforts like model cities, manpower programs, and the war on poverty. These are in fact enrichment programs designed to improve the quality of life in the ghetto. Because of their limited scope and funds, however, they constitute only very modest steps toward enrichment, and would continue to do so even if these programs were somewhat enlarged or supplemented. The premise of the enrichment choice is performance. To adopt this choice would require a substantially greater share of national resources, sufficient to make a dramatic, visible impact on life in the urban Negro ghetto. The effect of enrichment on civil disorders. Effective enrichment policies probably would have three immediate effects on civil disorders. First, Announcement of specific large-scale programs and the demonstration of a strong intent to carry them out might persuade ghetto residents that genuine remedies for their problems were forthcoming, thereby allaying tensions. Second, such announcements would strongly stimulate the aspirations and hopes of members of these communities, possibly well beyond the capabilities of society to deliver and to do so promptly. 
this might increase frustration and discontent, to some extent cancelling the first effect. Third, if there could be immediate action on meaningful job training and the creation of productive jobs for large numbers of unemployed young people, they would become much less likely to engage in civil disorders. Such action is difficult now, when there are about 585,000 young Negro men aged 14 to 24 in the civilian labor force in central cities, of whom 81,000 or 13.8 percent are unemployed and probably two or three times as many are underemployed. It will not become easier in the future. By 1975, this age group will have grown to approximately 700,000. Given the size of the present problem, plus the large growth of this age group, creation of sufficient meaningful jobs will require extensive programs, begun rapidly. Even if the nation is willing to embark on such programs, there is no certainty that they can be made effective soon enough. Consequently, there is no certainty that the enrichment choice would do much more in the near future to diminish violent incidents in central cities than would the present policy's choice. However, if enrichment programs can succeed in meeting the needs of residents of disadvantaged areas for jobs, education, housing, and city services, then over the years this choice is almost certain to reduce both the level and frequency of urban disorder. The Negro Middle Class One objective of the enrichment choice would be to help as many disadvantaged Americans as possible, of all races, to enter the mainstream of American prosperity, to progress toward what is often called middle class status. If the enrichment choice were adopted, it could certainly attain this objective to a far greater degree than would the present policy's choice. This could significantly change the quality of life in many central city areas. It can be argued that a rapidly enlarging Negro middle class would also promote Negro outmigration, and that the enrichment choice would thus open up an escape hatch from the ghetto. This argument, however, has two weaknesses. The first is experience. Central cities already have sizable and growing numbers of middle class Negro families yet only a few have migrated from the central city. The past pattern of white ethnic groups gradually moving out of central city areas to middle-class suburbs has not applied to Negroes. Effective open housing laws will help make this possible, but it is probable that other, more extensive changes in policies and attitudes will be required, and these would extend beyond the enrichment choice. The second weakness in the argument is time. Even if enlargement of the Negro middle class succeeded in encouraging movement out of the central city, it could not do so fast enough to offset the rapid growth of the ghetto. To offset even half the growth estimated for the ghetto by 1975, an outmigration from central cities of 217,000 persons a year would be required. This is eight times the annual increase in suburban Negro population, including natural increase, that occurred from 1960 to 1966. Even the most effective enrichment program is not likely to accomplish this. A corollary problem derives from the continuing migration of poor Negroes from the southern to northern and western cities. Adoption of the enrichment choice would require large-scale efforts to improve conditions in the South sufficiently to remove the pressure to migrate. Under present conditions, slightly over a third of the estimated increase in Negro central city population by 1985 will result from in-migration, 3.0 million out of total increase of 8.2 million. Negro Self-Development the enrichment choice is in line with some of the currents of Negro protest thought that fall under the label of black power. We do not refer to versions of black power ideology which promote violence, generate racial hatred, or advocate total separation of the races. 
Rather, we mean the view which asserts that the American Negro population can assume its proper role in society and overcome its feelings of powerlessness and lack of self-respect only by exerting power over decisions which directly affect its own members. A fully integrated society is not thought possible until the Negro minority within the ghetto has developed political strength, a strong bargaining position in dealing with the rest of society. In short, this argument would regard predominantly Negro central cities and predominantly white outlying areas not as harmful, but as an advantageous future. Proponents of these views also focus on the need for the Negro to organize economically as well as politically, thus tapping new energies and resources for self-development. One of the hardest tasks in improving disadvantaged areas is to discover how deeply deprived residents can develop their own capabilities by participating more fully in decisions and activities which affect them. Such learning-by-doing efforts are a vital part of the process of bringing deprived people into the social mainstream. Separate but equal societies? The enrichment choice by no means seeks to perpetuate racial segregation. In the end, however, its premise is that disadvantaged Negroes can achieve equality of opportunity with whites while continuing in conditions of nearly complete separation. This premise has been vigorously advocated by black power proponents. While most Negroes originally desired racial integration, many are losing hope of ever achieving it because of seemingly implacable white resistance. Yet, they cannot bring themselves to accept the conclusion that most of the millions of Negroes who are forced to live racially segregated lives must therefore be condemned to inferior lives, to inferior educations, to inferior housing, or inferior status. Rather, they reason, there must be some way to make the quality of life in the ghetto areas just as good or better than elsewhere. It is not surprising that some black power advocates are denouncing integration and claiming that, given the hypocrisy and racism that pervade white society, life in a black society is, in fact, morally superior. This argument is understandable, but there is a great deal of evidence that it is unrealistic. The economy of the United States, and particularly the sources of employment, are preponderantly white. In this circumstance, a policy of separate but equal employment could only relegate Negroes permanently to inferior incomes and economic status. The best evidence regarding education is contained in recent reports of the Office of Education and Civil Rights Commission, which suggest that both racial and economic integration are essential to educational equality for Negroes. Yet, critics point out that certainly until integration is achieved, various types of enrichment programs must be tested, and that dramatically different results may be possible from intensive educational enrichment, such as far smaller classes, or greatly expanded preschool programs, or changes in the home environment of Negro children resulting from steady jobs for fathers. Still others advocate shifting control over ghetto schools from professional administrators to local residents. This, they say, would improve curricula, give students a greater sense of their own value, and thus raise their morale and educational achievement. These approaches have not yet been tested sufficiently. One conclusion, however, does seem reasonable. Any real improvement in the quality of education in low-income, all-Negro areas will cost a great deal more money than is now being spent there, and perhaps more than is being spent per pupil anywhere. Racial and social class integration of schools may produce equal improvement in achievement at less total cost. Whether or not enrichment in ghetto areas will really work is not yet known, but the enrichment choice is based on the yet unproven premise that it will. Certainly, enrichment programs could significantly improve existing ghetto schools if they impelled major innovations. But separate but equal ghetto education cannot meet the long-run fundamental educational needs of the central city Negro population. 
the three basic educational choices are providing negro children with quality education in integrated schools providing them with quality education by enriching ghetto schools or continuing to provide many negro children with inferior education in racially segregated school systems severely limiting their lifetime opportunities consciously or not it is the third choice that the nation is now making and this choice the commission rejects totally in the field of housing it is obvious that separate but equal does not mean really equal the enrichment choice could greatly improve the quantity variety and environment of decent housing available to the ghetto population it could not provide negroes with the same freedom and range of choice as whites with equal incomes smaller cities and suburban areas together with the central city provide a far greater variety of housing and environmental settings than the central city alone programs to provide housing outside central cities however extend beyond the bounds of the enrichment choice in the end whatever its benefits the enrichment choice might well invite a prospect similar to that of the present policy's choice separate white and black societies if enrichment programs were effective they could greatly narrow the gap in income education housing jobs and other qualities of life between the ghetto and the mainstream hence the chances of harsh polarization or of disorder in the next twenty years would be greatly reduced whether they would be reduced far enough depends on the scope of the programs even if the gap were narrowed from the present it still could remain as a strong source of tension history teaches that men are not necessarily placated even by great absolute progress the controlling factor is relative progress whether they still perceive a significant gap between themselves and others whom they regard as no more deserving widespread perception of such a gap and consequent resentment might well be precisely the situation twenty years from now under the enrichment choice for it is essentially another way of choosing a permanently dividing country the integration choice the third and last course open to the nation combines enrichment with programs designed to encourage integration of substantial numbers of negroes into the society outside the ghetto enrichment must be an important adjunct to any integration course no matter how ambitious or energetic such a program may be relatively few negroes now living in central city ghettos would be quickly integrated in the meantime significant improvement in their present environment is essential the enrichment aspect of this third choice should however be recognized as interim action during which time expanded and new programs can work to improve education and earning power the length of the interim period surely would vary for some it may be long but in any event what should be clearly recognized is that enrichment is only a means toward the goal it is not the goal the goal must be achieving freedom for every citizen to live and work according to his capacities and desires not his color we believe there are four important reasons why american society must give this course the most serious consideration first future jobs are being created primarily in the suburbs while the chronically unemployed population is increasingly concentrated in the ghetto this separation will make it more and more difficult for negroes to achieve anything like full employment in decent jobs but if over time these residents began to find housing outside central cities they would be exposed to more knowledge of job opportunities would have much shorter trips to reach jobs and would have a far better chance of securing employment on a self-sustaining basis second in the judgment of this commission racial and social class integration is the most effective way of improving the education of ghetto children third developing an adequate housing supply for low-income and middle-income families and true freedom of choice in housing for negroes of all income levels will require substantial outmovement 
we do not believe that such an outmovement will occur spontaneously merely as a result of increasing prosperity among negroes in central cities a national fair housing law is essential to begin such movement in many suburban areas a program combining positive incentives with the building of new housing will be necessary to carry it out fourth and by far the most important integration is the only course which explicitly seeks to achieve a single nation rather than accepting the present movement toward a dual society this choice would enable us at least to begin reversing the profoundly divisive trend already so evident in our metropolitan areas before it becomes irreversible conclusions the future of our cities is neither something which will just happen nor something which will be imposed upon us by an inevitable destiny that future will be shaped to an important degree by choices we make now we have attempted to set forth the major choices because we believe it is vital for americans to understand the consequences of our present drift three critical conclusions emerge from this analysis one the nation is rapidly moving toward two increasingly separate americas within two decades this division could be so deep that it would be almost impossible to unite a white society principally located in suburbs in smaller central cities and in the peripheral parts of large central cities and a negro society largely concentrated within large central cities the negro society will be permanently relegated to its current status possibly even if we expend great amounts of money and effort in trying to gild the ghetto two in the long run continuation and expansion of such a permanent division threatens us with two perils the first is the danger of sustained violence in our cities the timing scale nature and repercussions of such violence cannot be foreseen but if it occurred it would further destroy our ability to achieve the basic american promises of liberty justice and equality the second is the danger of a conclusive repudiation of the traditional american ideals of individual dignity freedom and equality of opportunity we will not be able to espouse these ideals meaningfully to the rest of the world to ourselves to our children they may still recite the pledge of allegiance and say one nation indivisible but they will be learning cynicism not patriotism three we cannot escape responsibility for choosing the future of our metropolitan areas and the human relations which develop within them it is a responsibility so critical that even an unconscious choice to continue present policies has the gravest implications that we have delayed in choosing or by delaying may be making the wrong choice does not sentence us either to separatism or despair but we must choose we will choose indeed we are now choosing end of section 49section 50 of the kerner commission report this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by mark goodger adelaide south australia Report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, Kerner Commission Report. Recommendations for National Action, Part 1. The Commission has already addressed itself to the need for immediate action at the local level. Because the city is the focus of racial disorder, the immediate responsibility rests on community leaders and local institutions. Without responsive and representative local government, Without effective processes of interracial communication within the city and without alert, well-trained and adequately supported local police, national action, no matter how great its scale, cannot be expected to provide a solution. Yet the disorders are not simply a problem of the racial ghetto or the city. As we have seen, they are symptoms of social ills that have become endemic in our society and now affect every American, black or white, businessman or factory worker, suburban commuter or slum dweller. 
None of us can escape the consequences of the continuing economic and social decay of the central city and the closely related problem of rural poverty. The convergence of these conditions in the racial ghetto and the resulting discontent and disruption threaten democratic values fundamental to our progress as a free society. The essential fact is that neither existing conditions nor the garrison state offers acceptable alternatives for the future of this country. Only a greatly enlarged commitment to national action, compassionate, massive and sustained, backed by the will and resources of the most powerful and the richest nation on this earth, can shape a future that is compatible with the historic ideals of American society. It is this conviction that leads us, as a Commission on Civil Disorders, to comment on the shape and dimension of the action that must be taken at the national level. In this effort, we have taken account of the work of scholars and experts on race relations, the urban condition and poverty. We have studied the reports and work of all commissions of congressional committees and of many special task forces and groups both within the government and within the private sector. Financing the cost. The Commission has also examined the question of financing. Although there are grave difficulties, we do not regard them as insoluble. The nation has substantial financial resources. Not enough to do everything, some might wish, but enough to make an important start on reducing our critical social deficit, in spite of a war and in spite of current budget requirements. The key factors having a bearing on our ability to pay for the cost are the great productivity of the American economy and a federal revenue system which is highly responsive to economic growth. In combination, these produce truly astounding automatic increases in federal budget receipts provided only that the national economy is kept functioning at capacity so that actual national income expands in line with potential. These automatic increases, the fiscal dividend, from the federal revenue system range from $11 billion to $14 billion under conditions of steady economic growth. The tax surcharge requested by the President, including continuation of excise taxes, would add about $16 billion to the fiscal dividend of about $28.5 billion over a two-year period. While competing demands are certain to grow with every increase in federal revenues so that hard choices are inevitable, these figures demonstrate the dimension of resources, apart from changes in tax rates, which this country can generate. Federal Program Coordination The spectacle of Detroit and New Haven engulfed in civil turmoil despite a multitude of federally aided programs raised basic questions as to whether the existing delivery system is adequate to the bold new purposes of national policy. Many who voiced these concerns overlooked the disparity between the size of the problems at which the programs are aimed and the level of funding provided by the federal government. Yet there is little doubt that the system through which federal programs are translated into services to people is a major problem in itself. There are now over 400 grant programs operated by a broad range of federal agencies and channeled through a much larger array of semi-autonomous state and local government entities. Reflective of this complex scheme, federal programs often seem self-defeating and contradictory. Field officials unable to make decisions on their own programs and unaware of related efforts. Agencies unable or unwilling to work together. Programs conceived and administered to achieve different and sometimes conflicting purposes. The new social development legislation has put great strain upon obsolescent machinery and administrative practices at all levels of government. It has loaded new work on federal departments. It has required a level of skill, a sense of urgency and a capacity for judgment never planned for or encouraged in departmental field offices. It has required planning and administrative capacity rarely seen in state houses, county courthouses and city halls. Deficiencies in all of these areas have frustrated accomplishment of many of the important goals set by the President and the Congress. In recent years, serious efforts have been made to improve program coordination. During the 1961-65 period, almost 20 executive orders were issued for the coordination of federal programs involving intergovernmental administration. Some two dozen interagency committees have been established to coordinate two or more federal aid programs. 
departments have been given responsibility to lead others in areas within their particular competence. OEO in the poverty field, HUD in model cities. Yet, despite these and other efforts, the Federal Government has not yet been able to join talent, funds and programs for concentrated impact in the field. Few agencies are able to put together a comprehensive package of related programs to meet priority needs. There is a clear and compelling requirement for better coordination of federally funded programs, particularly those designed to benefit the residents of the inner city. If essential programs are to be preserved and expanded, this need must be met. The Commission's Recommendations We do not claim competence to chart the details of programs within such complex and interrelated fields as employment, welfare, education and housing. We do believe it is essential to set forth goals and to recommend strategies to reach these goals. That is the aim of the pages that follow. They contain our sense of the critical priorities. We discuss and recommend programs not to commit each of us to specific parts of such programs, but to illustrate the type and dimension of action needed. Much has been accomplished in recent years to formulate new directions for national policy and new channels for national energy. Resources devoted to social programs have been greatly increased in many areas. Hence, few of our program suggestions are entirely novel. In some form, many are already in effect. All this serves to underscore our basic conclusion. The need is not so much for the government to design new programs as it is for the nation to generate new will. Private enterprise, labour unions, the churches, the foundations, the universities – all our urban institutions must deepen their involvement in the life of the city and their commitment to its revival and welfare. Objectives for National Action Just as Lincoln, a century ago, put preservation of the Union above all else, so should we put creation of a true Union, a single society and a single American identity as our major goal. Toward that goal, we propose the following objectives for National Action. Opening up all opportunities to those who are restricted by racial segregation and discrimination and eliminating all barriers to their choice of jobs, education and housing. Removing the frustration of powerlessness among the disadvantaged by providing the means to deal with the problems that affect their own lives and by increasing the capacity of our public and private institutions to respond to those problems. Increasing communication across racial lines to destroy stereotypes, halt polarisation, end distrust and hostility, and create common ground for efforts toward common goals of public order and social justice. There are those who oppose these aims as rewarding the rioters. They are wrong. A great nation is not so easily intimidated. We propose these aims to fulfil our pledge of equality and to meet the fundamental needs of a democratic, and civilised society, domestic peace, social justice and urban centres that are citadels of the human spirit. There are others who say that violence is necessary, that fear alone can prod the nation to act decisively on behalf of racial minorities. They too are wrong. Violence and disorder compound injustice. They must be ended and they will be ended. Our strategy is neither blind repression nor capitulation to lawlessness. Rather, it is the affirmation of common possibilities for all within a single society. 1. Employment Introduction Unemployment and underemployment are among the most persistent and serious grievances of our disadvantaged minorities. The pervasive effect of these conditions on the racial ghetto is inextricably linked to the problem of civil disorder. In the Employment Act of 1946, the United States set for itself a national goal of a useful job at a reasonable wage for all who wish to work. Federal expenditure for manpower development and training have increased from less than $60 million in 1963 to $1.6 billion in 1968. The President has proposed a further increase to $2.1 billion in 1969 to provide work experience, training, and supportive services for 1.3 million men and women. Despite these efforts, and despite sustained general economic prosperity and growing skill demands of automated industry, 
the goal of full employment has become increasingly hard to attain. Today there are about 2 million unemployed and about 10 million underemployed, 6.5 million of whom work full-time and earn less than the annual poverty wage. The most compelling and difficult challenge is presented by some 500,000 hardcore unemployed who live within the central cities, lack a basic education, work not at all or only from time to time, and are unable to cope with the problems of holding and performing a job. A substantial part of this group is Negro, male, and between the ages of approximately 18 and 25. Members of this group are often among the initial participants in civil disorders. A slum employment study by the Department of Labor in 1966 showed that as compared with an unemployment rate for all persons in the United States of 3.8%, the unemployment rate among 16 to 19 year old non-white males was 26.5% and among 16 to 24-year-old non-white males, 15.9%. Data collected by the Commission in cities where there were racial disorders in 1967 indicate that Negro males between the ages of 15 and 25 predominated among the rioters. More than 20% of the rioters were unemployed, and many of those who were employed worked in intermittent, low-status, unskilled jobs, jobs which they regarded as below their level of education and ability. In the riot cities that we surveyed, Negroes were three times as likely as whites to hold unskilled jobs, which are often part-time or seasonal, and dead-end. A fact that's as significant for Negroes as unemployment. Goals and objectives. We propose a comprehensive national manpower policy to meet the needs of both the unemployed and the underemployed. That policy will require continued emphasis on national economic growth and job creation so that there will be jobs available for those who are newly trained without displacing those already employed. Unified and intensive recruiting to reach those who need help with information about available job, training and supportive aids. Careful evaluation of the individual's vocational skills, potentials and needs. Referral to one or more programs of basic education job training and needed medical, social and other services, provision for transportation between the ghetto and outlying employment areas and continued follow-up on the individual's progress until he no longer needs help. Concentrated job training efforts with major emphasis on on-the-job training by both public and private employers as well as public and private vocational schools and other institutional facilities. Opening up existing public and private job structures to provide greater upward mobility for the underemployed without displacing anyone already employed at more advanced levels. Large-scale development of new jobs in the public and private sectors to absorb as many as possible of the unemployed, again without displacement of the employed. Stimulation of public and private investment in depressed areas, both urban and rural, to improve the environment, to alleviate unemployment and underemployment and, in rural areas, to provide for the poor alternatives other than migration to large urban centres. New kinds of assistance for those who will continue to be attracted to the urban centres, both before and after they arrive. Increasing small business and other entrepreneurial opportunities in poverty areas, both urban and rural. Basic strategies. To achieve these objectives, we believe the following basic strategies should be adopted. Existing programs aimed at recruiting, training and job development should be consolidated according to the function they serve at local, state and federal levels to avoid fragmentation and duplication. We need a comprehensive and focused administration of a unified group of manpower programs. High priority should be placed on the creation of new jobs in both the public and private sectors. In the public sector, a substantial number of such jobs can be provided quickly, particularly by government at the local level, where there are vast unmet needs in education, health, recreation, public safety, sanitation and other municipal services. The National Commission on Technology, Automation and Economic Progress estimated that there are 5.3 million potential jobs in public service, but the more difficult task is to provide jobs in private industry for the hardcore unemployed. Both strategies must be pursued simultaneously, with some arrangements for a flow of trainees from public sector jobs to on-the-job training in private companies. 
creation of jobs for the hardcore unemployed will require substantial payments to both public and private employers to offset the extra costs of supportive services and training. Basic education and counselling in dress, appearance, social relationships, money management, transportation, hygiene, health, punctuality and good work habits, all of which employers normally take for granted, may have to be provided. Productivity may be low for substantial periods. Special emphasis must be given to motivating the hardcore unemployed. A sure method for motivating the hardcore unemployed has not yet been devised. One fact, however, is already clear from the experience of the Job Corps, Neighbourhood Youth Corps and Manpower Development and Training Projects. The previously hardcore unemployed trainee or employee must understand that he is not being offered or trained for a dead-end job. Since, by definition, he is not eligible even for an entry-level position, he must be given job training. He must be convinced that if he performs satisfactorily after the training period, he will be employed and given an opportunity to advance, if possible, on a clearly defined job ladder with step increases in both pay and responsibility. Artificial barriers to employment and promotion must be removed by both public agencies and private employers. Racial discrimination and unrealistic and unnecessary high minimum qualifications for employment or promotion often have the same prejudicial effect. Government and business must consider for each type of job whether a criminal record should be a bar and whether a high school diploma is an inflexible prerequisite. During World War II, industry successfully employed large numbers of the previously unemployed and disadvantaged by lowering standards and by restructuring work patterns so that the job fit the level of available skills. We believe that too often government, business and labour unions fail to take into account innate intelligence and aptitudes which are not measurable. Present recruitment procedures should be re-examined. Testing procedures should be revalidated or replaced by work, sample or actual job tryouts. Applicants who are rejected for immediate training or employment should be evaluated and counselled by company personnel officers and referred to either company or public remedial programs. These procedures have already been initiated in the steel and telephone industries. Special training is needed for supervisory personnel. Support needed by the hardcore unemployed during initial job experience must be provided by specially trained supervisors. A new program of training entry-level supervisors should be established by management with government assistance if necessary. End of section 50. Section 51 of the Kerner Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the National Advisory Committee on Civil Disorders Kerner Commission Report Chapter 17 Recommendations for National Action Part 2 Suggested Programs We are proposing programs in six areas in order to illustrate how we believe the basic strategies we have outlined can be put into effect. Consolidating and concentrating employment efforts Opening the existing job structure creating 1 million new jobs in the public sector in three years, creating 1 million new jobs in the private sector in three years, developing urban and rural poverty areas, encouraging business ownership in the ghetto, consolidating and concentrating employment efforts, recruitment. There is an urgent need for a comprehensive manpower recruitment and services agency at the community level. The federal state employment service is not serving this function in many urban areas and cannot do so unless it is substantially restructured and revitalized. This was recommended in 1965 by the Employment Service Task Force, but has been only partially achieved by the Employment Service's new Human Resources Development Program. We believe that every city should establish such a comprehensive agency with authority to direct the coordination of all manpower programs, including those of the Employment Service, the Community Action Agencies, and other local groups. The concentrated employment program established by the Department of Labor last year and now operating in the ghettos of 20 cities and in two rural areas is an important beginning toward a unified effort at the local level. 
a related effort by the Department of Housing and Urban Development is underway in the Model Cities program, now in the planning stage in some 63 cities. Placement. In order to match men to jobs, we need more effective interchange of information. A computerized nationwide service should be established, as recommended in 1966 by the National Commission on Technology, Automation, and Economic Progress, with priority of installation given to the large urban centers. An information system of this sort would simplify placement, including inter-area placement and placement from ghetto to suburb. This in turn will often require transportation assistance and counseling. The existing experimental mobility program, under the Manpower Development and Training Act, should be greatly expanded and should support movement from one part of a metropolitan area to another. Aid to local public transportation under the Mass Transportation Program should be similarly expanded on the basis of an existing experiment with subsidies for route service in ghetto areas. Job development and placement in private industry is critical to our proposed strategies and is now handled separately by a wide variety of agencies and programs, the Manpower Development and Training Act programs, the Vocational Education programs, the Vocational Rehabilitation program, the Job Corps, and recently the Neighborhood Youth Corps and several new adult work experience and training programs. All seek to place trainees with private employers, sometimes with and sometimes without training assistance, through a wide variety of local agencies, as well as through the employment service, community action agencies, and others. A single cooperative national effort should be undertaken with the assistance of business, labor, and industrial leaders at national, regional, and local levels. It should reach both individual companies and trade associations, systematically and extensively with information about incentive programs and aids, and with authority to negotiate contractual arrangements and channel incentive funds to private employers. The recently created Urban Coalition, with its local affiliates, brought together many of the interested parties in the private sector. The National Alliance of Businessmen, just established by the President, will be concentrating private industry efforts in on-the-job training of the hardcore unemployed. We believe that it may be helpful now to create a federally chartered corporation with authority to undertake the coordination of the private sector job program outlined below. Opening the existing job structure. Arbitrary barriers to employment and promotion must be eliminated. Federal, state, and local efforts to ensure equal opportunity in employment should be strengthened by a. Including federal, state, and local governmental agencies as employers covered by Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the Federal Anti-Discrimination in Employment Law, which now covers other employers of 50 or more employees, and as of July 1968, will cover employers of 25 or more employees, labor unions, and employment agencies. B. Granting to the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, the Federal Enforcement Agency under Title VII, cease and desist power comparable to the enforcement power now held by other federal agencies administering regulatory national policies. C. Increasing technical and other assistance now provided through the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to state and local anti-discrimination commissions under the provisions of Title VII. D. Undertaking through the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, an industry and area-wide enforcement effort based not only upon individual complaints, but upon employer and union reports showing broad patterns of discrimination in employment and promotion. E. Linking enforcement efforts with training and other aids to employers and unions, so that affirmative action to hire and promote may be encouraged in connection with investigation of both individual complaints and charges of broad patterns of discrimination. F. Substantially increasing the staff and other resources of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to enable it to perform effectively these additional functions. Equal opportunity for employment by federal contractors under Executive Order 11246 should be enforced more vigorously against both employers and unions. This is particularly critical in regard to federal construction contracts. Staff and other resources of the Office of Contract Compliance in the Department of Labor should be increased so that withholding federal contracts is made a meaningful sanction. The efforts of the Department of Labor to obtain commitments from unions to encourage Negro membership in apprenticeship programs are especially noteworthy and should be intensified. Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, 
which provides for withholding federal grant and aid funds from activities which discriminate on grounds of color or race, should be supported fully, particularly in regard to recruitment for federally assisted job training in hospitals, universities, colleges, and schools. The staff and other resources of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, which has primary jurisdiction over these functions, should be expanded for this purpose. The federal government, through the Civil Service Commission and other agencies, should undertake programs of recruitment, hiring, and on-the-job training of the disadvantaged and should re-examine and revalidate its minimum employment and promotion standards. In this regard, the federal government should become a model for state and local government and the private business community. To enlist the full cooperation of federal agencies, they should be reimbursed by internal allowances for the extra costs of training disadvantaged employees. One way to improve the condition of the underemployed on a national basis would be to increase the federal minimum wage and widen its coverage. The recent increase to $1.60 per hour yields an annual wage only slightly above the poverty level and only for those employed full-time. As an alternative, we recommend consideration be given to an experimental program of wage supplements or other methods for achieving the same income goals. Creating 1 million new jobs in the public sector in three years. Existing public employment programs should be consolidated and substantially increased. The Neighborhood Youth Corps last year involved approximately 300,000 youths between the ages of 14 and 22 in three programs of work experience. New York City offers either full-time positions, year-round or during the summer, or part-time positions during the school year. Several similar but considerably smaller public employment programs involve chronically unemployed adults, generally in sub-professional community betterment work operational mainstream in small towns and rural areas, new careers and special impact in urban areas, and work experience and training for welfare recipients under the 1967 amendments to Title IV of the Social Security Act. Emphasis in the expanded public employment programs should be shifted, so far as possible, from work experience to on-the-job training, and additional federal assistance above the present payment of 90% of wages should be provided to pay for the additional costs of training and supportive services to trainees. Federal assistance should be scaled so it does not terminate abruptly. The public employer should pay a progressively larger share of the total cost as trainees' productivity increases. Emphasis should also be placed on employing trainees to improve rundown neighborhoods and to perform a variety of other socially useful public services, which are not make work, including community service officers in police departments, as recommended by the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice, and as discussed above in Chapter 11. Public employers should be required to pay on-the-job trainees not less than the minimum wage or the prevailing wage in the area for similar work, whichever is higher. We recommend a three-year program aimed at creating 250,000 new public service jobs in the first year and a total of one million such jobs over the three-year period. The Department of Defense should a. continue its emphasis on, and consider expansion of, Project 100,000, under which it accepts young men with below standard test scores, b. intensify its recruiting efforts in areas of high unemployment so that young men living there are fully aware of the training and service opportunities open to them, and c. substantially expand Project Transition, which began on a pilot basis in 1967 and involves training and counseling for servicemen scheduled to return to civilian life. Creating 1 million new jobs in the private sector in three years. 84% of the nation's 73 million civilian workers are at work in 11.5 million private enterprises. The involvement of only 5% of all private companies would represent the use of more than 500,000 enterprises and provide a massive additional spur to job development. Based on experience with training by private employers, primarily under the Manpower Development and Training Act, our recommendations are aimed at inducing a substantially expanded number of companies to hire and train the hardcore unemployed. Recruitment and referral of the disadvantaged unemployed should be undertaken by a public body such as the Manpower Service Agency we have already described. The Manpower Service Agency would determine eligibility and certify a chronically unemployed person for on-the-job training by issuing to him a certificate of eligibility, or similar identifying document. This would entitle the private employer to reimbursement for certain costs. A similar technique was used under the GI Bill for training veterans of World War II and the Korean conflict. 
the direct reimbursement system currently used in on-the-job training programs should be expanded, and the existing programs should be consolidated under a single administration. These programs include the Manpower Development and Training Act and the new Work Training and Industry components of the Neighborhood Youth Corps, New Careers, and Special Impact programs. Under these programs, a federal agency contracts to reimburse each employer for a negotiated average cost of training and supportive services for each trainee. If a corporation is chartered by Congress to serve as the government's primary instrument for job development in the private sector, the corporation, through regional and local subsidiaries, would a. Systematically work with trade groups, companies, and labor unions. b. Arrange for any necessary supportive services and pre-vocational educational training which employers are unable to provide, and c. Enter into contracts with employers providing for their reimbursement for the extra costs of training. The employer would, of course, undertake not to dismiss existing employees in order to hire trainees, to provide job training along with supportive services, and to give reasonable assurance that the employee would be fairly promoted if he successfully completed his training period. To serve as an incentive to widespread business involvement, the average amount of the reimbursement must exceed substantially the approximate $1,000 per year payment now made under federal on-the-job training programs, and, for the hardcore unemployed, should at least equal the $3,500 recommended by the President in his manpower message of January 23, 1968. An additional and potentially lower-cost method of stimulating on-the-job training and new job creation for the hardcore unemployed is through a tax credit system, provided that guidelines are adopted to ensure adequate training and job retention. The Commission believes this alternative holds promise. With respect to the tax credit device, we note that since its enactment in 1962, the existing 7% incentive credit for investment in new equipment and machinery has been highly successful as a technique for reaching a large number of individual enterprises to effectuate a national policy. During the 1962-65 to 65 period, the credit was taken on 1,239,000 corporate tax returns, representing new investment in the amount of approximately $75 million. To assure comparable simplicity in administration, the tax credit should be geared to a fixed amount for each certified employee hired and retained at least for a six-month period, with decreasing credits for retention for additional periods totaling another 18 months. No credit will be allowed if existing employees are displaced, or if the turnover rate among certified employees during each period exceeds more than twice the employer's usual turnover rate. The corporation chartered by Congress would establish performance guidelines, compare and evaluate the results of job training programs by contract and under the tax credit, and arrange to share with all participating employers the experiences of other companies with techniques for training the hardcore unemployed and holding them on the job. The Commission recommends a three-year program aimed at creating 300,000 new private sector jobs in the first year and a total of 1 million such jobs over the three-year period, provided that the tax credit is enacted at an early date. If the tax credit is not so enacted, a realistic goal would be 150,000 such jobs in the first year and 1 million jobs over a 3-5 to five year period. Developing Urban and Rural Poverty Areas A tax credit should also be provided for the location and renovation of plants and other business facilities in urban and rural poverty areas, as already defined jointly by several federal departments and agencies. The existing incentive tax credit for investment in new equipment, but not for real property or plant, is available without regard to where the investment is made. For investment in poverty areas, the existing credit should be increased substantially and extended to investments in real property and plant, whether for the construction of a new plant or the acquisition of an existing facility. Plant and equipment in these areas should also be eligible for rapid amortization within as little as five years. These incentives would be designed to attract to the poverty areas the kind of industrial and commercial development which would create new jobs and provide other economic benefits for the disadvantaged community surrounding the enterprise. An employer eligible for the Poverty Area Investment Credit would also be eligible, if he employed certified trainees, for the Hardcore Employment Credit. The two credits are designed to meet separate needs and different costs to investors and employers. To begin an intensified national effort to improve rural economic conditions and to stem the flow of migration from these areas to large urban centers, the new investment credit should also be available for firms investing or expanding in rural poverty areas. The authority and the resources of the Economic Development Administration 
should be enlarged to enable it to expand its operations into urban poverty areas on a substantial scale. Encouraging Business Ownership in the Ghettos We believe it is important to give special encouragement to Negro ownership of business in ghetto areas. The disadvantaged need help in obtaining managerial experience and in creating for themselves a stake in the economic community. The advantages of Negro entrepreneurship also include self-employment and jobs for others. Existing Small Business Administration Equity and Operating Loan Programs, under which almost 3,500 loans were made during fiscal year 1967, should be substantially expanded in amount, extended to higher risk ventures, and promoted widely through offices in the ghetto. Loans under Small Business Administration guarantees, which are now authorized, should be actively encouraged among local lending institutions. Counseling and managerial assistance should also be provided. The new Department of Commerce program under which Negro small businessmen are assisted in creating associations for pooling purchasing power and sharing experience should be expanded and consolidated with the Small Business Administration Loan Program. The Interracial Council for Business Opportunity and other private efforts to provide counseling by successful businessmen outside the ghetto should be supported and enlarged. End of Section 51 Recording by Todd Section 52 of the Kerner Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, Kerner Commission Report. Chapter 17, Recommendations for National Action, Part 3. 2. Education. Introduction. Education in our democratic society must equip the children of the nation to develop their potential and to participate fully in American life. For the community at large, the schools have discharged this responsibility well. But for many minorities, and particularly for the children of the racial ghetto, the schools have failed to provide the educational experience which could help overcome the effects of discrimination and deprivation. This failure is one of the persistent sources of grievance and resentment within the Negro community. The hostility of Negro parents and students toward the school system is generating increasing conflict and causing disruption within many city school districts. But the most dramatic evidence of the relationship between educational practices and civil disorder lies in the high incidence of riot participation by ghetto youth who have not completed high school. Our survey of riot cities found that the typical riot participant was a high school dropout. As Superintendent Briggs of Cleveland testified before the commission, Many of those whose recent acts threaten the domestic safety and tear at the roots of the American democracy are the products of yesterday's inadequate and neglected inner-city schools. The greatest unused and underdeveloped human resources in America are to be found in the deteriorating cores of America's urban centers. The bleak record of public education for ghetto children is growing worse. In the critical skills, verbal and reading ability, Negro students fall further behind whites with each year of school completed. For example, in the metropolitan Northeast, Negro students on the average begin the first grade with somewhat lower scores than whites on standard achievement tests, are about 1.6 grades behind by sixth grade, and have fallen 3.3 grades behind white students by twelfth grade. The failure of the public schools to equip these students with basic verbal skills is reflected in their performance on the Selective Service Mental Test. During the period June 1964 to December 1965, 67% of Negro candidates failed the examination. The failure rate for whites was 19%. The result is that many more Negro than white students drop out of school. In the metropolitan North and West, Negro students are more than three times as likely as white students to drop out of school by ages 16 to 17. 
as reflected by the high unemployment rate for graduates of ghetto schools and the even higher proportion of employed workers who are in low-skilled, low-paid jobs, many of those who do graduate are not equipped to enter the normal job market and have great difficulty securing employment. Several factors have converged to produce this critical situation. Segregation The vast majority of inner-city schools are rigidly segregated. In 75 major central cities surveyed by the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights in its study Racial Isolation in the Public Schools, 75% of all Negro students in elementary grades attended schools with enrollments that were 90% or more Negro. Almost 90% of all Negro students attend schools which had a majority of Negro students. In the same cities, 83% of all white students in those grades attended schools with 90 to 100% white enrollments. Racial isolation in the urban public schools is the result principally of residential segregation and widespread employment of the neighborhood school policy, which transfers segregation from housing to education. The effect of these conditions is magnified by the fact that a much greater proportion of white than Negro students attend private schools. Studies indicate that in America's 20 largest cities, approximately 4 out of 10 white students are enrolled in non-public schools, as compared with only 1 out of 10 Negro pupils. The differential appears to be increasing. Urban schools are becoming more segregated, in a sample of 15 large northern cities, the Civil Rights Commission found that the degree of segregation rose sharply from 1950 to 1965. As Negro enrollments in these 15 cities grew, 97% of the increase was absorbed by schools already over 50% Negro and 84% by schools more than 90% Negro, by 1975, it is estimated that if current policies and trends persist, 80% of all Negro pupils in the 20 largest cities, comprising nearly one-half of the nation's Negro population, will be attending 90-100% to 100 Negro schools. Segregation has operated to reduce the quality of education provided in schools serving disadvantaged Negro neighborhoods. Most of the residents of these areas are poor. Many of the adults, the products of inadequate rural school systems in the South, have low levels of educational attainment. Their children have smaller vocabularies and are not as well equipped to learn rapidly in school, particularly with respect to basic literary skills, as children from more advantaged homes. When disadvantaged children are racially isolated in the schools, they are deprived of one of the more significant ingredients of quality education, exposure to other children with stronger educational backgrounds. The Coleman Report and the Report of the Civil Rights Commission establish that the predominant socioeconomic background of the students in a school exerts a powerful impact upon achievement. Further, the Coleman Report found that if a minority pupil from a home without much educational strength is put with schoolmates with strong educational backgrounds, his achievement is likely to increase. Another strong influence on achievement derives from the tendency of school administrators, teachers, parents, and the students themselves to regard ghetto schools as inferior Reflecting this attitude, students attending such schools lose confidence in their ability to shape their future. The Coleman Report found this factor, destiny control, to have a stronger relationship to achievement than all the school factors together, and to be related for Negroes to the proportion of whites in the schools. In other words, both class and race factors have a strong bearing on educational achievement, the ghetto student labors under a double burden. Teachers The schools attended by disadvantaged Negro children commonly are staffed by teachers with less experience and lower qualifications than the schools attended by middle-class whites. 
For example, a 1963 study ranking Chicago's public high schools by the socioeconomic status of surrounding neighborhoods found that in the 10 lowest-ranking schools, only 63.2% of all teachers were fully certified, and the median level of teaching experience was 3.9 years. In three of these schools, the median level was one year. Four of the lowest-ranking schools were 100% Negro in enrollment, and three were over 90% Negro. By contrast, eight of the ten highest-ranking schools had nearly total white enrollments, and the other two were more than 75% white. In these schools, 90.3% of the teachers were fully certified, and the median level of teaching experience was 12.3 years. Testifying before the Commission, Dr. Daniel Dodson, director of the New York University Center for Human Relations and Community Services, stated that inner-city schools have not been able to hold teaching staff. Between 1952 and 1962, almost half of the licensed teachers of New York City left the system. Almost two out of every five of the 50,000 teaching personnel of New York City do not hold regular permanent licenses for the assignments they have. In another school system in one of the large cities, it was reported of one inner-city school that of 84 staff members, 41 were temporary teachers, 25 were probationaries, and only 18 were tenure teachers. However, only one of the tenure teachers was licensed in academic subjects. U.S. Commissioner of Education Harold Howe testified that many teachers are unprepared for teaching in schools serving disadvantaged children. They have what is a traumatic experience there and don't last. Moreover, the more experienced teachers normally select schools in white neighborhoods, thereby relegating the least experienced teachers to the disadvantaged schools. This process reinforces the view of ghetto schools as inferior. As a result, teachers assigned to these schools often begin with negative attitudes toward the students and their ability and willingness to learn. These attitudes are aggravated by serious discipline problems, by the high crime rates in the areas surrounding the schools, and by the greater difficulties of teaching students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Reflecting these conditions, the Coleman Report found that a higher proportion of teachers in schools serving disadvantaged areas are dissatisfied with their present assignments and with their students than are their counterparts in other schools. Studies have shown that the attitudes of teachers toward their students have a very powerful impact upon educational attainment. The more teachers expect from their students, however disadvantaged those students may be, the better the students perform. Conversely, negative teacher attitudes act as self-fulfilling prophecies. The teachers expect little from their students, the students fulfill the expectation. As Dr. Kenneth Clark observed, children who are treated as if they are uneducable invariably become uneducable. In disadvantaged areas, the neighborhood school concept tends to concentrate a relatively high proportion of emotionally disturbed and other problem children in the schools. Disadvantaged neighborhoods have the greatest need for health personnel, supplementary instructors, and counselors to assist with family problems, provide extra instruction to lagging students, and deal with the many serious mental and physical health deficiencies that occur so often in poverty areas. These conditions, which make effective teaching more difficult, reinforce negative teacher attitudes. A 1963 survey of Chicago public schools showed that the condition creating the highest amount of dissatisfaction among teachers was lack of adequate provision for the treatment of maladjusted, retarded, and disturbed pupils. About 79% of elementary school teachers and 67% of high school teachers named this item as a key factor. The need for professional support for teachers in dealing with these extraordinary problems is seldom, if ever, met. Although special schools or classes are available for emotionally disturbed and mentally handicapped children, 
many pupils requiring such help remain in regular classes because of negligence, red tape, and unavailability of clinical staff. An example is provided by a National Education Association study of Detroit. Before a disturbed child can receive psychological assistance, he must receive diagnostic testing. But before this happens, the teacher must fill in a form to be submitted to a central office committee. If the committee decides that psychological testing is in order, the teacher must fill out a second form to be submitted to the psychological clinic. The child may then be placed on the waiting list for psychological testing. The waiting period may last for several weeks, several months, or several years, and while he waits, he sits in the regular classroom. Since visiting teachers are scarce and special classes are insufficient in number, the child who has been tested is usually returned to the regular classroom to serve more time as a sit-in. Teaching in disadvantaged areas is made more difficult by the high rate of student turnover, in New York City during 1963-64, seven of every ten students in the average segregated Negro Puerto Rican elementary school either entered or left during the year. Similar conditions are common to other inner-city schools. Continuity of education thus becomes exceedingly difficult, the more so because many of the students entering ghetto schools during the school year come from rural southern schools, and are behind even the minimum levels of achievement attained by their fellow northern-born students. End of section 52. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 53 of the Kerner Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, Kerner Commission Report. Chapter 17, Recommendations for National Action, Part 4. Enrollments. In virtually every large American city, the inner-city schools attended by Negroes are the most overcrowded, we have cited the vast population exchange, relatively affluent whites leaving the city to be replaced by Negroes, which has taken place over the last decade. The impact on public education facilities has been severe. Despite an overall decrease in the population of many cities, school enrollment has increased. Over the last 12 years, Detroit has lost approximately 20,000 to 30,000 families, Yet during that same period, the public school system gained approximately 50,000 to 60,000 children. Between 1961 and 1965, Detroit's Negro public school enrollment increased 31,108, while white enrollment dropped 23,748. In Cleveland, between 1950 and 1965, a population loss of 130,000 coincided with a school enrollment increase of 50,000 students. Enrollment gains in New York City and Chicago were even larger. Although of lesser magnitude, similar changes have occurred in the public school systems of many other large cities. As white students withdraw from a public school, they are replaced by greater numbers of Negro students, reflecting the fact that the Negro population is relatively younger and has more children of school age, also makes less use of private schools, and is more densely concentrated than the white population. As a result, Negro school enrollments have increased even more rapidly than the total Negro central city population. In Cincinnati, for example, between 1960 and 1965, the Negro population grew 16%, while Negro public school enrollment increased 26 percent. The following data for four other cities illustrate how the proportion of Negroes in public schools has outgrown the Negro proportion of the total city population. Negro population and public school enrollment. Atlanta. 
Negro percent of population, 1950, 36.6%, 1965, 43.5%, up 6.9%. Negro percent of public school enrollment, 1950, 39.1%, 1965, 53.7%, up 14.6%. Milwaukee, Negro percent of population, 1950, 3.5%, 1965, 10.8%, up 7.3%. Negro percent of public school enrollment, 1950, 6.6%, 6 1965, 22.9%, up 16.3%. Oakland, Negro percent of population, 1950, 12.4%, 1965, 30%, up 17.6%. Negro percent of public school enrollment, 1950, 14.0%, 1965, 45%, up 31%. Washington, Negro percent of population, 1950, 35%, 1965, 55%, up 20%. Negro percent of public school enrollment, 1950, 50.1%, 1965, 89.4%, up 39.3%. Negroes now comprise a majority or near majority of public school students in seven of the ten largest American cities, as well as in many other cities. The following table illustrates the percentage of Negro students for the period 1965-1966 in the public elementary schools of 42 cities, including the 28 largest, 17 of which have Negro majorities. Proportion of Negro students in total public elementary school enrollment, 1965-66. Washington, D.C., 90.9% Negro. Chester, Pennsylvania, 69.3%. Wilmington, Delaware, 69.3%. Newark, 69.1%. New Orleans, 65.5%. Richmond, 64.7%, Baltimore, 64.3%, East St. Louis, 63.4%, St. Louis, 63.3%, Gary, 59.5%, Philadelphia, 58.6%, Detroit, 55.3%, Atlanta, 54.7%, Cleveland, 53.9%, Memphis, 53.2%, Chicago, 52.8%, Oakland, 52.1%, Harrisburg, 45.7%, New Haven, 45.6%, Hartford, 43.1%, Kansas City, 42.4%, Cincinnati, 40.3%, Pittsburgh, 39.4%, Buffalo, 34.6%, Houston, 33.9%, Flint, 33.1%, Indianapolis, 30.8%, New York City, 30.1%, Boston, 28.9%, San Francisco, 28.8%, Dallas, 27.5%, Miami, 26.8%, Milwaukee, 26.5%, Columbus, 26.1%, Los Angeles, 23.4%, Oklahoma City, 21.2%, Syracuse, 19.0%. San Antonio, 14.2%. Denver, 14.0%. San Diego, 11.6%. 
Seattle, 10.5%, Minneapolis, 7.2%. Source, U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, Racial Isolation in the Public Schools. Because this rapid expansion of Negro population has been concentrated in segregated neighborhoods, ghetto schools have experienced acute overcrowding. Shortages of textbooks and supplies have developed. Double shifts are common. Hallways and other non-classroom space have been adapted for class instruction, and mobile classroom units are used. Even programs for massive construction of new schools in Negro neighborhoods cannot always keep up with increased overcrowding. From 1951 to 1963, the Chicago Board of Education built 266 new schools or additions, mainly in all Negro areas. Yet a special committee studying these schools in 1964 reported that 40% of the Negro elementary schools had more than 35 students per available classroom, as compared to 12% of the primarily white elementary schools. Of the eight Negro high schools, five had enrollments more than 50% above designed capacity. Four of the ten integrated high schools, but only four of the 26 predominantly white high schools, were similarly overcrowded. Comparable conditions prevail in many other large cities. The Civil Rights Commission found that two-thirds of the predominantly Negro elementary schools in Atlanta were overcrowded, this compared with 47% of the white schools. In 1965, all Atlanta Negro high schools were operating beyond their designed capacity. Only one of three all-white high schools and six of eight predominantly white schools were similarly overcrowded. Washington, D.C. elementary schools, with 85 to 100 percent Negro enrollment, operated at a median of 115 percent of capacity. The one predominantly white high school operated at 92.3 percent, an integrated high school at 101.1 percent, and the remaining schools, all predominantly Negro, at 108.4 percent to 127.1 percent of capacity. Overcrowded schools have severe effects on education, the most important of which is that teachers are forced to concentrate on maintaining classroom discipline and thus have little time and energy to perform the primary function, educating the students. Facilities and Curricula Inner-city schools are not only overcrowded, they also tend to be the oldest and most poorly equipped. In Detroit, 30 of the school buildings still in use in these areas were dedicated during the administration of President Grant. In Cincinnati, although from 1950 to 1965 Negro student population expanded at a faster pace than white, most additional school capacity planned and constructed was in predominantly white areas. According to a Civil Rights Commission report on Cincinnati, the added Negro pupil population was housed, for the most part, in the same central city schools vacated by the whites. With respect to equipment, the Coleman Report states that Negro pupils have fewer of some of the facilities that seem most related to achievement. They have less access to physics, chemistry, and language laboratories. There are fewer books per pupil in their libraries. Their textbooks are less often in sufficient supply. The quality of education offered by ghetto schools is diminished by the use of curricula and materials poorly adapted to the life experiences of the students. Designed to serve a middle-class culture, much educational material appears irrelevant to the youth of the racial and economic ghetto. Until recently, few texts featured any Negro personalities— Few books used or courses offered reflected the harsh realities of life in the ghetto or the contribution of Negroes to the country's culture and history. This failure to include materials relevant to their own environment has made students skeptical about the utility of what they are being taught. Reduced motivation to learn results. Funds 
Despite the overwhelming need, our society spends less money educating ghetto children than children of suburban families. Comparing the per capita education costs for ghetto and suburban schools, one educator in testimony before this commission said, If the most educated parents with the highest motivated children find in their wisdom that it costs $1,500 per child per year to educate their children in the suburbs, isn't it logical that it would cost an equal amount to educate the less well-motivated, low-income family child in the inner city? Such cost would just about double the budget of the average inner-city school system. Twenty-five school boards in communities surrounding Detroit spent up to $500 more per year to educate their children than the city. Merely to bring the teacher-to-pupil ratio in Detroit in line with the state average would require an additional 1,650 teachers at an annual cost of approximately $13 million. There is evidence that the disparity in educational expenditures for suburban and inner-city schools has developed in parallel with population shifts. In a study of 12 metropolitan areas, the Civil Rights Commission found that in 1950, 10 of the 12 central cities spent more per pupil than the surrounding suburbs. By 1964, in 7 of the 12, the average suburb spent more per pupil than the central city. This reversal reflects the declining or stagnant city tax base and increasing competition from non-school needs, police, welfare, fire, for a share of the municipal tax dollar. Suburbs, where non-school needs are less demanding, allocate almost twice the proportion of their total budgets to education as the cities. State contributions to city school systems have not had consistent equalizing effects. The Civil Rights Commission found that although state aid to city schools has increased at a rate proportionately greater than for suburban schools, states continue to contribute more per pupil to suburban schools in seven of the 12 metropolitan areas studied. The following table illustrates the findings. Revenues per pupil from state sources. Baltimore, city. Amount per pupil, 1950, $71, 1964, $171, percent increase, 1950 to 54, 140.8%. Baltimore suburbs, 1950, $90 per pupil, 1964, $199 per pupil, 121.1% increase. Birmingham City, 1950, $90 per pupil, 1964, $201 per pupil, 123.3 percent increase. Birmingham Suburbs, 1950, $54 per pupil, 1964, $150 per pupil, 177.7 percent increase. Boston City, 1950, $19 per pupil, 1964, $52 per pupil, 173.7 percent increase. Boston Suburbs, 1950, $30 per pupil, 1964, $75 per pupil, 150 percent increase. Buffalo City, 1950, $135 per pupil, 1964, $284 per pupil, 110.4 percent increase. Buffalo Suburbs, 1950, $165 per pupil, 1964, $270 per pupil, 63.6 percent increase. Chattanooga City, 1950, $62 per pupil, 1964, $136 per pupil, 119.4 percent increase. Chattanooga Suburbs, 1950, $141 per pupil, 1964, $152 per pupil, 7.8 percent increase. 
Chicago, City, 1950, $42 per pupil, 1964, $154 per pupil, 266.6 percent increase. Chicago, Suburbs, 1950, $32 per pupil, 1964, $110 per pupil, 243.8 percent increase. Cincinnati, City, 1950, $51 per pupil, 1964, $91 per pupil, 78.4 percent increase. Cincinnati, Suburbs, 1950, $78 per pupil, 1964, $91 per pupil, 16.7 percent increase. Cleveland, City, 1950, $50 per pupil, 1964, $88 per pupil, 76 percent increase. Cleveland, Suburbs, 1950, $39 per pupil, 1964, $88 per pupil, 125.6 percent increase. Detroit, City, 1950, $135 per pupil, 1964, $189 per pupil, 40 percent increase. Detroit, Suburbs, 1950, $149 per pupil, 1964, $240 per pupil, 61.1 percent increase. New Orleans, City, 1950, $152 per pupil, 1964, $239 per pupil, 57.2 percent increase. New Orleans, Suburbs, 1950, $117 per pupil, 1964, $259 per pupil, 121.4 percent increase. St. Louis, City, 1950, $70 per pupil, 1964, $131 per pupil, 87.1 percent increase. St. Louis, Suburbs, 1950, $61 per pupil, 1964, $143 per pupil, 134.4 percent increase. San Francisco, City, 1950, $122 per pupil, 1964, $163 per pupil, 33.6 percent increase. San Francisco, Suburbs, 1950, $160 per pupil, 1964, $261 per pupil, 63.1 percent increase. Source, U.S. Commission on Civil Rights Racial Isolation in the Public Schools. Federal assistance, while focused on the inner city schools, has not been at a scale sufficient to remove this disparity. In the 1965-66 school year, federal aid accounted for less than 8 percent of total educational expenditures. Our survey of federal programs in Detroit, Newark, and New Haven during the school year 1967-68 found that a median of approximately half the eligible school population is receiving assistance under Title I of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. ESEA. Community School Relations Teachers of the poor rarely live in the community where they work, and sometimes have little sympathy for the lifestyles of their students. Moreover, the growth and complexity of the administration of large urban school systems has compromised the accountability of the local schools to the communities which they serve and reduced the ability of parents to influence decisions affecting the education of their children. Ghetto schools often appear to be unresponsive to the community, communication has broken down, and parents are distrustful of education officials. The consequences for the education of students attending these schools are serious. Parental hostility to the schools is reflected in the attitudes of their children. 
since the needs and concerns of the ghetto community are rarely reflected in educational policy formulated on a citywide basis the schools are often seen by ghetto youth as irrelevant on the basis of interviews of riot area residents in detroit dr charles smith of the u s office of education's comprehensive elementary and secondary education program testified that one of the things that came through very clearly to us is the fact that there is an attitude which prevails in the inner city that says in substance we think education is irrelevant dr dodson explained this phenomenon as follows the divergence of goals between the dominant class and ghetto youth makes schools irrelevant for the youth of the slum it removes knowledge as a tool for groups who are deviant to the ethos of the dominant society it tends to destroy the sense of self-worth of minority background children it breeds apathy powerlessness and low self-esteem the majority of ghetto youth would prefer to forego the acquisition of knowledge if it is at that cost one cannot understand the alienation of modern ghetto youth except in the context of this conflict of goals the absence of effective community school relations has deprived the public education system of the communication required to overcome this divergence of goals in the schools as in the larger society the isolation of ghetto residents from the policy-making institutions of local government is adding to the polarization of the community and depriving the system of its self-rectifying potential ghetto environment all of the foregoing factors contribute substantially to the poor performance of ghetto schools inadequate and inefficient as these schools are the failure of the public education system with respect to negro students cannot be appraised apart from the constant and oppressive ghetto environment the interaction of the ghetto environment and the schools is described in the following testimony of superintendent briggs of cleveland but what about the child of the ghetto it is he whom we must save for we cannot afford to lose this generation of young americans if this child of despair is a young adult there is a better than fifty per cent chance that he is a high school dropout he is not only unemployed but unemployable without assailable skill neither of his parents went beyond the eighth grade preschool or nursery school was out of the question when he was four and when he was five he was placed on a kindergarten waiting list at six he entered school but could only attend for half a day because of the big enrollments during his six years in elementary school he attended four different schools because his family moved often seeking more adequate housing for the six children when he got to high school he wanted vocational training but none was available the family was on relief and he couldn't afford a good lunch at noon because cleveland schools at that time were not participating in the federal hot lunch program and the average cost of lunches amounted to seventy cents of his few friends who were graduated from high school none had found jobs and they couldn't afford to go to college here he is now discouraged and without hope economically incompetent at a time in life when traditionally young americans have entered the economic mainstream as job holders a younger brother age nine is now in the fourth grade he attends a new school opened in nineteen sixty four though he lives one mile from lake erie he has never seen it he has never taken a bus ride except when his class at school went on a field trip the family still does not subscribe to a daily newspaper the television set is broken and there is no money to have it repaired his mother has never taken him downtown shopping he has never been in the office of a dentist and he has seen a physician only at the local clinic when he was injured playing in an abandoned house in the neighborhood at home there are no books his toys if any are second-hand his shoes are too small and his sweatshirt, bought for twenty-five cents at a rummage sale, bears the insignia of a suburban school system. 
Each morning he looks forward anxiously to the free milk he gets at school because there is no breakfast at home. He can't study well at home because of the loud blare of rock and roll music from the bar up the street. There are nine bars in his rather compact neighborhood. The screaming police siren is a very familiar sound to him, for he hears it regularly in his neighborhood, where the crime rate is Cleveland's highest. These boys both have better-than-average intelligence, but they are the victims of neglect and are lost in a maze of statistics. Their plight, and that of thousands like them in America's ghettos, can certainly be considered the most pressing, unattended business on America's agenda. End of Section 53 Recording by Maria Casper Section 54 of the Kerner Commission Report This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders Kerner Commission Report Chapter 17 Recommendations for National Action Part 5 Basic Strategies to meet the urgent need to provide full equality of educational opportunity for disadvantaged youth, we recommend pursuit of the following strategies. Increasing efforts to eliminate de facto segregation. We have cited the extent of racial isolation in our urban schools. It is great and it is growing. It will not easily be overcome. Nonetheless, we believe school integration to be vital to the well-being of this country. We base this conclusion not on the effect of racial and economic segregation on achievement of Negro students, although there is evidence of such a relationship, nor on the effect of racial isolation on the even more segregated white students, although lack of opportunity to associate with persons of different ethnic and socio-economic backgrounds surely limits their learning experience. We support integration as the priority education strategy because it is essential to the future of American society. We have seen in this last summer's disorders the consequences of racial isolation at all levels, and of attitudes toward race on both sides produced by three centuries of myth, ignorance, and bias. It is indispensable that opportunities for interaction between the races be expanded. The problems of this society will not be solved unless and until our children are brought into a common encounter and encouraged to forge a new and more viable design of life. Provision of Quality Education for Ghetto Schools We recognize that the growing dominance of pupils from disadvantaged minorities in city school populations will not soon be reversed. No matter how great the effort toward desegregation, many children of the ghetto will not, within their school careers, attend integrated schools. If existing disadvantages are not to be perpetuated, we must improve dramatically the quality of ghetto education. Equality of results with all white schools in terms of achievement must be the goal. We see no conflict between the integration and quality education strategies we espouse. Commitment to the goal of integrated education can neither diminish the reality of today's segregated and unequal ghetto schools nor sanction the tragic waste of human resources which they entail. Far from being in conflict, these strategies are complementary. The aim of quality education is to compensate for and overcome the environmental handicaps of disadvantaged children. The evidence indicates that integration in itself does not wholly achieve this purpose. Assessing his report in light of interpretation by others of its findings, Dr. Coleman concludes that it is also true that even in socially or racially integrated schools, a child's family background shows a very high relation to his performance. The findings of the Coleman report are quite unambiguous on this score. Even if the school is integrated, 
the heterogeneity of backgrounds with which children enter school is largely preserved in the heterogeneity of their performance when they finish. As the report indicates, integration provides benefits to the underprivileged, but it takes only a small step toward equality of educational opportunity. Moreover, most large integrated schools retain a form of ability grouping, normally resulting in resegregation along racial lines. The Civil Rights Commission found that many Negro students who attend majority white schools are, in fact, in majority Negro classrooms. In short, compensatory education is essential not only to improve the quality of education provided in segregated ghetto schools, but to make possible both meaningful integration and maximum achievement in integrated schools. Attainment of this goal will require adoption of a comprehensive approach designed to reconstruct the ghetto child's social and intellectual environment, compensate for disadvantages already suffered, and provide necessary tools for development of essential literacy skills. This approach will entail adoption of new and costly educational policies and practices, beginning with early childhood and continuing through elementary and secondary schools. It will require extraordinary efforts to reconnect parents with the schools. It will also require unique experimentation with new methods to bring back into the educational process street-oriented teenagers and sub-teenagers who have lost all connection with existing school institutions. Improving Community School Relations In an atmosphere of hostility between the community and the schools, education cannot flourish. A basic problem stems from the isolation of the schools from the other social forces influencing youth. Changes in society, mass media, family structure, religion, have radically altered the role of the school, New links must be built between the schools and the communities they serve. The schools must be related to the broader system which influences and educates ghetto youth. Expansion of opportunities for community and parental participation in the school system is essential to the successful functioning of the inner-city schools. Expanding opportunities for higher and vocational education to increase the relevance of education to the needs and aspirations of disadvantaged youth and to prepare them for full participation in American society, we recommend expanding opportunities both for higher education and for vocational training. Suggested Programs Increasing Efforts to Eliminate De Facto Segregation Increased aid to school systems seeking to eliminate de facto segregation, either within the system or in cooperation with neighboring school systems. Local school boards have experimented with a variety of techniques designed to accomplish desegregation. Among those commonly employed are school pairing, busing, open enrollment, boundary changes, strategic use of site selection, enlargement of attendance areas, and consolidation of schools to overcome racial imbalance. The results have not been uniform. Much appears to depend on the size and racial composition of the city and the attitudes of its suburbs. Some of the smaller cities have achieved considerable success. In many of our larger cities, however, the population shift earlier described has proceeded so far that integration is not feasible without the active cooperation of suburban communities. In others, distances between white and Negro populations within city boundaries make these methods of accomplishing integration unfeasible. While each community should determine the appropriate desegregation technique, we believe substantial federal assistance should be provided. Title IV under Title IV of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the U.S. Commissioner of Education is authorized to provide technical assistance to state and local education agencies 
in the preparation, adoption, and implementation of plans for the desegregation of public schools. However, such aid is not available in support of locally designed programs to overcome racial imbalance in the schools. Moreover, this program has never been adequately funded, even to accomplish its limited objectives. Applications for Title IV funds have consistently exceeded the amounts requested by the administration and the far lower sums appropriated by Congress. We believe that the Title IV program should be reoriented and expanded into a major federal effort to provide comprehensive aid to support state and local desegregation projects. To accomplish this purpose, Title IV should become the vehicle for a comprehensive federal construction, technical assistance, and operating grant program. Successful implementation will require repeal of the present statutory prohibition against the provision of assistance to support and encourage desegregation through assignment of students to public schools in order to overcome racial imbalance. To stimulate planning, formulation of long-term integration plans by applicant state and local agencies should be required as a condition to receiving assistance. Title IV aid would be available only for projects which promote integrated education in accordance with such plans. Bonus Support As an additional incentive to integration, the Title IV program might well be modified to provide substantially increased support upon attainment of specified levels of racial integration. Such bonus assistance should be large enough to enable each recipient school to attain a clearly superior quality of education in comparison with non-integrated schools. Exemplary Schools The Title IV program should stimulate development of exemplary city or metropolitan schools, offering special courses and programs designed to attract, on a voluntary basis, students of varying racial and socioeconomic backgrounds on a full or part-time basis. These model programs should make extensive and imaginative use of resources uniquely available to city schools. The city itself, its museums, galleries, governmental institutions, and other public and private facilities, to the extent that the quality of city schools influences migration to the suburbs, development of exemplary schools could operate to retain middle-class white families in the city and induce others to return, thereby increasing opportunities for integration. Through educational planning on a metropolitan basis, fostered by direct federal grants to cooperative planning bodies encompassing city and suburban school districts, opportunities for engaging central city and suburban students in common educational experiences can be provided. Specific methods of providing integrated educational experiences under this program could include the following. Establishment of major educational magnet schools. Depending upon the size and racial character of the city and its suburbs, these schools could serve all the students of a small city, students living in different sections of a large city, or subdivisions of a metropolitan area. Special curricula could include intensive instruction or specialized educational programs, for example, science or commerce. Establishment of Supplemental Education Centers These centers would offer specialized facilities and instruction to students from different schools for a portion of the school day, it is most important that courses be developed and scheduled to provide racially integrated educational experiences. Educational Parks Such a reoriented Title IV program could provide support, including construction funds, for communities choosing to develop the promising but costly educational parks now under consideration in several cities. As contrasted with the magnet schools and supplementary centers described above, educational parks would consolidate or cluster existing schools, thereby broadening attendance areas to bring within the school zone a racially and economically heterogeneous population. 
These parks could be developed in conjunction with metropolitan plans to serve students from the suburbs as well as the city. Their location should be selected to accomplish this objective. Because of the economies of size made possible through consolidation, the quality of education offered to educational park students could be improved. Problems raised by the size of such institutions could be overcome through the inclusion of smaller subunit schools and individualized instruction made feasible by educational technology, computers, television, and savings resulting from the school consolidation program. Eliminating Discrimination in Northern Schools While racial isolation in urban public schools results largely from residential segregation, there is evidence that racial discrimination also plays a part in reducing opportunities for integration. For example, the Civil Rights Commission found that when crowding in certain Cleveland and Milwaukee Negro schools became acute, school authorities began busing students to nearby underutilized white schools, where they were segregated in separate classrooms and separate luncheon facilities. When Negro students objected, school officials in Milwaukee canceled busing altogether as educationally undesirable, even though white students had been bused and integrated into receiving school classrooms for years. In Cincinnati, to relieve overcrowding in a Negro school, students were bused past several nearby white schools with available space to a 98% Negro school five and a half miles away. The Civil Rights Commission also reported that in many cities, school attendance boundaries and locations of new schools have been designed to perpetuate racial segregation. Title VI under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Congress prohibited federal financial aid to any program or activity which practices racial discrimination. Federal law requires that Title VI be applied uniformly in all states. Implementing this provision, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare has recently instituted a survey to examine compliance with Title VI in school districts of all 50 states. The Department has made clear that its investigation is not directed at de facto segregation arising from reasonable application of neighborhood attendance policies. We support this effort and urge that it be followed by vigorous action to assure full compliance with federal law in all sections of the country, Sufficient staff and resources should be provided to health education and welfare so that this program can be effectively carried out without reducing the Title VI effort in the South. Providing Quality Education in Ghetto Schools Improving the Quality of Teaching in Ghetto Schools The teaching of disadvantaged children requires special skills and capabilities Teachers possessing these qualifications are in short supply. We need a national effort to attract to the teaching profession well-qualified and highly motivated young people and to equip them to work effectively with disadvantaged students. The Teacher Corps program is a sound instrument for such an effort. Established by the Higher Education Act of 1965, it provides training in local colleges or universities for college graduates interested in teaching in poverty areas. Corpsmen are assigned to poverty area schools at the request of local school systems and with approval of state educational agencies. They are employed by the school system and work in teams headed by experienced teachers. The National Advisory Council on the Education of Disadvantaged Children and the National Education Association found that the teacher corps succeeded in attracting dedicated young people to the teaching profession, training them to teach effectively in poverty areas, and making substantial contributions to the education of students. The impact of this highly promising program has been severely restricted by limited and late funding. There are now only 1,406 interns and 330 team leaders in the entire nation, 
the teacher corps should be expanded into a major national program. The Education Professions Development Act, EPDA, provides grants and fellowships to attract qualified persons to the field of education and improve the ability of teachers through advanced training and retraining. The Act also provides funds for institutes and workshops for other educational personnel, including guidance counselors, social workers, teacher aides, and administrators. Finally, EPDA offers grants to local educational agencies experiencing critical shortages of teachers and teacher aides. We recommend that the EPDA program focus on the special need for expanding the supply and improving the quality of teachers working in schools serving disadvantaged students, and that it be substantially funded. Concomitantly, teacher training institutions should place major emphasis on preparing teachers for work in schools serving disadvantaged children. Courses should familiarize teacher candidates with the history, culture, and learning problems of minority group pupils. Class work alone, however, cannot be expected adequately to equip future teachers of disadvantaged children. Intensive in-service training programs designed to bring teacher candidates into frequent and sustained contact with inner-city schools are required. Other professionals and non-professionals working in ghetto-related activities, social workers, street workers, could be included as instructors in teacher training programs. Year-Round Education for Disadvantaged Students the present anachronistic practice of releasing hundreds of thousands of children from a relatively full school schedule to idleness in the summer months is both a substantial factor in producing disorders and a tragic waste of time and facilities. Financing should be provided through ESEA for large-scale year-round educational programs in the disadvantaged areas of our cities. The testimony before this commission including that of cabinet members and public educators, was unanimous in its support of this proposal. What is needed is not 12 months of the same routine, but innovative programs tailored to total educational needs, providing a wide range of educational activities, verbal skills, culture and arts, recreation, job training, work experience, and camps. Planning on a 12-month basis will be required. ESEA assistance should be provided through a single grant program rather than separate 10-month and summer grants, and conditioned on the development of year-round educational plans. Technical assistance should be made available for such planning. As a step toward year-round education, federal funds should be made available for school and camp programs this summer. The National Advisory Council on Education of Disadvantaged Children studied summer programs established with ESEA funds and found that they offer special opportunities for new approaches to teaching disadvantaged children. Summer camp programs offer significant educational and recreational opportunities and should be encouraged. Educational components, particularly verbal skills projects, should be incorporated. It is essential that federal aid for such projects be committed well before the end of the school year so that adequate time to design effective programs is available. Early Childhood Education Early childhood education is the very heart of the effort to reconstruct the environment which incapacitates disadvantaged children educationally even before they enter the school system. Comprehensive preschool programs are essential to overcome the early language deprivation and conceptual disabilities of these children. Yet no more than 40% of the eligible school population in most disadvantaged central city areas is receiving even one year, age four, of preschool training. We believe that the time has come to build on the success of the Head Start and other preschool programs in order to bring the benefits of comprehensive early childhood education to all children from disadvantaged homes, and to extend the reach to younger children. 
For this purpose, the Office of Economic Opportunity should receive substantially increased funds. Effective implementation of this expanded program will be vital to its success. We recommend the following guidelines. Early childhood education programs should provide comprehensive educational support tailored to the needs of the child and should not be simply custodial care. Both daycare and Head Start components are part of comprehensive early childhood education. Each should be designed to overcome the debilitating effect of a disadvantaged environment on learning ability. Parents and the home environment have a critical impact on a child's early development. Early childhood programs should involve parents and the home, as well as the child. This can be accomplished through community education classes and the use of community aids and mother's assistance. To reduce the incidence of congenital abnormalities, these community-based programs should be tied in with prenatal training. Since adequate facilities are scarce in many disadvantaged communities, where schools are overcrowded and other buildings deteriorated, the program should provide funds for special early childhood education facilities. There is a need for maximum experimentation and variety. Funding should continue to support early childhood programs operated by community groups and organizations, as well as by the school system. Early childhood education programs should include provisions for medical care and food so that the educational experience can have its intended impact. End of section 54. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 55 of the Kerner Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, Kerner Commission Report. Chapter 17, Recommendations for National Action, Part 6. Improving Educational Practices, Elementary Schools. Without major changes in educational practices, greater expenditures on existing elementary schools serving disadvantaged neighborhoods will not significantly improve the quality of education. Moreover, current assessments of preschool programs indicate that their benefits are lost in the elementary grades unless the schools themselves are improved. We suggest adoption of the following educational practices to improve school performance. Extra incentives for highly qualified teachers working in ghetto and economically and culturally deprived rural area schools. The most effective means to attract such teachers is to make these schools exciting and attractive places to work. The recommended practices set forth below contribute toward this end. In addition, we suggest that opportunities for creative and imaginative teaching be expanded by allowing the teacher greater discretion in the selection and presentation of materials. Such an approach is likely to produce benefits in terms of attraction and retention of excellent teachers and improved student performance. Rewards related to attainment of career objectives should be provided for teachers working in schools serving disadvantaged children. For example, all school systems should consider requiring service in such schools as a condition to advancement to administrative positions, where the experience gained would be of great value. Reduction in Maximum Class Size it is clear that disadvantaged students require more attention and exert greater demands on teacher time than middle-class students. While reduction of class size may not in itself improve pupil achievement, it will free teachers to devote more time to educating disadvantaged students. It is of vital importance, therefore, that efforts to reduce the maximum class size in schools serving disadvantaged students be coupled with programs designed to improve the skills and capacities of teachers of disadvantaged children. 
recognition of the history, culture, and contribution of minority groups to American civilization in the textbooks and curricula of all schools. To stimulate motivation, school curricula should be adapted to take advantage of student experiences and interests. Provision of supplementary services in the schools for severely disadvantaged or disturbed students. Such services should be made available within the schools, rather than at centralized facilities, and should include medical and psychiatric care. Individualized instruction through extensive use of non-professional personnel. There is impressive evidence that these workers can make a meaningful contribution by providing individualized tutoring and incentive lacking in segregated schools. In the Homework Helper program in New York City, pupils in the fourth through sixth grades were tutored after school by senior high school students. Tutoring was provided four afternoons a week under the supervision of a master teacher. The tutors received training on the fifth day. Initiated with a Ford Foundation grant primarily to provide employment for the high school students, the program had significant educational impact on both pupils and tutors. The Neighborhood Youth Corps and the College Work Study programs provide the tools for reproducing this program in every major city. In some cities, Neighborhood Youth Corps students are already working in these schools, but in many, Neighborhood Youth Corps job assignments are far less stimulating. Colleges and universities should be encouraged to assign more students participating in the college work-study program to tutorial projects. Both programs, Neighborhood Youth Corps and College Work-Study, should be expanded and reoriented for this purpose. Intensive Concentration on Basic Verbal Skills a basic problem in schools in large cities is the low achievement in the fundamental subjects of students from the disadvantaged areas. This has been documented in the Haryu Studies in New York, the study prepared for the McCone Commission following the Watts Riot of 1965, and nationally in the Coleman Report. The lack of reading and writing ability affects detrimentally every other aspect of the later school program. Intensive assistance in literacy skills, including remedial assistance, should be provided in all schools serving disadvantaged children. We recognize that the enrichment programs we recommend will be very costly. ESEA provides financial assistance for such programs, but the amounts available do not match the need. To make a significant improvement in the quality of education provided in schools serving disadvantaged children, ESEA funding should be substantially increased from its current level. In addition, Title I should be modified to provide for greater concentration of aid to school districts having the greatest proportion of disadvantaged students. This can be accomplished by altering the formula governing eligibility to exclude affluent school districts with less than specified minimum numbers of poor students. Improving Educational Practices, Secondary Schools Many of the educational practices recommended for elementary schools are applicable at the secondary level. In addition, secondary school students require extensive guidance, counseling, and advice in planning education program and future careers. Such assistance, routinely provided by middle-class families, is lacking for the ghetto student. To promote its acceptance, indigenous personnel, college students, returning Vietnam veterans, should be utilized. The new stay-in-school program, for which the president recently requested an appropriation of $30 million, could provide funds for this and other projects designed to motivate disadvantaged high school students to pursue their education. We recommend that this program be fully funded. Intensive National Program to Increase Verbal Skills of Ghetto Residents For the products of the ghetto schools, many of them unemployed and functionally illiterate, these efforts will come too late. 
to compensate for educational disadvantages already incurred, we recommend a substantial appropriation to support an intensive year-round program beginning in the summer of 1968 to improve the verbal skills of people in low-income areas, with primary emphasis on the language problems of minority groups. The present effort simply does not match the need. Current estimates indicate that there are approximately 16,300,000 educationally disadvantaged Americans, those who have less than an eighth-grade education. While exact figures are not available, it is highly likely that a disproportionate number of the educationally disadvantaged are Negroes. Census data establishes that 36.9% of Negroes over 25 years of age but only 14.8% of whites, are functionally illiterate. The principal federal literacy program, Adult Basic Education, is meeting only a small fraction of this need. As of June 1966, it had provided assistance to some 373,000 people. The Adult Basic Education program is a sound instrument for implementing an intensive literacy program by affording both the public schools and the community-based organizations the opportunity to conduct literacy projects, this program provides desired flexibility. It should be strengthened and expanded to make a major impact on illiteracy. To concentrate its effect where the need is greatest and the potential payoff high, we suggest that priority be given to the unemployed and underemployed and to welfare mothers. Increasing the literacy levels of these groups would eliminate a major barrier to productive employment and improve support for education in the home. The high school dropouts should be brought into the program by lowering the age limit from 18 to 16, as proposed by the president. Course offerings should be expanded to include matters of interest and concern to residents of low-income areas. Expanded Experimentation, Evaluation, and Research Much remains to be learned about the most effective methods of teaching disadvantaged children in schools segregated by race and class. Research efforts should be increasingly oriented in this direction. In addition to research, federal support should be provided for promising but as yet unvalidated experimental programs designed to involve the talents and resources of the entire community in support of education of disadvantaged children and develop new and better educational techniques particularly adapted to the interests and needs of these students. Among the educational approaches which we believe should be considered and evaluated are the current efforts to develop new patterns of education, such as storefront schools and street academies, for students who do not fit the traditional pattern, possible forms of competitive education, such as the use of businesses, universities, and neighborhood corporations as subcontractors for the operation of certain education programs, concentration of assistance to a few schools serving ghetto children to test the effects of a maximum compensatory education effort, development of model experimental subsystems, high school and several feeder schools to provide specialized instruction, and teaching English as a second language to ghetto students whose dialect often constitutes a first language. Finally, there is great need to evaluate not only these experimental programs, but the entire enrichment effort. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act should be amended to require recipient school systems to undertake a thorough evaluation of their compensatory education effort as a condition to receiving ESEA funds. Improving Community School Relations Community participation in the educational process should be encouraged. The school systems of our largest cities have become highly centralized, with decision-making responsibility for a large and disparate population concentrated in a central board of education. While this process has produced substantial benefits, a citywide tax base and non-political administration, it has sometimes entailed serious sacrifices 
in terms of accountability and community participation. What is necessary is to preserve the worthwhile features present in the existing system while eliminating the liabilities thus far encountered. The objective must be to make public education more relevant and responsive to the community and to increase support for it in the home. This can be accomplished through maintaining centralized control over educational standards and the raising of revenue, while decentralizing control over other aspects of educational policy. The precise mix must be determined locally. However, specific mechanisms for seeking the advice and consultation of students and parents, such as parents' advisory councils or other similar bodies, should be adopted. Ghetto schools should serve as community centers. School facilities should be available during and after normal school hours for a variety of community service functions, delivery of social services by local agencies, including health and welfare, adult and community training and education programs, community meetings, recreational and cultural activities, Decentralization and the establishment of parents' advisory councils will afford the community a means through which to communicate needs for such services and to play an active role in shaping activities. In addition to making better use of the major capital investment in school plants, this approach will encourage ghetto residents to regard their schools not as alien institutions but as vital community centers. Use of local residents as teacher aides and tutors. We have noted the educational gains accomplished through the use of local sub-professional personnel in the schools. These workers can contribute to improved community school relations by providing a close link between the school system and the parents. Results of achievement and other tests should be made public on a regular basis. To increase the accountability of the public schools, the results of their performance should be made available to the public. Such information is available in some, but not all, cities. We see no reason for withholding useful and highly relevant indices of school, but not individual student, performance, and recommend that all school systems adopt a policy of full public disclosure. Expanding Opportunities for Higher Education By enactment of the Higher Education Act of 1965, the Congress committed this nation to the goal of equal opportunity for higher education for all Americans, regardless of race or economic circumstance. While progress has been made, this goal, the key to virtually all managerial and professional jobs, remains for the disadvantaged student an unfulfilled promise. Mr. Harvey Ustdyke, Educational Director of the New York Urban League, testified that less than 1% of the youth in Harlem go to college. In the nation, approximately 8% of disadvantaged high school graduates, many of whom are Negro, attend college. The comparable figure for all high school graduates is more than 50%. The fundamental reasons for this disparity lie in the cost of higher education and the poor quality of elementary and secondary education available to disadvantaged minorities. In the preceding sections, we have recommended programs which we believe will ultimately eliminate these differences, but the full effect of these changes will not be felt for some years. In the interim, if we are to provide equality of opportunity for disadvantaged youth with college potential, special programs are needed. Expansion of Upward Bound and Establishment of Special One-Year Postgraduate College Preparatory Schools The Upward Bound Program of the Office of Economic Opportunity under which students from poverty backgrounds attend intensive six- to eight-week summer sessions on college campuses and receive special assistance throughout the school year, is designed to motivate and prepare disadvantaged youth for college. The program has been effective. Of the 23,000 students covered in 1967, 52% of whom were Negro, 
83% went on to college. However, the size of the upward-bound program is far short of the need. Estimates indicate that some 600,000 poverty-area students could usefully be included. We believe that the upward-bound concept is sound and recommend that the program be substantially expanded. Even an expanded upward-bound program will not compensate for the poor level of secondary school education attained by ghetto youth. We recommend that federal funds be available for special one-year educational programs, with the function of providing college preparatory training for disadvantaged youth. These programs could be operated by community colleges or local boards of education. Removing Financial Barriers to Higher Education The effort to assist qualified but needy young people to obtain a higher education should be strengthened and expanded. Through the Educational Talent Search Program, the federal government provides financial assistance to public and nonprofit agencies to identify and encourage disadvantaged young people with college potential to enter or re-enter educational programs. The President's proposed Educational Opportunity Act of 1968 would provide combined grant, work, and loan aid to poor college-bound students in need of financial assistance. Such assistance should be sufficiently flexible and substantial enough to accommodate the differing needs of individual students. These programs can make an important contribution to the realization of the goals set by the President in his 1968 education message to Congress, that every qualified young person have all the education he wants and can absorb. If this promise is to become a reality, these programs must be funded at a level commensurate with need. The benefit gained by increasing opportunities for disadvantaged students to seek and obtain higher education can be amplified by providing incentives for college-trained public service personnel, particularly teachers and health workers, needed to work in poverty areas. This can be accomplished by providing for the cancellation of loans at a reasonable annual rate if the recipient works in a low-income area, such a forgiveness feature is included in the National Defense Education Act loan program. Expanding Opportunities for Vocational Education Despite substantially increased efforts made possible by the Vocational Education Act of 1963, quality vocational education is still not available to all who need it. The recent report of the Advisory Council on Vocational Education established to evaluate the Act, concluded that although five out of six youths never achieved a college education, only a quarter of the total high school population in the country receive vocational education. Similarly, a 1964 Labor Department survey found that less than one-half of the non-college trained labor force had any formal preparation for the jobs they held. Existing vocational training programs are not effectively linked to job opportunities. The Advisory Council found little evidence of much effort to develop programs in the areas where critical manpower shortages exist. Examples are the health occupations and the technical fields. The special need of the dropout is still being neglected. With an unemployment rate for Negro youth more than twice that for white youth, this problem is particularly acute. To improve the quality and expand the availability of vocational education, provision of additional funds, as recommended by the Advisory Council, may be required. The federal vocational education program should be strengthened by enactment of the proposed Partnership for Learning and Earning Act of 1968. Significant improvement of vocational education, however, will depend on the use made locally of federal and other funds. We suggest the following guidelines. Inclusion of intensive literacy training. Literacy skills are obviously indispensable to productive employment. All vocational education programs should provide literacy training, 
either directly or in conjunction with adult basic education and other programs. Greater emphasis on part-time cooperative education programs, combining formal instruction and on-the-job training through the use of release time. The Advisory Council found that these programs, which provide students with jobs upon the completion of the course, are the best available in the vocational education field. They consistently yield high placement records, high employment stability, and high job satisfaction. The most important factor in improving vocational education is that training be linked to available jobs with upward mobility potential. To accomplish this goal, the active cooperation of the business community in defining job needs and effective training practices should be fully engaged. Consideration should be given to releasing students to attend pre-training opportunities industrialization centers. Full Implementation of Vocational Training Programs for High School Dropouts The Advisory Council found that assistance available under the Vocational Education Act for the training of this group is not being adequately utilized. The need for doing so is critical. Elimination of Barriers to Full Participation of Ghetto Youth in Vocational Education Programs some vocational schools attempt to improve the quality of their student body and enhance their prestige by raising entrance requirements. This policy eliminates those in greatest need. This practice should be discontinued and support for these students should be expanded. Follow-up support and assistance to ghetto youth receiving vocational training. The Advisory Council reported that the most successful vocational programs are those which assume responsibility for placing their graduates and thus get feedback on their strengths and weaknesses. Vocational educators should continue to provide counseling and guidance to their students until they have been successfully placed in jobs related to their training. Increased training to meet the critical need for more workers in professional, semi-professional, and technical fields. Demand for public service workers alone exceeds supply by five to one. Preparation of disadvantaged students for these desirable positions should be intensified. Implementation of these programs. The federal role. The principal burden for funding the programs we have proposed will fall upon the federal government. Caught between an inadequate and shrinking tax base and accelerating demands for public expenditures, the cities are not able to generate sufficient financing. Although there is much more that state government can and should do, the taxing resources available at this level are far from adequate. The federal government has recognized and responded to this need. Federal expenditures for education, training, and related services have increased from $4.7 billion in fiscal 1964 to $12.3 billion in fiscal 1969. These figures include aid for preschool, elementary, secondary, and higher education, vocational education, work training, and activities not related to the education of disadvantaged students. This network of federal educational programs provides a sound and comprehensive basis for meeting the interrelated educational needs of disadvantaged students. We need now to strengthen that base, as we have proposed, and to build upon it by providing greatly increased federal funds for the education of the disadvantaged. The state role. Many states provide more support for suburban and rural schools than for inner city education systems. Designed at a time when suburban school systems were poorer than those in the cities, state aid formulas now operate to reinforce existing inequities. We urge that every state re examine its present method of allocating funds to local school districts not merely to provide equal funds for all political subdivisions on a per-pupil basis, but to assure more per-student aid to districts having a high proportion of disadvantaged students. 
only if equalization formulas reflect the need to spend larger amounts per pupil in schools predominantly populated by disadvantaged students will state aid be allocated on an equitable basis to assist the states in devising equalization formulas which would accomplish this objective we recommend that the office of education develop prototype formulas Federal programs should require allocation of federal aid to education within each state in accordance with formulas which conform with the above criteria. We recognize that virtually all school districts need more money than they now receive. Provision of expanded state aid to education may well be justified. Whatever the amounts may be, we believe that allocation should be made in accordance with the standards described above. Finally, the states, and in particular the state education agencies, have a key role to play in accomplishing school integration. The states are in a unique position to bring about urban-suburban cooperation and metropolitan planning. We urge that the efforts of state educational agencies in this area be given clear direction through the adoption of statewide long-term integration plans and intensified by active promotion of such plans. The Local Role We have emphasized that more money alone will not suffice. Accomplishment of the goal of meaningful educational opportunity for all will require exercise of enlightened and courageous leadership by local government the programs which we have proposed can succeed only if imaginative and effective use is made locally of funds provided by the federal and state governments. Mayors, city councils, school boards, and administrators must lead the community toward acceptance of policies which promote integration while improving the quality of education in existing racially segregated schools, the cooperation of their suburban counterparts is no less essential. This responsibility is not limited to public officials. It is shared by the private community, business and professional leaders, clergymen, and civic organizations. Attainment of the goal of equal and integrated educational opportunity will require the leadership, support, talents, and energies of the entire community. End of section 55. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 56 of the Kerner Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, Kerner Commission Report. Chapter 17, Recommendations for National Action, Part 7. 3. The Welfare System. Introduction. The Commission believes that our present system of public assistance contributes materially to the tensions and social disorganization that have led to civil disorders, the failures of the system alienate the taxpayers who support it, the social workers who administer it, and the poor who depend on it. As one critic told the Commission, the welfare system is designed to save money instead of people, and tragically ends up doing neither. The system is deficient in two critical ways. First, it excludes large numbers of persons who are in great need, and who, if provided a decent level of support, might be able to become more productive and self-sufficient. Second, for those who are included, it provides assistance well below the minimum necessary for a humane level of existence, and imposes restrictions that encourage continued dependency on welfare and undermine self-respect. In short, while the system is indispensable simply because, for millions, mostly children, it supports basic needs, drastic reforms are required if it is to help people free themselves from poverty. Existing welfare programs are a labyrinth of federal, state, and local legislation. 
over 90 percent of national welfare payments are made through programs that are partly or largely federally funded. These reach nearly 8 million persons each month. 2.8 million are over 65, blind, or otherwise severely handicapped. 3.9 million are children in the Aid for Dependent Children program, AFDC, whose parents do not or cannot provide financial support. 1.3 million are the parents of children on AFDC. Of these, over 1 million are mothers, and less than 200,000 are fathers. About two-thirds of the fathers are incapacitated. Only 60,000 fathers are in the special program called Aid to Families with Dependent Children, Unemployed Parents, AFDC UP, operating now in 22 states. Among all the welfare programs, AFDC and AFDC UP have clearly the greatest impact on youths and families in central city areas. For this reason, they will be the principal focus for discussion here. State and local governments contribute an average of about 45% of the cost of supporting the AFDC program, with each state setting the level of grants for its own residents. Accordingly, monthly payments vary widely from state to state. They range from $9.30 per AFDC recipient monthly in Mississippi to a high of $62.55 in New York. In fiscal year 1967, the total annual cost of the AFDC program, including federal, state, and local contributions, was approximately $2 billion, providing an average of about $36 monthly for each recipient. This sum is well below the poverty subsistence level under almost any standard. The National Advisory Council on Public Welfare has commented, the national average provides little more than half the amount admittedly required by a family for subsistence. In some low-income states, it is less than a quarter of that amount. The low public assistance payments contribute to the perpetuation of poverty and deprivation that extend into future generations. Over the last six years, despite the longest sustained period of economic progress in the history of this country, the AFDC caseload has risen each year, while the unemployment rate has fallen. Cases increased nationally by 319,000 during fiscal year 1967, and will, under present HEW estimates, increase by another 686,000 during the fiscal year 1968. The burden of welfare and the burden of the increases will fall principally on our central cities. In New York City alone, 525,000 people receive AFDC support, and 7,000 to 10,000 more are added each month. And it is estimated that in 1965, nationwide, over 50% of persons eligible to receive assistance under welfare programs were not enrolled. In addition to the AFDC program, Almost all states have a program of general assistance to provide minimum payments based largely or entirely on need. During calendar year 1966, the states spent $336 million on general assistance. No federal funds have ever been available for this program. In fact, no federal funds have ever been available for millions of unemployed or underemployed men or women in the United States who are in need, but are neither aged, severely handicapped, nor the parents of minor children. The dimensions of this pool of poor but unassisted individuals and families, either ineligible under present programs or eligible but unenrolled, is indicated by the fact that in 1966 there were 21.7 million non-aged persons in the United States, with incomes below the poverty level as defined by the Social Security Administration. Only a third of these received assistance from major public welfare programs. The bulk of the non-aged poor live in families where there is a breadwinner who works either every day or who had worked a part of the year, 
so that the picture that people have of who the poor are is quite a different thing from an analysis of the poverty population. And what we have done, in effect, is carve out, because of our categorical approach to public assistance, a certain group of people within that overall poverty population to give help to. Seventy percent of the non-aged poor families were headed by men, and fifty percent of these held full-time jobs, and 86% of them worked at least part of the year, so that the typical poor family is much like the typical American family, except they don't make enough money, and they have been historically excluded from the AFDC program. The gaps in coverage and low levels of payments are the source of much of the long-term dissatisfaction with the system. The day-to-day -day administration of the system creates even sharper bitterness and dissatisfaction, because it repeatedly serves to remind recipients that they are considered untrustworthy, ungrateful, promiscuous, and lazy. Among the most troublesome statutory requirements and administrative practices and regulations are the following. First, in most states, benefits are available only when a parent is absent from the home. Thus, in these states, an unemployed father whose family needs public assistance in order to survive must either abandon his family or see them go hungry. This so-called man-in-the-house rule was intended to prevent payments to children who have an alternative potential source of support. In fact, the rule seems to have fostered the breakup of homes and perpetuated reliance on welfare, the irritation caused by the rule is aggravated in some states by regular searches of recipients' homes to ferret out violations. Second, and until recently, all amounts earned by adult welfare recipients on outside jobs, except for small allowances for expenses, were deducted directly from the welfare payments they would otherwise have received. This practice, required by federal law, appears to have taken away from many recipients the incentive to seek part- or full-time employment. The 1967 amendments to the welfare laws permit retention of the first $30 earned by a recipient each month, and one-third of all earnings above that amount. This is a start in the right direction, but does not go nearly far enough. New York City has, for example, begun experimenting with a promising program that allows welfare mothers to keep the first $85 of earnings each month, and a percentage of amounts above that. Third, in most states, there is a residency requirement, generally averaging around a year, before a person is eligible to receive welfare, these state regulations were enacted to discourage persons from moving from one state to another to take advantage of higher welfare payments. In fact, they appear to have had little, if any, impact on migration, and have frequently only served to prevent those in greatest need, desperately poor families arriving in a strange city, from receiving the boost that might have given them a fresh start. Fourth, Though large amounts are being spent on social service programs for families, children, and young people, few of these programs have been effective. In the view of the Advisory Council on Public Welfare, the inadequacies in social services are themselves a major source of such social evils as crime and juvenile delinquency, mental illness, illegitimacy, multi-generational dependency, slum environments, and the widely deplored climate of unrest, alienation, and discouragement among many groups in the population. A final example of the system's inadequacy is the brittle relationship that exists between many welfare workers and the poor. The cumulative abrasive effects of the low levels of assistance, the complicated eligibility requirements, the continuing efforts required by regulations to verify eligibility, often by means that constitute flagrant invasions of privacy, have often brought about an adversary relationship between the caseworker and the recipient family. This is intensified by the fact that the investigative requirements not only force continuing confrontations, but in those states where the same worker performs both investigative and service functions, leave the worker little time to provide service.
As was stated by Liesel Carter, Assistant Secretary of Health Education and Welfare, in testimony before the Commission, we think it is extremely important that welfare recipients begin to feel that the welfare worker is on their side instead of on the side of the agency. There have been statements made that the welfare workers are among the most hated persons in the ghetto, and one of the studies shows that the recipients tend to feel that what the worker says is something that cannot be challenged. Nowhere do you get the feeling that the worker is there to really go to bat for recipients in dealing with the other pressures that they face in the community. One manifestation of the tension and dissatisfaction created by the present system has been the growth of national and local welfare protest groups. Some are seeking to precipitate a national welfare crisis, in part by bringing on the welfare rolls so many new recipients that America will be forced to face the enormity of its poverty problem. Others, often composed of welfare recipients or welfare workers, seek expanded welfare programs and attack day-to-day -day inequities in the administration of the system. On the other hand, many Americans who advocate better housing, better schools, and better employment opportunities for disadvantaged citizens oppose welfare programs of all kinds in the belief that they subsidize people who should be working. The fact is, as we have pointed out, that all but a small fraction of welfare recipients are disabled because of age, ill health, or the need to care for small children. Even more basic is the fact that the heads of most poor families who can work are working, and are not on welfare. For both of these groups, the people in need, those who cannot work, and those who can and do, the problem, in at least one vital respect, is the same. Lack of a sufficient income to provide them with the kind of base on which they can begin to build a path out of poverty, if not for themselves, at least for their children. An altered and expanded welfare system, by extending support to more of those in need, by raising levels of assistance on a uniform national basis, and by eliminating demeaning restrictions, could begin to recapture the rich human resources that are being wasted by poverty. Basic Strategies in framing strategies to attack welfare problems, the Commission recognizes that a number of fundamental questions remain to be answered. Although many of the present inadequacies in the system can be identified and specific changes recommended, long-term measures for altering the system are still untested. A first strategy is to learn more about how welfare affects people and what its possibilities are for creative use. We endorse the recommendation of the Advisory Council on Public Welfare for greatly expanded research. We also commend the experimental incentive programs being carried out through the Department of Health Education and Welfare and the Office of Economic Opportunity, as well as the Model Cities program, through which some cities hope to develop integrated programs of income supplementation, job training, and education. We further commend the President's recent creation of a Commission on Income Maintenance Programs, which may provide answers to the complex problems here presented. Despite the questions left open, we believe that many specific inadequacies in the present structure can and should be corrected. The most important basic strategy we would recommend is to overhaul the existing categorical system to a provide more adequate levels of assistance on the basis of uniform national standards, b. reduce the burden on state and local government by financing assistance costs almost entirely with federal funds, c. create new incentives to work and eliminate the features that cause hardship and dependency, d. improve family planning and other social services to welfare recipients. Our longer-range strategy, one for which we can offer only tentative guides, is the development of a national system of income supplementation to provide a basic floor of economic and social security for all Americans. Suggested Programs Overhauling the Present System To repair the defects in the existing categorical system, 
is not simply a matter of changing one or two aspects. Major changes are needed in at least seven areas. Standards of Assistance The federal government should develop a minimum income standard for individuals and families enrolled in AFDC. The standard for AFDC recipients should be at least as high as the subsistence poverty level periodically determined by the Social Security Administration. Only a few states now approach this poverty level, which is currently set at $3,335 for an urban family of four. Amending legislation should, if feasible, also permit cost-of-living variations among the states and within high-cost areas in each state. As a critical first step toward raising assistance levels, the Commission recommends that the present provisions, under which the federal government pays 15 eighteenths of the first $18 of AFDC monthly payments, be amended to provide that the federal government will assume the entire first $15, and the same proportion of payments beyond $15 presently applied to that above $18, Taken together with existing legislation that requires the states to maintain levels of support when federal assistance rates are increased, the effect of this change would be to raise, by over one-third, the monthly welfare payments in eight states in the Deep South. In Mississippi, payments would be more than doubled. Extension of AFDC UP the Commission strongly urges that the temporary legislation enacted in 1961, which extends the AFDC programs to include needy families with two unemployed parents, be made permanent and mandatory on all states, and that the new federal definition of unemployment be broadened. This program, which reaches the family while it is still intact, has been put into effect in only 22 states. Even in states where it has been implemented, the numbers participating have been small, partly because many states have narrowly defined the term unemployment, and partly because the number of broken homes makes many children eligible under the regular form of AFDC. Financing Because the states are unable to bear substantially increased welfare costs, the federal government should absorb a far greater share of the financial burden than it presently does. At least two methods are worth considering to achieve this end. The first would be to rearrange payment formulas, so that even at the highest levels of payments, the federal government absorbed 90% or more of the costs. A second method would be to have the federal government assume 100% of the increment in costs that would be encountered through raising standards of assistance and rendering AFDC up mandatory. Under either of these approaches, the share of costs presently imposed on municipal governments should be removed to release their limited resources for other uses. Work Incentives and Training in three important ways, steps were taken in the 1967 amendments to the Federal Welfare Act to encourage or compel welfare recipients to seek employment. Each of these controversial steps had some salutary aspects, but each requires substantial further attention. A. Job Training The amendments provide substantially greater funds for job training, this was in principle a wise step. The amendments also, however, require the states to condition grants to appropriate adult welfare recipients on their willingness to submit to job training. Though the Commission agrees that welfare recipients should be encouraged to accept employment or job training, we strongly disagree with compelling the mothers of small children to work or else lose welfare support. Many mothers, we believe, will want to work. A recent study of about 1,500 welfare mothers in New York City indicated that 70% of all mothers and 80% of Negro mothers would prefer to work than stay at home. B. Daycare Centers for Children 
The 1967 amendments provide funds for the first time for daycare programs for children of working mothers. Further expansion is desirable to make centers an effective means of enabling welfare recipients to take advantage of training and employment opportunities. Efforts should be made to ensure that centers are open in the evening and that more education features are built into center programs. State and federal standards that prevent centers from employing sub-professional workers, including welfare recipient mothers, should be removed. Welfare mothers themselves should be encouraged to set up cooperative centers with one or more mothers tending the children of other mothers, and with welfare funds available for their salaries. Such living room daycare can only be effective if the mother taking care of the children can be paid without losing any substantial portion of her own welfare check. C. Retention of part of earnings. The amendments permit an AFDC or AFDC UP recipient to retain the first $30 of earned income monthly and one-third of the balance. Both the sums that can be kept without penalty and the percentage of the balance that can be retained should be raised substantially to maximize the incentive to work. Some experimental programs are now going forward, but expanded efforts are needed to test different combinations and approaches. These programs should be supported at all levels of government. Removal of Freeze on Recipients The 1967 Welfare Amendments freeze, for each state, the percentage of children who can be covered by federal AFDC grants to the percentage of coverage in that state in January 1968. The anticipated effect of this new restriction will be to prevent federal assistance during 1968 to 475,000 new applicants otherwise eligible under present standards. In the face of this restriction, states and cities will have to dig further into already depleted local resources to maintain current levels. If they cannot bear the increased costs, a second alternative less feasible under existing federal requirements, will be to tighten eligibility requirements for everyone or reduce per capita payments. We strongly believe that none of these alternatives is acceptable and that the freeze should be eliminated. Restrictions on Eligibility The so-called man-in-the-house rule and the restrictions on new residents of states should be eliminated, Though these restrictions are currently being challenged in the courts, we believe that legislative and administrative action should be taken to eliminate them now. Other features of the system that should be altered or strengthened. A. Clear and enforceable rights. These include prompt determinations of eligibility and rights to administrative appeal with representation by counsel, a recipient should be able to regard assistance as a right and not as an act of charity. Applicants should be able to establish initial eligibility by personal statements or affidavits relating to their financial situation and family composition, subject to subsequent review conducted in a manner that protects their dignity, privacy, and constitutional rights. Searches of welfare recipients' homes whether with or without consent, should be abandoned. These changes in procedures would not only accord welfare recipients the respect to which they are entitled, but would also release welfare workers to concentrate more of their time on providing service. Such changes would also release a substantial portion of the funds spent on establishing eligibility for the more important function of providing support. B. Separation of Administration of AFDC and Welfare Programs for the Disabled The time that welfare workers have available for the provision of services would be increased further by separating the administration of AFDC and general assistance programs from aid to the aged and physically incapacitated. The problems of these latter groups are greatly different and might better be handled at the federal level through the Social Security Administration. 
Any such change would, of course, require that programs for the disabled and aged continue to be paid out of general funds, and not to impair the integrity of the Social Security Trust Fund. C. Special Neighborhood Welfare Contact and Diagnostic Centers Centers to provide the full complement of welfare services should be combined into the multi-purpose neighborhood service facilities being developed by the Office of Economic Opportunity and the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Federal funds should be provided to help local welfare agencies decentralize their programs through these centers, which would include representatives of all welfare, social, rehabilitation, and income assistance services. D. Expansion of Family Planning Programs Social workers have found that many women in poverty areas would like to limit the size of their families, and are either unaware of existing birth control methods, or do not have such methods available to them. Governments at all levels, and particularly the federal, should underwrite broader programs to provide family planning information and devices to those who desire them. Through such programs, the Commission believes that a significant contribution can be made to breaking the cycle of poverty and dependency. Toward a National System of Income Supplementation in 1949, Senator Robert A. Taft described a system to provide a decent level of income for all citizens. I believe that the American people feel that with the high production of which we are now capable, there is enough left over to prevent extreme hardship and maintain a minimum standard floor under subsistence, education, medical care, and housing to give to all a minimum standard of decent living and to all children a fair opportunity to get a start in life. Such a minimum standard of decent living has been called for by many other groups and individuals, including the AFL-CIO, major corporate executives, and numerous civil rights and welfare organizations. The study of the new Commission on Income Maintenance Programs and the Model Cities Program will be of particular importance in providing direction we believe that efforts should be made to develop a system of income supplementation with two broad and basic purposes. To provide for those who can work or who do work any necessary supplements in such a way as to develop incentives for fuller employment. To provide for those who cannot work and for mothers who decide to remain with their children a minimum standard of decent living to prevent deprivation and aid in saving children from the prison of poverty that has held their parents. Under this approach, then, all present restrictions on eligibility other than need would be eliminated. In this way, two large and important groups not covered by present federal programs would be provided for. Employed persons working at substandard hours or wages and unemployed persons who are neither disabled nor the parents of minor children. A broad system of supplementation would involve substantially greater federal expenditures than anything now contemplated in this country. The cost will range widely depending on the standard of need accepted as the basic allowance to individuals and families, and the rate at which additional income above this level is taxed. Yet, if the deepening cycle of poverty and dependence on the welfare system can be broken, if the children of the poor can be given the opportunity to scale the wall that now separates them from the rest of society, the return on this investment will be great indeed. End of section 56. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 57 of the Kerner Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. Kerner Commission Report. Chapter 17, Recommendations for National Action, Part 8. 4. Housing. Introduction. 
The passage of the National Housing Act in 1934 signaled a new federal commitment to provide housing for the nation's citizens. Congress made the commitment explicit 15 years later in the Housing Act of 1949, establishing as a national goal the realization of a decent home and suitable environment for every American family. Today, after more than three decades of fragmented and grossly underfunded federal housing programs, decent housing remains a chronic problem for the disadvantaged urban household. Fifty-six percent of the country's non-white families live in central cities today, and of these, nearly two-thirds live in neighborhoods marked by substandard housing and general urban blight. For these citizens, condemned by segregation and poverty to live in the decaying slums of our central cities, the goal of a decent home and suitable environment is as far distant as ever. During the decade of the 1950s, when vast numbers of Negroes were migrating to the cities, only 4 million of the 16.8 million new housing units constructed throughout the nation were built in the central cities. These additions were counterbalanced by the loss of 1.5 million central city units through demolition and other means. The result was that the number of non-whites living in substandard housing increased from 1.4 to 1.8 million, even though the number of substandard units declined. Statistics available for the period since 1960 indicate that the trend is continuing. There has been virtually no decline in the number of occupied dilapidated units in metropolitan areas, and surveys in New York City and Watts actually show an increase in the number of such units. These statistics have led the Department of Housing and Urban Development to conclude that while the trend in the country as a whole is toward less substandard housing, there are individual neighborhoods and areas within many cities where the housing situation continues to deteriorate. Inadequate housing is not limited to Negroes. Even in the central cities, the problem affects two and a half times as many white as non-white households. Nationally, over 4 million of the nearly 6 million occupied substandard units in 1966 were occupied by whites. It is also true that Negro housing in large cities is significantly better than that in most rural areas, especially in the South. Good quality housing has become available to Negro city dwellers at an increasing rate since the mid-1950s, when the post-war housing shortage ended in most metropolitan areas. Nevertheless, in the Negro ghetto, grossly inadequate housing continues to be a critical problem. Substandard, old, and overcrowded structures. Nationwide, 25% of all non-whites living in central cities occupied substandard units in 1960, compared to 8% of all whites. Preliminary Census Bureau data indicate that by 1966 the figures had dropped to 16 and 5 percent respectively. However, if deteriorating units and units with serious housing code violations were added, the percentage of non-whites living in inadequate housing in 1966 becomes much greater. In 14 of the largest U.S. cities, the proportions of all non-white housing units classified as deteriorating, dilapidated, or lacking full plumbing in 1960, the latest date for which figures were available, were as follows. New York. Percentage of non-white occupied housing units classified as deteriorating or dilapidated, 1960, 33.8%. Percentage of non-white occupied housing units classified as deteriorating, dilapidated, or sound but without full plumbing, 1960, 42.4%. Chicago, 32.1% deteriorating or dilapidated, 42.8% deteriorating, dilapidated, or sound but without full plumbing. Los Angeles, 14.7% deteriorating or dilapidated, 18.1% deteriorating or sound but without full plumbing, 
deteriorating, dilapidated, or sound but without full plumbing. Philadelphia, 28.6% deteriorating or dilapidated, 32.0% deteriorating, dilapidated, or without full plumbing. Detroit, 27.9% deteriorating or dilapidated, 30.1% deteriorating, dilapidated, or without full plumbing. Baltimore, 30.5% deteriorating or dilapidated, 31.7% deteriorating, dilapidated, or without full plumbing. Houston, 30.1% deteriorating or dilapidated, 36.7% deteriorating, dilapidated, or without full plumbing. Cleveland, 29.9% deteriorating or dilapidated, 33.9% deteriorating, dilapidated, or without full plumbing. Washington, D.C., 15.2% deteriorating or dilapidated, 20.8% deteriorating, dilapidated, or without full plumbing. St. Louis, 40.3% deteriorating or dilapidated, 51.6% deteriorating, dilapidated, or without full plumbing. San Francisco, 21.3% deteriorating or dilapidated, 34.0% deteriorating, dilapidated, or without full plumbing. Dallas, 41.3% deteriorating or dilapidated, 45.9% deteriorating, dilapidated, or without full plumbing. New Orleans, 44.3% deteriorating or dilapidated, 56.9% deteriorating, dilapidated, or without full plumbing. Pittsburgh, 49.1% deteriorating or dilapidated, 58.9% deteriorating, dilapidated, or without full plumbing. Conditions were far worse than these citywide averages in many specific disadvantaged neighborhoods. For example, a study of housing in Newark, New Jersey, before the 1967 disorders, showed the following situation in certain predominantly Negro neighborhoods as of 1960. Percentage of housing units dilapidated or deteriorated in selected areas of Newark, 1960. Area number one, population 25,300, 75.5% non-white, 91% of all housing units dilapidated or deteriorating. Area number two, population 48,200, 64.5% non-white, 63.8% of all housing units dilapidated or deteriorating. Area number 3A, population 48,300, 74.8% non-white, 43.1% of all housing units dilapidated or deteriorating. These three areas contained 30% of the total population of Newark in 1960, and 62% of its non-white population. The Commission carried out special analyses of 1960 housing conditions in three cities, concentrating on all census tracts with 1960 median incomes of under $3,000 for both families and individuals. It also analyzed housing conditions in Watts. The results showed that the vast majority of people living in the poorest areas of these cities were Negroes, and that a high proportion lived in inadequate housing. Detroit. Total population of the study area, 162,375. 67.5% non-white. 32.7% of housing units substandard by HUD definition, 53.1% dilapidated, deteriorating, or sound but lacking full plumbing. Washington, D.C., total population of study area, 97,084, 74.5% non-white, 23.9% of housing units substandard by HUD definition, 37.3% dilapidated, deteriorating, or sound but lacking full plumbing. Memphis, 
total population of study area 150,827, 74 percent non-white, 35 percent of housing units substandard by HUD definition, 46.5 percent dilapidated, deteriorating, or sound but lacking full plumbing. Watts area of Los Angeles, total population of study area 49,074, 87.3% non-white, 10.5% of housing units substandard by HUD definition, 29.1% dilapidated, deteriorating, or sound but lacking full plumbing. Negroes, on average, also occupy much older housing than whites. In each of the ten metropolitan areas analyzed by the Commission, Substantially higher percentages of non-whites than whites occupied units built prior to 1939. Percentage of white and non-white occupied housing units built prior to 1939 in selected metropolitan areas. Cleveland. 33.2% white occupied units, 90.6% non-white occupied units. Dallas. 31.9% white-occupied, 52.7% non-white-occupied. Detroit, 46.2% white-occupied, 86.1% non-white-occupied. Kansas City, 54.4% white-occupied, 89.9% non-white-occupied. Los Angeles, Long Beach, 36.6% white-occupied, 62.4% non-white-occupied. New Orleans, 52.9% white-occupied, 62.2% non-white-occupied. Philadelphia, 62% white-occupied, 90.8% non-white-occupied. St. Louis, 57.9% white-occupied, 84.7% non-white occupied. San Francisco, Oakland, 51.3% white occupied, 67.6% non-white occupied. Washington, D.C., 31.9% white occupied, 64.9% non-white occupied. Finally, Negro housing units are far more likely to be overcrowded than those occupied by whites. In U.S. metropolitan areas in 1960, 25% of all non-white units were overcrowded by the standard measure, that is, they contained 1.01 or more persons per room. Only 8% of all white-occupied units were in this category. Moreover, 11% of all non-white-occupied units were seriously overcrowded, 1.51 or more persons per room compared with 2% for white-occupied units. The figures were as follows in the 10 metropolitan areas analyzed by the Commission. Percentage of white and non-white occupied units with 1.01 or more persons per room in selected metropolitan areas. Cleveland, 6.9% of white-occupied units, 19.3% of non-white occupied units. Dallas, 9.3% of white-occupied units, 28.8% of non-white-occupied units. Detroit, 8.6% of white-occupied units, 17.5% of non-white-occupied units. Kansas City, 8.7% of white-occupied units, 18% of non-white-occupied units. Los Angeles, Long Beach, 8% of white-occupied units, 17.4% of non-white-occupied units. New Orleans, 12% of white-occupied units, 36.1% of non-white-occupied units. Philadelphia, 4.9% of white-occupied units, 16.3% of non-white-occupied units. St. Louis, 11.8% of white-occupied units, 28% of non-white occupied units. San Francisco, Oakland, 6% of white occupied units, 19.7% of non-white occupied units.
Washington, D.C., 6.2% of white occupied units, 22.6% of non white occupied units. Higher rents for poorer housing. Negroes in large cities are often forced to pay the same rents as whites and receive less for their money, or pay higher rents for the same accommodations. The first type of discriminatory effect, paying the same amount but receiving less, is illustrated by data from the 1960 census for Chicago and Detroit. In certain Chicago census tracts, both whites and non-whites paid median rents of $88, and the proportions paying various specific rents below that median were almost identical, but the units rented by non-whites were typically smaller, the median number of rooms was 3.35 for non-whites versus 3.95 for whites. In worse condition, 30.7% of all non-white units were deteriorated or dilapidated units versus 11.6% for whites. Occupied by more people, the median household size was 3.53 for non-whites versus 2.88 for whites and more likely to be overcrowded. 27.4% of non-white units had 1.01 or more persons per room, versus 7.9% for whites. In Detroit, whites paid a median rental of $77, as compared to $76 among non-whites. Yet 27% of non-white units were deteriorating or dilapidated, as compared to only 10.3% of all white units. The second type of discriminatory effect, paying more for similar housing, is illustrated by data from a study of housing conditions in disadvantaged neighborhoods in Newark, New Jersey. In four areas of that city, including the three areas cited previously, non-whites with housing essentially similar to that of whites paid rents that were from 8.1% to 16.8% higher. Though the typically larger size of non-white households, with consequent harder wear and tear, may partly justify the differences in rental, the study found that non-whites were paying a definite color tax of apparently well over 10% on housing. This condition prevails in most racial ghettos. The combination of high rents and low incomes forces many Negroes to pay an excessively high proportion of their income for housing. This is shown by the following chart, showing the percentage of renter households paying over 35% of their income for rent in 10 metropolitan areas. Percentages of white and non-white occupied units with households paying 35% or more of their income for rent in selected metropolitan areas. Cleveland, 8.6% of white occupied units, 33.8% of non white occupied units. Dallas, 19.2% of white occupied units, 33.8% of non white occupied units. Detroit, 21.2% of white occupied units, 40.5% of non white occupied units. Kansas City, 20.2% of white occupied units, 40.0% of non white occupied units. Los Angeles, Long Beach, 23.4% of white occupied units, 28.4% of non white occupied units. New Orleans, 16.6% .6 of white occupied units, 30.5% of non white occupied units. Philadelphia, 19.3% of white occupied units, 32.1% of non white occupied units. St. Louis, 18.5% of white occupied units, 36.7% of non white occupied units. San Francisco, Oakland, 21.2% of white occupied units, 25.1% of non white occupied units. Washington, D.C., 18.5% of white occupied units, 28.3% of non white occupied units. The high proportion of income that must go for rent 
leaves less money in such households for other expenses. Undoubtedly, this hardship is a major reason many Negro households regard housing as one of their worst problems. Discrimination in Housing Code Enforcement Thousands of landlords in disadvantaged neighborhoods openly violate building codes with impunity, thereby providing a constant demonstration of flagrant discrimination by legal authorities. A high proportion of residential and other structures contain numerous violations of building and housing codes. Refusal to remedy these violations is a criminal offense, one which can have serious effects upon the victims living in these structures. Yet in most cities, few building code violations in these areas are ever corrected, even when tenants complain directly to municipal building departments. There are economic reasons why these codes are not rigorously enforced. Bringing many old structures up to code standards and maintaining them at that level often would require owners to raise rents far above the ability of local residents to pay. In New York City, rigorous code enforcement has already caused owners to board up and abandon over 2,500 buildings rather than incur the expense of repairing them. Nevertheless, open violation of codes is a constant source of distress to low-income tenants and creates serious hazards to health and safety in disadvantaged neighborhoods. Housing Conditions and Disorder Housing conditions in the disorder cities surveyed by the Commission paralleled those for ghetto Negroes generally. Many homes were physically inadequate. Forty-seven percent of the units occupied by non-whites in the disturbance areas were substandard. Overcrowding was common. In the metropolitan areas in which the disorders occurred, 24 percent of all units occupied by non-whites were overcrowded, against only 8.8 percent .8 of the white-occupied units. Negroes paid higher percentages of their income for rent than whites. In both the disturbance areas and the greater metropolitan area of which they were a part, the median rent as a proportion of median income was over 25 percent higher for non-whites than for whites. The result has been widespread discontent with housing conditions and costs. In nearly every disorder city surveyed, grievances related to housing were important factors in the structure of Negro discontent. Poverty and Housing Deterioration The reasons many Negroes live in decaying slums are not difficult to discover. First and foremost is poverty. Most ghetto residents cannot pay the rent necessary to support decent housing. This prevents private builders from constructing new units in the ghettos or from rehabilitating old ones, for either action involves an investment that would require substantially higher rents than most ghetto dwellers can pay. It also deters landlords from maintaining units that are presently structurally sound. Maintenance, too, requires additional investment, and at the minimal rents that inner-city Negroes can pay, landlords have little incentive to provide it. The implications of widespread poor maintenance are serious. Most of the gains in Negro housing have occurred through the turnover which occurs as part of the filtering down process. As the white middle class moves out, the units it leaves are occupied by Negroes. Many of these units are very old, Without proper maintenance, they soon become dilapidated, so that the improvement in housing resulting from the filtering down process is only temporary. The 1965 New York City survey points up the danger. During the period that the number of substandard units was decreasing, the number of deteriorating units increased by 95,000. Discrimination the second major factor condemning vast numbers of Negroes to urban slums is racial discrimination in the housing market. Discrimination prevents access to many non-slum areas, particularly the suburbs, and has a detrimental effect on ghetto housing itself. By restricting the area open to a growing population, housing discrimination makes it profitable for landlords to break up ghetto apartments for denser occupancy, hastening housing deterioration. Further, by creating a back pressure in the racial ghettos, 
discrimination keeps prices and rents of older, more deteriorated housing in the ghetto market higher than they would be in a truly free and open market. End of section 57. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 58 of the Kerner Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, Kerner Commission Report. Chapter 17, Recommendations for National Action, Part 9. Existing Programs. To date, federal building programs have been able to do comparatively little to provide housing for the disadvantaged. In the 31-year history of subsidized federal housing, only about 800,000 units have been constructed, with recent production averaging about 50,000 units a year. By comparison, over a period only three years longer, FHA insurance guarantees have made possible the construction of over 10 million middle- and upper-income units. Federal programs also have done little to prevent the growth of racially segregated suburbs around our cities. Until 1949, FHA official policy was to refuse to insure any unsegregated housing. It was not until the issuance of Executive Order 11063 in 1962, that the agency required non-discrimination pledges from loan applicants. It is only within the last few years that a range of programs has been created that appears to have the potential for substantially relieving the urban housing problem. Direct federal expenditures for housing and community development have increased from $600 million in fiscal 1964 to nearly $3 billion in fiscal 1969. To produce significant results, however, these programs must be employed on a much larger scale than they have been so far. In some cases, the constraints and limitations imposed upon the programs must be reduced. In a few instances, supplementary programs should be created. In all cases, incentives must be provided to induce maximum participation by private enterprise in supplying energy, imagination, capital, and production capabilities. Federal housing programs must also be given a new thrust aimed at overcoming the prevailing patterns of racial segregation. If this is not done, those programs will continue to concentrate the most impoverished and dependent segments of the population into the central city ghettos, where there is already a critical gap between the needs of the population and the public resources to deal with them. This can only continue to compound the conditions of failure and hopelessness, which lead to crime, civil disorder, and social disorganization. Basic Strategies we believe the following basic strategies should be adopted. The supply of housing suitable for low-income families should be expanded on a massive basis. The basic reason many Negroes are compelled to live in inadequate housing is the failure of the private market to produce decent housing at rentals they can afford to pay. Programs we have recommended elsewhere are directed toward raising income levels, Yet it is obvious that in the foreseeable future there will continue to be a gap between the income of many Americans and the price of decent housing produced by the normal market mechanisms. Thus, the implementation of the strategy depends on programs which not only generate more lower-cost housing, but also raise the rent-paying capability of low-income households. Areas outside of ghetto neighborhoods should be opened up to occupancy by racial minorities. Provision of decent, low-cost housing will solve only part of the problem. Equally fundamental is the elimination of the racial barrier in housing. Residential segregation prevents equal access to employment opportunities and obstructs efforts to achieve integrated education. A single society cannot be achieved as long as this cornerstone of segregation stands. 
Suggested Programs We are proposing programs in ten areas to illustrate how we believe basic strategies we have outlined can be put into effect. Provision of 600,000 low- and moderate-income housing units next year, and 6 million units over the next five years. An expanded and modified below-market interest rate program. An expanded and modified rent supplement program and an ownership supplement program. Federal write-down of interest rates on loans to private builders an expanded and more diversified public housing program, an expanded model cities program, a reoriented and expanded urban renewal program, reform of obsolete building codes, enactment of a national, comprehensive, and enforceable open occupancy law, Reorientation of federal housing programs to place more low- and moderate-income housing outside of ghetto areas. The supply of housing suitable for low-income families should be expanded. The Commission recommends provision of 600,000 low- and moderate-income housing units next year and 6 million units over the next five years. Some 6 million substandard housing units are occupied in the United States today, and well over that number of families lack sufficient income to rent or buy standard housing without spending over 25% of their income and thus sacrificing other essential needs. The problem promises to become more critical with the expanded rate of family formation on the immediate horizon, and the increasing need to replace housing which has been destroyed or condemned. In our view, the dimension of the need calls for an unprecedented national effort. We believe that the nation's housing programs must be expanded to bring within the reach of low- and moderate-income families 600,000 new and existing units next year and 6 million units over the next five years. This proposal can only be implemented if present subsidy programs are extended so that a. a part of the existing housing inventory can be brought within the reach of lower-income families, and b. private enterprise can become a major factor in the low-cost housing field, both in terms of the construction capabilities of private developers and the capital of private institutional lenders. In the sections that follow, we discuss specific programs that must be part of this expanded national effort. An Expanded and Modified Below-Market Interest Rate Program The Below-Market Interest Rate Program, which makes long-term low-interest financing available to non-profit and limited-profit sponsors, is the best mechanism presently available for engaging private enterprise in the task of providing moderate and lower-income housing. Several limitations, however, prevent the program from providing the quantity of housing that is needed. Funding levels are inadequate to launch a national program. Nonprofit sponsors are deterred by lack of seed money to finance pre-construction costs, and limited profit corporations are deterred by the statutory prohibition on transfer or refinancing projects for 20 years without FHA permission. We recommend that funding levels of the program be substantially increased. We also recommend that legislation be enacted to permit interest-free loans to nonprofit sponsors to cover pre-construction costs and to allow limited profit corporations to sell projects to nonprofit corporations, cooperatives, or condominiums. Though the potential of the program is great, it presently serves few truly low income families. Current costs average $14,400 per unit, making the typical rental for a two bedroom unit $110 per month thereby in effect requiring a minimum annual income of $5,300. Only with rent supplements can poor families afford housing commanding rents of this amount. But the amount of rent supplement funds which can be used in such developments is limited by statute to 5% of the total appropriation for the rent supplement program. 
in order to make below market interest rate housing available to low as well as moderate income families we recommend that the five percent limitation be removed and that the overall funding of rent supplements be greatly expanded we also recommend that serious consideration be given to expanding the interest subsidy under the program in order to lower the rate for sponsors. An expanded and modified rent supplement program and an ownership supplement program. The rent supplement program offers a highly flexible tool for subsidizing housing costs because it permits adjustment of the subsidy according to the income of the tenant, the project financing is at market rates, so that tenants who do not qualify for supplements must pay market rentals. Potentially, therefore, these developments can provide an alternative to public housing for low-income families while still attracting middle-income families. We believe, however, that several changes are necessary if the full potential of this program is to be realized. First, we recommend that existing regulations restricting architectural design, imposing rigid unit cost standards, and limiting tenant income to amounts lower than required by statute be removed. These regulations diminish the attractiveness of the program to private developers and represent a major barrier to substantial expansion of the program. Second, the statutory limitation of rent supplements to new or rehabilitated housing should be changed to permit the use of rent supplements in existing housing. In many areas, removal of the restriction would make possible a major increase of the program without requiring investment in new construction. This option must be made available if the program is to be expanded to its fullest potential. Third, the rent supplement concept should be extended to provide home ownership opportunities for low-income families. The ambition to own one's own home is shared by virtually all Americans, and we believe it is in the interest of the nation to permit all who share such a goal to realize it. Home ownership would eliminate one of the most persistent problems facing low-income families in rental housing, poor maintenance by absentee landlords, and would provide many low-income families with a tangible stake in society for the first time. The Senate Banking and Currency Committee recently approved a bill that would establish a program to pay a portion of the mortgage payments of low-income families seeking to purchase homes. As with rent supplements, subsidy payments would decrease as the purchaser's income rose. The income limits of the program 70% of the below-market interest rate eligibility limits, would greatly impair its usefulness, in our opinion, and should be eliminated. With that reservation, we strongly endorse the concept, urge that such a program of ownership supplements be enacted, and recommend that it be funded on a basis that will permit its wide use in achieving the goal of 6 million units for low- and moderate-income families over the next five years. Federal Write-Down of Interest Rates on Loans to Private Builders To make private loan capital available, we recommend direct federal write-down of interest rates on market-rate loans to private construction firms for moderate-rent housing. This program would make it possible for any qualified builder to enter the moderate-rent housing field on the basis of market-rate financing, provided that the project meets necessary criteria. The federal government would enter into a contract with the financing institution to supply the difference between the mortgage payment at the market interest rate and 20% of the tenant's monthly income to a specified maximum write-down which would make the interest rate paid by the tenant equivalent to 1 or 2%. An expanded and more diversified public housing program since its establishment in 1937, the public housing program has produced only some 650,000 low-rent housing units. Insufficient funding has prevented construction of a quantity more suited to the need, and unrealistic unit cost limitations have mandated that most projects be of institutional design and mammoth size. 
The resulting large concentration of low-income families has often created conditions generating great resistance in communities to new projects of this type. We believe that there is a need for substantially more public housing, but we believe that the emphasis of the program should be changed from the traditional publicly built slum-based high-rise project to smaller units on scattered sites. Where traditional high-rise projects are constructed, facilities for social services should be included in the design and a broad range of such services provided for tenants. To achieve the shift in emphasis we have recommended, we urge, first, expansion of present programs under which public housing authorities lease existing scattered site units. Present statutory restrictions on long-term leasing should be eliminated to provide incentives for private construction and financing. Families whose incomes increase above the public housing limit should be permitted to take over the leases of their units from the housing authority. We also urge expansion of present turnkey programs, under which housing authorities purchase low-rent units constructed by private builders instead of constructing the units themselves. Here, too, families whose incomes rise above the public housing limits should be permitted to stay in the units at market rentals. An Expanded Model Cities Program The Model Cities Program is potentially the most effective weapon in the federal arsenal for a long-term comprehensive attack on the problems of American cities. It offers a unique means of developing local priorities, coordinating all applicable government programs, including those relating to social development, for example education and health, as well as physical development, and encouraging innovative plans and techniques. Its block grant multipurpose funding feature allows the city to deploy program funds with much greater flexibility than is possible under typical categorical grant programs, and the statutory requirement that there be widespread citizen participation and maximum employment of area residents in all phases of the program promises to involve community residents in a way we think most important. The full potential of the program can be achieved, however, only if a. the Model Cities program is funded at a level which gives the cities involved an opportunity and incentive to produce significant results, and b. the various programs which can be brought into play under Model Cities, such as urban renewal, below-market interest rate housing, and health education and welfare programs, are independently supported at levels which permit model cities funds to be used for essentially innovative purposes. Appropriations must also be sufficient to expand coverage far beyond the 63 cities that currently are funded. The President has recommended that $1 billion be appropriated for model cities. We strongly support this recommendation as a minimum start, noting that a much greater scale of funding will ultimately be necessary if the program proves successful and if it is to be made available to all the cities that require such aid. A Reoriented and Expanded Urban Renewal Program Urban renewal has been an extremely controversial program since its inception, we recognize that in many cities it has demolished more housing than it has erected, and that it has often caused dislocation among disadvantaged groups. Nevertheless, we believe that a greatly expanded, though reoriented, urban renewal program is necessary to the health of our cities. Urban renewal is an essential component of the Model Cities program, and, in its own right, is an essential tool for any city attempting to preserve social and economic vitality. Substantially increased funding will be necessary if urban renewal is to become a reality in all the cities in which renewal is needed. A reorienting of the program is necessary to avoid past deficiencies. The Department of Housing and Urban Development has recognized this, and has promulgated policies giving top priority to urban renewal projects that directly assist low-income households in obtaining adequate housing. 
projects aimed primarily at bolstering the economic strength of downtown areas or at creating housing for upper-income groups while reducing the supply of low-cost housing will have low priority unless they are part of a balanced program including a strong focus on the needs of low-income groups. With these priorities in mind, we recommend substantial expansion of the program. Reform of Obsolete Building Codes Approximately 5,000 separate jurisdictions in the United States have building codes. Many of these local codes are antiquated and contain obsolete requirements that prevent builders from taking advantage of new technology. Beyond the factor of obsolescence, the very variety of the requirements prevents the mass production and standardized design that could significantly lower building costs. Opinions differ as to whether a uniform national code is yet feasible, but it is clear that much greater uniformity is possible than presently exists. We urge state and local governments to undertake the task of modernizing their codes at once, and recommend that the Department of Housing and Urban Development design for their guidance a model national code. We can no longer afford the waste caused by arbitrary and archaic building codes. Areas outside of ghetto neighborhoods should be opened up to occupancy by racial minorities. The Commission recommends enactment of a national, comprehensive, and enforceable open occupancy law. The federal government should enact a comprehensive and enforceable open occupancy law, making it an offense to discriminate in the sale or rental of any housing, including single-family homes, on the basis of race, creed, color, or national origin. In recent years, various piecemeal attempts have been made to deal with the problem of housing discrimination. Executive Order 11063, issued by President Kennedy in 1962, provided that agreements for federally assisted housing made after the date of the order must be covered by enforceable non-discrimination pledges. Congress, in enacting Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, promulgated a broad national policy of non-discrimination with respect to programs or activities receiving federal financial assistance, including public housing and urban renewal. Eighteen states and more than 40 cities have enacted fair housing laws of varying degrees of effectiveness. Despite these actions, the great bulk of housing produced by the private sector remains unaffected by anti-discrimination measures. So long as this continues, public and private action at the local level will be inhibited by the argument that local action produces competitive disadvantage. We have canvassed the various alternatives and have come to the firm opinion that there is no substitute for the enactment of a federal fair housing law. The key to breaking down housing discrimination is universal and uniform coverage, and such coverage is obtainable only through federal legislation. We urge that such a statute be enacted at the earliest possible date. Open housing legislation must be translated into open housing action. Real estate boards should work with fair housing groups in communities where such groups exist, and help form them in areas where they do not exist. The objective of voluntary community action should be, one, the full dissemination of information concerning available housing to minority groups, and two, providing information to the community concerning the desirability of open housing. Reorientation of federal housing programs to place more low- and moderate-income housing outside of ghetto areas. Enactment of a national fair housing law will eliminate the most obvious barrier limiting the areas in which non-whites live, but it will not deal with an equally impenetrable barrier the unavailability of low- and moderate-income housing in non-ghetto areas. To date, housing programs serving low-income groups have been concentrated in the ghettos. Non-ghetto areas, particularly suburbs, 
have for the most part steadfastly opposed low-income, rent-supplement, or below-market interest-rate housing, and have successfully restricted the use of these programs outside the ghetto. We believe that federally aided low- and moderate-income housing programs must be reoriented so that the major thrust is in non-ghetto areas. Public housing programs should emphasize scattered site construction. Rent supplements should, whenever possible, be used in non-ghetto areas, and an intensive effort should be made to recruit below-market interest rate sponsors willing to build outside the ghettos. The reorientation of these programs is particularly critical in light of our recommendation that six million low- and middle-income housing units be made available over the next five years. If the effort is not to be counterproductive, its main thrust must be in non-ghetto areas, particularly those outside the central city. End of section 58. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 59 of the Kerner Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. Kerner Commission Report. Conclusion. One of the first witnesses to be invited to appear before this commission was Dr. Kenneth B. Clark, a distinguished and perceptive scholar. Referring to the reports of earlier riot commissions, he said, I read that report of the 1919 riot in Chicago, and it is as if I were reading the report of the Investigating Committee on the Harlem Riot of 35, the report of the Investigating Committee on the Harlem Riot of 43, the report of the McCone Commission on the Watts Riot. I must again in candor say to you members of this commission, it is a kind of Alice in Wonderland, with the same moving picture re-shown over and over again, the same analysis, the same recommendations, and the same inaction. These words come to our minds as we conclude this report. We have provided an honest beginning. We have learned much, but we have uncovered no startling truths no unique insights, no simple solutions. The destruction and the bitterness of racial disorder, the harsh polemics of black revolt and white repression have been seen and heard before in this country. It is time now to end the destruction and the violence, not only in the streets of the ghetto, but in the lives of people. End of section 59. Section 60 of the Kerner Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. Kerner Commission Report. Supplement on Control of Disorder. The Police. Introduction. Chapter 12 on Control of Disorder focused on the problems of civil and police officials seeking to prevent disorder, dealing with incidents leading to disorders, and responding to political, social, and legal issues that arise at all stages of a disorder. In this supplement, we focus principally on controlling disorders that have escalated beyond immediate police capabilities and require a total community response to halt the violence. We also consider the rarer cases where state or federal forces are necessary to achieve control. Within this context, we assess the present capabilities and preparedness of public safety forces, military units, civil government, and the community at large to cope with disorders of large magnitude and make recommendations to help assure adequate response at all levels. 1. The Police and Control of Civil Disorders the capability of a police department to control a civil disorder depends essentially on two factors, proper planning and competent performance. These rely in turn upon the quantity and quality of police manpower, the training of patrolmen and police commanders, and the effectiveness of their equipment. 
this portion of the supplement will review the adequacy of police planning training and equipment to deal with civil disorders together with the commission's recommendations for improvement when underlying tensions are present and they exist in every american city with a large minority population a small incident can turn a crowd into a mob last summer an appreciable number of incidents were triggered by police actions some serious such as shooting a suspect but usually by routine activities such as a simple arrest the way policemen approach an incident often determines whether it is contained or develops into a serious disorder experienced police administrators consulted by the commission repeatedly stressed the need for good judgment and common sense among police officers called to the scene of an incident in a neighborhood where tensions exist they warned against using sirens and flashlights that attract crowds they cautioned against over responding to a small incident with too much visible force riot guns and helmets may only aggravate a tense situation yet control has sometimes been lost because an insufficient number of police were on hand to control a disorder in its initial stages it takes a seasoned senior officer to make the all-important initial assessments and decisions that will contain an incident if an incident develops and a crowd begins to threaten lawlessness and acts of violence the police must act promptly and with a sufficient display of force to make clear their intent and capacity to suppress disorder and ensure the public safety planning effective preparation for disorder requires careful plans large numbers of police officers must be mobilized deployed and directed by senior officers they must have adequate logistical support particularly if extended operations are necessary mobilization planning to find and mobilize enough policemen to handle a riot emergency is difficult even in large cities in one major city with a population of more than one million an area of a hundred and forty square miles and a police force of nearly five thousand men a hundred and ninety two patrolmen were on duty when a major civil disorder erupted of these only forty four were in the riot area the difficulties in mobilizing additional men were described by the police commissioner cannot be emphasized too strongly that mobilization is inherently a time-consuming operation no matter how efficient after a man is notified he must dress and travel to his reporting point once he is checked in and has been equipped he must be turned around and transported to a command post or an assembly point there he must be briefed on the situation that exists the location of the riot area his duties and other details required to make him effective once he is deployed he must then be actually committed to the area of involvement the time lapse in this entire procedure ranges from one and one half to two hours by the time sufficient manpower was brought in the disorder had developed beyond the control capability of the police department adding to this difficulty is the fact that the standard training for police operations is basically different from that required for riot control traditional police training seeks to develop officers who can work independently and with little direct supervision but the control of civil disturbances requires quite different performance large numbers of disciplined personnel comparable to soldiers in a military unit organized and trained to work as members of a team under a highly unified command control system no matter how well trained and skilled a police officer may be he will be relatively ineffectual to deal with civil disturbances so long as he functions as an individual thus a major civil disturbance requires a police department to convert itself suddenly into a different organization with new operational procedures to cope with the difficulties of this transition a police department must have a specific mobilization plan that can mobilize and deploy needed manpower with a minimum deviation from established operating procedures and with minimum curtailment of essential police services a study conducted for the commission by the international association of chiefs of police of thirty major police departments found that all had some form of written mobilization plan the quality of the plans varied greatly principal defects were 
inadequate attention to implementing the plan inadequate relief of reserve forces after the plan had been activated inadequate accounting for personnel dispatched to a disorder inadequate pre-designated assembly areas or command posts in the various areas of the cities where trouble might be expected inadequate logistical support of police and other law enforcement officers engaged in control activities inadequate flexibility in planning to cope with disorders of varying natures and magnitudes and unnecessarily complicated planning that deviated excessively from normal operations because of these deficiencies in the mobilization plans of the leading police departments the commission has prepared a model plan which can be adapted to local requirements currently used as training material in the conference on the prevention and control of civil disorders conducted by the department of justice in response to commission recommendations the plan will be revised as additional information is developed by these conferences the commission recommends that the department of justice disseminate the revised plan to police departments across the country and ensure that it is used in federally sponsored training on riot control methods operational planning operational planning a necessary complement to mobilization planning tells the police command and the men what to do to control the disorder it includes command and control mechanisms communication intelligence means to combat inflammatory rumors and tactics one command and control and communications whether the shift from normal routine police operations to an emergency basis is smooth and effective depends on the success with which the police can provide unified command and control under ordinary conditions a police dispatcher controls the movement of men and equipment from a central position to places where they are needed in most police departments the system works well enough so long as the demands on the dispatcher are within the capabilities of the man and his equipment many local police departments called upon to control civil disorders have had serious problems in commanding and controlling the large number of men required to work together as an effective coordinated team the problem has been compounded by the shortage of on-duty supervisors and staff at certain periods of the day it is one thing to assemble a large force it is quite another to provide appropriate direction and leadership effective command and control in a civil disorder depends upon communications and communications is a function both of planning and of equipment relatively few police departments have adequate communications equipment or frequencies forty two per cent of all police departments studied by the commission had no special radio frequency for emergencies the lack of emergency frequencies overloads normal frequencies this may not only preclude effective command and control of police in the area of a civil disorder but may also undermine the ability of the police to provide vital services to the remainder of the city the absence of adequate communication facilities is particularly acute with respect to outside police assistance approximately fifty per cent of all police agencies surveyed had inadequate means to coordinate with neighboring jurisdictions incompatible radio frequencies in one instance prevented effective use of men and equipment from a neighboring police department when local and state police must cooperate with national guard units the need for communications coordination is urgent we believe that the critical communications and control problems arising from the present shortage of frequencies available to police departments require immediate attention accordingly we recommend that the federal communications commission make sufficient frequencies available to police and related public safety services to meet the demonstrated need for riot control and other emergency use footnote this recommendation was previously made to the fcc in a letter from the commission a copy of which is included in the appendix the fcc has taken steps to make additional frequencies available and a footnote miniaturized communications equipment for officers on foot is critically needed for command and control in civil disorders particularly 
if the riot commanders are to exercise effective command and control over police units in control operations at the present time police officers can generally communicate only to headquarters and only from a police vehicle this commission therefore endorses the recommendations made by the crime commission that the federal government assume the leadership in initiating and funding portable radio development programs for the police footnote this recommendation was previously made in a letter to the department of justice a copy of which is included in the appendix End of footnote. 2. Intelligence. The absence of accurate information both before and during a disorder has created special control problems for police. Police departments must develop means to obtain adequate intelligence for planning purposes as well as on the scene information for use in police operations during a disorder. An intelligence unit staffed with full time personnel should be established to gather evaluate analyze and disseminate information on potential as well as actual civil disorders it should provide police administrators and commanders with reliable information essential for assessment and decision making it should use undercover police personnel and informants but it should also draw on community leaders agencies and organizations in the ghetto Planning is also necessary to cope with the ever-present problem of rumors. A rumor collection center will enable police and other officials to counter false and inflammatory reports by giving accurate information rapidly to community leaders and others in troubled areas. Evaluation of rumors can also provide important information about potential disorders. In Chicago, for example, a rumor central unit established in the Commission on Human Rights averted trouble when a Negro, after an argument, was shot to death by a white store owner who was placed in custody by the police. A rumor spread through the neighborhood that the white man would not be arrested. This false information was picked up by a radio station and broadcast, but Rumor Central, which received some 500 telephone calls about the incident, obtained the facts from the police and gave those facts to community leaders in news media this appreciably assisted the police in alleviating tension how police intelligence units can be organized and can operate is set forth in a model operations plan discussed below three tactics in dealing with disorders police have traditionally relied principally on the use of various squad formations and tactics to disperse crowds these tactics have been of little or no value in some recent disorders marked by roving bands of rioters engaged in window-breaking, looting, and firebombing. Studies made for the commission indicate that the police are aware of the deficiency. Many police departments admitted that traditional riot control methods and squad tactics were wholly ineffectual or only partially useful in the disorders but no new and practical response to the recent type of disorders has emerged few departments have evolved new tactics against rioters even fewer have sent trained personnel to consult with officials in cities that have experienced civil disorders the tactics effective in dealing with the type of disorders experienced last summer as well as those that may develop in the future are also presented in the model operations plan discussed below four recommendations for operational planning the commission believes that model operations plans are needed now they must provide guidelines for police departments and assist them in coping with civil disorders the commission also believes that more thought is needed about types of disorders that may develop in the future together with the police responses that will be relevant and effective Acting on these convictions, the Commission has developed a model operations plan after consultation with leading police officials. Like the mobilization plan, this plan is also being used in the Department of Justice training conferences and would be revised from time to time. The Commission recommends that this plan be distributed to local and state police departments in the same manner as the proposed model mobilization plan obtaining outside assistance 
when should a mayor or a local police chief call for state assistance the answer is difficult partly because of the problem of determining when outside assistance is actually necessary and partly because local officials may be understandably reluctant to admit that they cannot control the disorder no amount of planning will provide an automatic solution to this problem sound judgment on the part of mayors and police chiefs remains the only answer yet once the decision has been made proper advance planning will help speed assistance outside forces will need a relatively long lead time before response a survey of national guard capabilities for example shows that an average of four to six hours is required for the time of notification to the time of arrival of an effective complement of men local authorities must not wait until the critical moment to alert a neighboring jurisdiction the state police or the national guard outside control forces will then be unable to mobilize and respond on time all agencies that may be asked to help control a civil disturbance must be alerted at an early stage and kept informed these problems will be further discussed in the section on the national guard and state local planning logistical planning commission studies disclose serious deficiencies in police plans for logistical support many police departments simply assume that supplies and equipment are on hand and in the amounts required the moment of need is too late to find out whether they are regular police vehicles are usually inadequate for transporting and supplying large numbers of police particularly since the men should be moved in units furthermore a disorder extending over a long period of time will require the resupply of expended items and probably food and shelter for police personnel in one city when the failure to provide for these contingencies kept an entire police force on twenty-four hour duty physical exhaustion seriously impaired police effectiveness commission studies indicate that few police departments are prepared for these exigencies a major problem of the nineteen sixty seven disorders arose from the large number of persons arrested facilities to transport detain process feed and house them overwhelm the existing structure discussed in the chapter on the administration of justice under emergency conditions the task of caring for large numbers of prisoners is also a matter of logistics training the commission survey on the capabilities and preparedness of selected police departments show that the most critical deficiency of all is inadequate training practically no riot control training is provided for supervisory police officers recruits receive an average of eighteen hours in departments offering anywhere from sixty-two hours to only two moreover although riot control tactics require the work of highly disciplined and coordinated teams almost all departments train policemen as individuals eleven of the thirty police departments surveyed reported no special or additional riot control training beyond the recruit level of the nineteen departments reporting some post recruit training five limit training to the use of firearms and chemicals in many cases the training program is built around traditional military formations that have little applicability to the kinds of civil disorders experienced by our cities yet fifty per cent of all the departments surveyed said they were generally satisfied with their training programs and plan no significant changes basic riot control should be taught in recruit school and intensive unit training should be conducted subsequently on a regular or semi-annual basis without this kind of training police officers cannot be expected to perform effectively in controlling civil disturbances training supervisory and command personnel in the control of civil disorders must also be a continuing process emergency plans and emergency operations must be reviewed in the classroom and practiced in the field yet few departments test their mobilization and operational plans as a result where carefully planned variations from the normal chain of command communication systems and unit assignments go into effect at a time of riot emergency policemen are often unfamiliar with them the most thoroughly developed emergency plan is useless 
unless all personnel fully understand it before it is put into effect of the thirty police departments surveyed not a single one reported coordinated training with fire units yet recent experience shows a clear need for police fire teamwork in riots even more revealing only two of the departments surveyed have undertaken coordinated training with other community agencies required in a riot emergency only two departments reported coordinating their riot control training with the national guard and state police in order to strengthen police training the commission recommends one department should immediately allocate whatever time is necessary to reach an effective level of riot control capability the need for training in civil disorder prevention and control is urgent two training must include all levels of personnel within the police agency especially commanders post recruit riot training must be a continuing process for all personnel and build upon recruit training rather than duplicated three riot control training must be provided to groups expected to function as teams during actual riot conditions required levels of teamwork can be achieved only through team training all special riot control units must receive additional and intensive training in tactics and procedures as well as in special equipment and weapons four mobilization plans and emergency procedures must be reviewed in the classroom and practice in the field all members of the department must be familiar with riot plans at all times five mayors and other civil officials must recognize the need and accept the responsibility for initiating regional training and coordination with military and state police personnel as well as with other agencies of local government six police agencies must review and become familiar with recent riot experience so that training programs can be realistically adjusted in the light of anticipated problems seven in order to help law enforcement agencies improve their knowledge and strengthen their capabilities to prevent and control civil disorders a national center and clearinghouse should be established to develop evaluate and disseminate riot prevention and controlled data and information this center should be part of the proposed national institute for law enforcement and administration of justice recommended by the president and awaiting action by congress a suggestion has been made that national observer teams be established and assigned to the scene of incipient or developing disorders these teams would study the effectiveness of control techniques and organization recommend improvements and make this information available to public officials the commission endorses the recommendation and suggests further that the disorder observer teams be made an integral part of the proposed national center police control equipment personal equipment a serious hazard faced by police officers during disorders is injury from bottles rocks and other missiles thrown by rioters yet few police departments can furnish every man assigned to civil disturbance duty with proper equipment to protect head face and eyes the commission has found that protective clothing boots and gloves are generally not available for the police although most police administrators recommend their procurement and use police officers must have the proper personal equipment and clothing to safeguard them against the threat of bodily harm police weapons on the basis of the surveys made of thirty major police departments the commission found that many police forces are inadequately equipped or trained for use of even conventional riot control weapons and materiel for example although the police baton has proved to be a very effective weapon in situations where a low level of physical force will control the disorder many police departments fail to instruct their men in the proper use of this control weapon the value of the police baton should not be overlooked and police administrators should assure that proper training in its correct and most effective use is given to all police officers the most serious deficiencies however are in advanced non-lethal weapons riot control authorities regard non-lethal chemical agents such as tear gas as the single most valuable and effective type of 
middle-range weapons and controlling civil disorders enlisting the priority of force to be applied in a disorder the fbi manual on riot control as well as army and national guard doctrine prescribed the use of tear gas c s and c n before resorting to firearms according to the fbi riot control manual they are the most effective and most humane means of achieving temporary neutralization of a mob with a minimum of personal injury while most of the police departments surveyed possess some chemical weapons with varying degrees of supplies on hand they lack sufficient gas mass to equip even thirty per cent of their personnel properly the lack of gas mass restricts use of gas by many police forces police and other civil officials have also been inhibited by the unfavorable psychological reaction to the use of any gas or chemical weapon an additional restraint is created by the presence of large numbers of innocent people in the disorder area who would be affected by the traditional massive use of tear gas the recent development of new containers and projectile devices by the u s army now makes it possible to use c s discriminately against small groups and even individuals police departments could use them to deal effectively and appropriately with looters and snipers some police departments have recently been equipping police officers with a liquid tear gas device initial reports indicate that though less effective than c s it provides a useful method of dealing with unruly and dangerous individuals used properly it renders offenders harmless for ten to fifteen minutes projectors now in production promise to give police a means of acting against lawless small groups or individuals up to a distance of thirty feet the use of distinctive colors and odors either added to the liquid tear gas or projected from a separate device may be an additional way to help police not only identify those engaged in vandalism and other illegal acts but also deter others the exaggerated reports of sniping in many cities experiencing disorders created unwarranted apprehension among some police administrators this concern has led to a belief in some communities that police officers should be armed with highly destructive implements of war the commission believes that equipping civil police with automatic rifles machine guns and other weapons of massive and indiscriminate lethality is is not warranted by the evidence chemical agents provide police forces with an effective and more appropriate weapon if violence by riders goes beyond the capability of the police to control trained military forces should be called in we should not attempt to convert our police into combat troops equipped for urban warfare the true source of police strength and maintaining order lies in the respect and goodwill of the public they serve great harm is likely to result from the use of military weapons of mass destruction by police forces which lack the command and control and firearms discipline of military units improper action could destroy the concept of civilian police as a public service agency dependent for effective operations on community cooperation and support overall recommendations the development of modern non-lethal control equipment has languished because police departments lack the resources for tests and evaluation the decentralized nature of law enforcement and the absence of standard criteria have also limited market opportunities as a result private industry has been reluctant to invest in research and development of new police equipment accordingly the commission recommends the federal government should undertake an immediate program to test and evaluate non-lethal weapons and related control equipment for use by police and control forces federal support should be provided to establish criteria and standard specifications which would stimulate and facilitate the production of such items at a reasonably low cost federal funds should be used to develop appropriate tools and materiel for local and state law enforcement agencies if these recommendations are adopted the result will be better maintenance of law and order 
and better control of disorders with fewer risks to police and the public you should be made at the technology and resources of the department of defense and other appropriate federal agencies and a section sixty